Audiobook title, My Ex-Girlfriend is the Strongest Guild Master, 01-80, by Reyes Writing Part 01. This work belongs to author, Reyes Writing. Source, scribblehub.com. 1. E-Emergency Log Out. Although Alan and Astrid killed 20 of them, it was not enough. The ferocious creatures kept appearing, snarling with sharp teeth that resembled a creepy grin. And there is this chilling howl coming from the heart of the woods that seemed to summon even more of them. At this rate, we'll end up. Alan suddenly grabbed her wrist. There was an intense gleam in his eyes she had never seen before. It's not worth it. We were totally not prepared for this. We'll call it quits for today, okay? Astrid first stared at the blood running down his forehead before nodding. Let's make a run for it then. Follow me, I know the way. In their escape, the horde healed them viciously, throwing bites to their legs and swipes at their backs. The red-furred critters were weak, Alan could drop their HP all the way to zero with just two strikes of his sword, but after a long hour of fighting, the muscles of his dominant arm were burning and his wrist was constantly aching. This one almost bit my butt, he yelled after bashing one of them with his shield. This way. Astrid cried, pointing at a clearing in the woods up ahead. She then noticed a couple of Weezmen ready to pounce on them. Watch out. Fire crafting, flare. At her command, a burst of fire came out of the tip of her wooden staff, killing the two rabid creatures on impact. There were still other Weezmen nearby, and yet, she took a moment to look back, distinguishing a large silhouette coming their way. What the bloody hell is that, she murmured as Alan pulled her by the arm. Move, Astrid. We're almost there. I'm so sorry, Alan. If it weren't for my stupid, don't finish that sentence. We're a team, and I was also fine with pushing our luck. So don't even dare to take all the blame on yourself, got it? At a loss of words, she did nothing but bite her lower lip and let him drag her out of there. Was he angry at her, even though he had said otherwise? Because I wouldn't blame him. I was the one that pushed things too far after bragging about having fought in more than a hundred combat simulations. But alone. I've always fought alone until now. I'm quite used to pain, so even if one of these stupid creatures ripped one of my arms or cut my chest open, I'd laugh it out. But from the very moment I saw him bleeding, my mind stopped. Alan halted abruptly. Before asking the reason, Astrid pointed her gaze at the naturally formed fence of thorny bushes blocking their path, not only in front of them, but at their sides too. A dead end? No, no, no. I messed it up again, she cried in shock as Alan tried to cut the vines in vain. Hold on, let me use my fire magic too. It's no use. Unless this gets carbonized instantly, the fire will spread rapidly around us while we defend from them. Alan turned around to confront their pursuers. Waiting at the back lines of what seemed to be an army of twenty Weezmen, stood a large bipedal monster, with red fur and an elongated neck. Its inhuman musculature told them it could rip their heads off with one swipe of its enormous paws, and its thin body showed it could be agile and catch them with ease. It observed them with red eyes that screamed of cunningness, and its exposed teeth resembled a wicked grin. Weezenox, guardian of the forest, Alan read the name and title the system provided while tightening his grip around his sword's hilt. Did ancient England really house monsters like this? Incredible. This is completely different from the slime chief. Astrid hissed, pulling his sleeve. Look at it. It's waiting for us to make the first move. How's your mana? He asked quietly, eyes at the front. Lo. I can cast three or four more blades and that's it. And that boss is blocking our only exit, huh? Alan exhaled loudly before pulling something out of his inventory. Take this, it's everything I have. A street grabbed the little leather bag. Its contents clunk when she closed her hand around it. It's his gold. Wait, what are you? He grinned innocently at her before dashing forward. I'll distract it. His voice was almost silenced by the collective growl of the nearest enemies. It's up to you whether you use the rest of your mana to force your escape or help me kill it. Uttering a battle cry, Alan used his shield to tackle everything in his trajectory. Weezmans were violently pushed aside or crushed under his boots while the Weezenarchs prepared itself. It was only a matter of seconds before they clashed. And I'm just standing here, doing nothing like an idiot. A street held her staff aloft but with no target in her sight. Should she attack the boss and lower as much of its HP as possible, or get rid of the majority of its minions? What I'm certain of is that I won't let you alone. 
She chose her target out of instinct after watching the Weezenark starting a swiping motion. F fire crafting, flare, her good aim bore fruit, successfully burning the Weezenark's right paw. So we stay and fight, huh? Alan cried invigorated, targeting the monster's left paw. His blade was not sharp enough to sever it clean, but it left half of it dangling and leaking large amounts of blood. Enraged, the Weezenarchs violently leaned forward trying to bite Alan's head, but he raised his shield at the last second. From her safe spot, Astrid could only watch how the towering monster fell over him. Alan, she cried, running forward, but a couple of Weezmen stood in the way, biting her legs. Their sharp teeth drew blood immediately. Get off, you, this is your chance. Alan yelled from the top of his lungs as he struggled under the weight of the Weezenarchs. His shield was the only thing preventing the boss from closing its maw against his arm. Kill it now. Fire everything you have at it, now. Astrid watched half of the Weezmen horde gathering around its partner and the monster, wailing desperately as if they were cheering on their boss. A thought crossed her mind, even if Alan managed to kill the Weezenarchs on his own, the surrounding Weezmen would retaliate immediately. The probability of seeing those pests ripping the skin off his face made her shiver. I won't mess it up this time. Minor firecrafting, flare, she intoned, sending forth a burst of fire that suddenly exploded halfway through. A second after, the lifeless corpses of two Weezmen plummeted into the ground before disappearing in a brief spectacle of glimmering pixels. Wasting no time wondering what had happened, she cast another flare, getting the same results. This time, she heard a faint squeal. Are these buggers sacrificing themselves to protect their boss? W what kind of sick joke is this? Get out of my way, you bloody blighters. Despite his struggle, Alan could be heard laughing out loud. Whoa, Astrid, your British is showing. How can you joke at a time like this? Alan's laughter suddenly changed into a guttural growl, accompanied by the sound of wood breaking. Alan's shield had finally lost the endurance battle against the monster's powerful jaws. In a state of shock, Astrid observed his partner's HP gradually decreasing, as another pair of Weezmen bit the hem of her apprentice witch robes. She absently glanced at her MP bar. She would not be able to save him or herself with that low amount of mana. Unless, fervently focusing on the oppressing feeling overwhelming her chest, she held her staff aloft and began channeling. Unless I make a sacrifice too. She initiated the process as usual, and when a system notification told her she had no mana left, she ignored it, feeling a slight ache in the tip of her fingers. Another annoying virtual window popped up inside her sight of vision, warning her of the danger, as her mage staff started to grow hot. A piercing pain ran through her arms, making her grunt. Sweat formed in her forehead. Her vision became blurry. Dizziness overwhelmed her. This is nothing. Astrid continued powering up although the increasing pain almost dropped her to her knees, and even though her HP bar was reaching the dangerously red threshold. Not yet, not yet. The Weezman restraining her realized something abnormal was happening and desperately pounced to bite her arms. One managed to hang from her right forearm, and despite the added weight, Astrid did not falter. Just as she felt like fainting at any moment, she glanced at the tip of her staff which looked incandescent and bursting with energy, making her smirk. You beat me to it, guardian of the forest, she whispered to herself. I've always wanted to be on top of him. The staff exploded, violently releasing the accumulated energy like out-of-control fireworks that quickly became a rain of fire. The Weezmen waiting for a victor were the first victims, breaking lines and running in circles. Even the ones biting Astrid hurried to shield their master, but it was too late. The boss received the majority of the damage to the point that all of its fur got burned. Just as the last ball of fire impacted an unfortunate Weezman, Astrid dashed forward, holding what was left of its staff in hand and stabbed the Weezanarx's left eye with it. Blood sprouted, staining her cheeks. The agonizing monster let out a wail and stretched out its long neck to bite her, but Alan pierced the side of its head with his blade finally killing it. For Astrid, the virtual message congratulating them for killing the hidden boss of the Vermian Wood seemed too patronizing after all of that. Extenuating effort. Alan, are you okay? She cried, kneeling by his side as soon as the monster's corpse disappeared into thin air. Why your arm? Can you move it? Nope, it's wasted. It'd be better if I died and respawned back in Eunice. No way. Absolutely not. Don't even joke about it. 
Alan observed her watering eyes and quickly shook his head. Oh okay, okay. That was a totally bad idea. Do we still have a red potion? I can't believe you even suggested that, she was muttering while tapping her user interface. Then, a bottle with red liquid materialized in her palm. Here, make sure to drink it all. Just half of it, for your HP is also. Astrid's aqua-colored eyes shone intensely. I said, drink it all, or I'll get mad at you. Cheers, then. He nervously smiled, and gulped the thick liquid. Then grimaced. Seriously, one can almost taste the iron. Do you still think it tastes like blood? It's blood. Mixed with onions, tomatoes, and garlic. That doesn't sound so bad, she said, observing the immediate results. The marks of fangs carved in his forearm slowly closed, leaving no scars, and his HP bar slowly replenished to a secure orange. Try opening and closing your hand. He tried, but he could barely do it. Damn, he muttered, wincing, as she ripped off a piece of cloth from her robe. It's not necessary, Astrid. I bet that by tomorrow morning. Until we pay her NPC priest, then, she interjected, bandaging his arm. When she finished nursing him, she seemed upset. Why did you do that? Do what? You know exactly what I'm referring to. Why did you face the boss like that and force me to choose? He shrugged. You looked as if your head was a mess, but I knew you'd come up with a good solution. But what if I had decided to run away? That would have been a win too. You'd have been safe, and we could have met back in town once I was revived, right? Is that why you gave me your gold, because you were ready to die, she murmured, looking away. There was also the probability that I could have fucked it up, you know? Nah, you're too awesome to fail. You've shown me that, time and time again. Look at you. Have you noticed your level 8 now? And by the way, what the hell was that? That spell was awesome. What is it called? I it doesn't have a name. It's just something I improvised and the system rolled with it, that's all. Oh, come on. It'll be a waste not naming something that awesome. At least give it some thought. F fine. What about, Astrid's last resort, death from above? He grimaced. Rejected. Something more romantic would fit it better, like, shooting stars of justice, hum? Astrid stared deep into his green eyes. She had always thought they gave him an innocent persona, which was contrasted by his auburn hair that screamed of mischief. A combination I've grown to love. Whatever, she whispered before leaning toward him and kissing his cheek. His first reaction was to dumbfoundedly stare at her with his mouth ajar, making her blush. Why are you looking at me like that? You're my b-boyfriend, aren't you? S so signs of affection like these should be a common occurrence, all right? Sign me up for common occurrence, all right. But next time, give me a quick smooch on the lips, yes? I'm not mentally prepared for that just yet. She rose and turned around to hide her red face before a thorny bush on fire caught her attention. Let's put out that first and get back to Eunice, okay? Once they reached the top of the hill, Astrid still had the energy to jump and twirl like a child. See? I told you the view would be fantastic from here. Look at that clear blue sky and the super green fields. Her HP is in the red. How can she move like that? Alan thought as he tried to catch his breath. Jay just give me a moment, P please. Ah. I told you there was a river nearby. She beamed, stretching out her arms. Come on, Alan, fill your lungs. The air smells especially good around here. The panting Alan followed her gaze, finding a top view of the region. Apart from the beginner's town, 300 yards away, and the Vermian woods at their back, he could admire a magnificent blue mountain on the horizon. The place from where they started their adventure a week ago. And after all this time, I still can't believe that I'm here, he thought, pursing his lips. Long gone are the sights of sterile lands, grey clouds, black seas, and the dry rivers of the old earth, huh? This is just like the Alvirium Enterprises advertisement said, the novice is a new beginning. Do and be whatever your heart desires. Yeah, sure, at least until the Santa Maria arrives at its destination. Do you like what you see? Astrid asked tenderly, locking eyes with him. I do, he absently replied, staring at her cute, impossibly immaculate perfect face, beautifully enticing plump lips, and at her striking in blue eyes, features enhanced by the novice avatar rendering. Even her golden bob made her look like a runaway princess. Who knows? Maybe she secretly is one. She comes from the country of kings and queens, after all. Alan, she called, giving him a funny look. 
I'm talking about the scenery. Do you like it? He corrected his posture. Why yes. A truly astounding view. It really warms your heart to experience what Earth was supposed to look like hundreds of years ago. Am I right? He then laughed out loud, hands on his hips. She narrowed her eyes at him. But what's with the gloomy face you had just a moment ago? Were you thinking about something negative again, Mr. Warden? Come on, Astrid, what do you want me to say? Should I tell you that although I had a blast fighting monsters with you every single day, I consider this a waste of time? Look at us. We're all caged in a semi-medieval setting, learning swordplay and roleplaying as mags, instead of learning how to use a gun, repair solar panels and maintain our home ship. Astrid. I. She suddenly grabbed his hand. Have I told you before that I find your sulky expression especially cute? She said in a serious tone before grinning. Come on, let's go to the town hall and retrieve our bounty. As they ran down the hill, Alan could feel the wind hit his face and fill his lungs with pure air. Not only that. I can feel the muscles in my legs working and my heart thumping like crazy. And just like pain here feels real, the hand I'm holding. Hers, feels like the real deal too. Eunice, the beginner's town, was up ahead, designated to welcome every new inhabitant of the Eurola region. Its shops and restaurants were small, and the only two-story buildings were the town hall and the Moonlight Dream Inn. Although most people had already parted to more advanced areas, downtown still looked as lively as the first day, and there was still a waiting line to get inside the town hall. I hope this doesn't take long, because I'm starving. We've already explored Cerulean Mountain and Vermian Woods, so what's next, he asked, prompting her to raise her chin with pride. Dilax Mansion, obviously. Let's show those guys that belittled you yesterday that we can beat that whole dungeon on our own. We don't need them. Wait, haven't we heard that place is, like, hardcore? So what? After today's battle, I truly think we can take on anything the Novus throws at us. You said I always find a way, didn't you? Besides, I'll have you by my side. Which reminds me, are you still up for starting a guild with me? Absolutely. Have you come up with a good name for it yet? Well, I was thinking about that spell you improvised to save me, and it's kind of inspiring, you know. So let's become the shooting stars and saw the skies. A street grimaced. Rejected. It sounds lame and girly. What? No, it doesn't. And didn't you tell me you loved astronomy stuff? Astronomy. Astrid. Get it? I have a much better one. We could become the Deathbringers. Pass. Do you want to scare everyone we meet? What about Snakes of Power? Nothing could stop that army of the dead. Alan frowned. You want a grim sounding name? Fine. Callers of the Void? Black Tide of the Dead? Time Slavers? Titan Hunters? Defenders of Insanity? Oh, oh, you like romantic names, right? Hear me out, lovers of the goddess of death, Astrid intoned in a macabre voice, opening her eyes wide and putting both hands against her cheeks. What's with your fascination with death? Well, Astrid began, puffing out her chest, if I'm going to worship something, what could be better than the old one herself? The one that visits us all when our time comes. What's with that logic? The town hall's interior looked more like a bank than a local government building. Female employees wearing Victorian-inspired dresses helped visitors from their reception desks with constant transactions of gold and valuables. The woman that received Alan and Astrid had a long blue ponytail and fox-like ears. The title, Eunice Town Mayor, could be read above her head. Good morning, aspirant heroes. What can I do for you today? She intoned in a sweet voice. We got rid of your pests problems, Astrid said proudly, putting a blood-stained fang over the desk. Although I'm pretty sure they'll all respawn by tomorrow morning, Alan thought, half smiling. That's wonderful, the young lady said, smiling brightly. Congratulations on defeating the Weezenarchs. As a reward, you can choose a weapon from this list. With that said, she waved at the air and a system window popped up in front of them. Only one weapon? We're two here, you know? But whatever. Astrid said, annoyed, exhaling loudly. Could you also give us a form to register a new guild, please? Right away, Ms. Bradford, the fox-eared woman with a permanent grin said, materializing a second window. Let's review the rewards first, eh, Alan? Let's see. Beginner's staff, beginner's sword, bow, dagger, a hammer? Ah, uh, who'd carry that to a battlefield? That has no finesse. 
What do you think? She asked, turning her gaze to him. To her surprise, Alan was consciously observing the female NPC, who did not seem to mind. W what are you looking at, you creep? Astrid hissed, glancing at the NPC's stacked bosom and curvy figure. Or was he entranced by those cute animal ears? I've been wondering for a while, Alan began saying, without taking his eyes off the fake woman. Can these NPCs be considered some kind of advanced AI? They're part of the system, after all, but what kind of special programming do they have? Do they repeat the same things over and over again after a prolonged conversation? Are they closer to our real-life automatons than digital people? Or perhaps, here it is again, Astrid said, folding her arms. Curious Alan. No, wait, I have a better one. Alanitical, dot. S sorry for zoning out, Astrid, won't happen again. You were saying? She sighed loudly, hiding a smile. Help me choose a reward from the list while I fill out the guild form, okay. After nodding, Alan skimmed through the list, but the constant loud voices around him caught his attention. Man, this place is awesome. Who would have thought this place would be like a video game? I know right? I wouldn't mind becoming a frozen vegetable for the rest of my life. Everyone here looks hot as hell and we're practically immortal. I hope the Santa Maria finds nothing but poisonous planets during its whole journey so we get stuck here forever. Yeah. Who in his right mind would want to return to the real world? Especially if we end up stranded in a lameus rock in the middle of nowhere. Great. Just freaking great. Alan formed fists and tensed his jaw while his gaze kept absently pointing at the reward list. That's what I was talking about. Should we really be wasting our time playing here while our families and the rest of the not qualified are literally awaiting death? We all left a dying earth just a week ago, and we've been doing nothing but eating and drinking to our heart's content and fakely satiating some sense of accomplishment. This, this feels wrong. Those thoughts incited him to turn around and give a piece of his mind to those users, teens just like him, but Astrid grabbed his arm and looked deep into his eyes. Don't, she said quietly, faintly smiling at him. I knew something has been bothering you lately, so listen, don't feel bad about living in a utopia. We gain literally nothing from worrying about what we left behind, instead of looking at what's ahead of us. We've already said goodbye to all of our relatives, right? So keep proud of their sacrifice and live every day to your fullest for them. That's what a shooting star does, right? Keep going forward no matter what. Astrid, how did you know? She chuckled, gently tapping his forehead. Because I've been thinking the same since we logged in, silly. Tee hee. So. Have you made your choice yet? He smiled at her, and tapped on the reward screen. Here's your new beginner's elemental staff, Mr. Warden, the NPC in front of them said, placing the item over the desk, which Astrid stared at, frowning. Take it, Astrid. So you can save me again in the future, Alan said, as the girl grabbed it with shaking hands and embraced it. D-deal, she replied with flushed cheeks before hurrying her way to the exit. Admiring the way her short blonde hair danced left and right at her every step seemed to ease the pressure in his heart. Although I'm not totally convinced, I can't deny that living here, by your side, will make it all worth it. As he stepped in her direction, the NPC urgently called at him, Mr. Warden, before you go, would you kindly sign the guild's form? Just press your thumb on the red dot and the process will be complete. Ah, sure, he said, following her instructions, and before the window could disappear, he caught a glimpse of the registered guild name, Shooting Stars. In the blink of an eye, the oppressing and bitter feeling in his chest was swapped for a warm and tingling sensation filling him whole. Hurry up, Alan, I'm starving. Let's get some pizza. Yes, he replied aloud, waving goodbye at the mayor. What am I doing worrying about a future so ahead of us? Astrid is right. Instead of bashing my head against the wall, thinking we'll screw this up before it even starts, I should focus on taking care of what's in front of me now. This blonde beauty that believes in me as much as I trust her. Smiling about the possibilities of a bright future awaiting him, Alan Warden hurried his steps while promising to look at the good side of things, just like her, before a red system window blocked his sight of vision. Warning. Communication with the Nova system has been lost. His legs stopped working and reality froze around him, as a static image of Astrid waiting for him at the door got carved in his brain. And it may be my imagination, but I think I can hear her voice in the distance, screaming my name. Notice. 
User number 29318, Alan Warden, you have logged out of the Nova system. 35. 2. E emergency recruitment. A strong feeling of motion sickness hit him in an instant. He threw up, and the ventilator attached to his face automatically sucked it up. He could hear a beeping sound coming from inside his pod, as a cloud of steam escaped once the hatch opened. This is the worst I have ever felt in my entire life. Disconcerted, he sat and ran his hand through his hair, eyes shut. I'm not in the Novus anymore. He squinted as his eyes got used to the light, barely distinguishing a round silhouette hovering by his side. A ship's drone, probably. Passenger number 29317, Alan Warden. Your presence is required in room number 13, East Wing, Block C, Priority, Immediate. Yeah, that's a drone for you. Why did you log me out? Protocol states. You will receive new orders once you reach room number 13, Area C. I will be your escort along the way. Follow me, please. Even though you're asking me nicely, he grunted, I'll need a minute to recover from the decompression, you know. Permission to apply an adrenaline dose. W wait, hold on, to passenger number 29317, Alan Warden. Granted. That won't be necky, arg. And you freaking did it. Please dress up and follow me. The slick white hovering ball made its way towards the exit while Alan looked at his surroundings, fully awake, admiring thousands of capsules arranged in numerical order, every one of them occupied by others like him. The tandem. The last survivors of Earth. Before getting into cryosleep, every passenger had been instructed to get naked and store their clothes inside their chamber. He found his compartment easily as if he had used it yesterday. Even though a week has passed inside my mind. Fully dressed, he got out of his cryopod and stepped on the automatic track that would get him out of there, as he glanced at his other brothers. They were still securely sleeping and logged into the Novus. Astrid is not here, they sent her to a different chamber with the rest of the women. Please enter the elevator. What's all this, anyway? Did an engine blow off? He joked, but the silence from the drone unnerved him. It took him five minutes to reach his destination. The number 13 was ominously written on the white sliding door. The interior only had the minimum requirements for a person to live on it. A bed that could be stored with the push of a button, a small bathroom and shower area, a desk, and a monitor incorporated into a wall. You will receive further instructions in a minute, the drone said, and a timer appeared on the screen. Thank you for your cooperation. Have a nice day. Nice day, my ass, Alan muttered once the door shut behind him. I feel like a freaking prisoner. He glanced again at the timer, showing that 49 seconds remained. He approached a closed window and tried to activate it, but the red light showed it was locked. It's not like I wanted to see the blackness of space, anyway. Another glance at the monitor. 35 seconds remaining. He inspected the bathroom, looked at the emptiness of his desk, and finally sat on the edge of the bed. 17 seconds. No, seriously, what did I do? 13 seconds. The decompression process takes approximately 8 hours. 8 freaking hours have passed since I left the Novus. 7 seconds. And since our consciousness gets directly connected to a collective neural network, where the system can load and process our thoughts at a greater speed than humanly possible, time inside the Novus passes faster. So for a street, it has been like almost two days since I got disconnected. One second. There better be a good explanation for this, or I'll. The screen flashed for a second and the Santa Maria ship's crest appeared, which displayed a mermaid carrying a vase pouring water, encircled by stars, followed by a hexagonal logo he knew well. Greetings, passenger number 29317, Alan Warden. How are you feeling today? A monotonous voice trying to be cheerful spoke. Alan's annoyance quickly turned into fear and anxiety. Why am I being addressed by the ship's main computer instead of the active captain, the head of security, or at least someone with a face? Um, hi. I, I am good. I'm good. That's nice to hear, because we at Alvirium Enterprise care for your safety. Sure. He swallowed hard. Can you tell me what I'm doing here, please? Of course, Alan. But we have to discuss something first. According to your record, you signed up to be a technician for this ship. Is that correct, Alan? Why yeah, but I got rejected because I failed the last test. That will not be an issue anymore. In the absence of former captain, a absence, Robert Bosniak, I, the Santa Maria's main AI, 
codename Isabella, have been promoted to captain. H. Hold on, of the Santa Maria, chief of security and protector of humankind. So I, Isabella, promote you to chief technician until further notice. Could you please tell me what happened to Captain Bosniak? Did he get sick? I'm sorry, but I'm afraid that info is classified. What about the rest of the ship's staff? Anybody could fill the position better than me? Do not worry. I can provide you with video tutorials and technical documentation so you can be up to the task. So what do you say? Did something bad happen, Isabella? I'm sorry, but I'm afraid that info is classified. He closed his fists and raised his voice. If I'm the new chief whatever, I request permission to know what happened. Chief Technician, Alan Warden, are you implying that not knowing the requested information may affect your work performance by causing you mental stress? Yes, that's what's happening right now. Understood. In that case, passenger number 29317, Alan Warden, I will demote you to maintenance assistant. Oh, come on. Until further notice. Please understand that you are not currently in the best mental and physical condition to know the solicited requests. We can discuss the details later when you have completed your training. All the bickering made Alan forget why he had been summoned there. His eyes opened wide and his voice broke. W wait, come again? What training? The Santa Maria ship needs some repairs that regular drones cannot do. Until the ship returns to a self-sufficient status, you will be in charge of doing the necessary. How much time will it take me, he cried, placing both of his palms against the monitor. Because I need to go back to the Novus. Someone is waiting for me. Maintenance assistant, Alan Warden. Why yes m? Protocol might dictate that all non-staff passengers of the Santa Maria must remain logged into the Novus at all times. But please, believe me, this situation is extraordinary. So for the time being, the ship requires your services. I, I am not refusing to do the work, I signed up for it from the very beginning, he said in a quiet voice, looking away and taking a step back. That I was even logged into the Novus was like a miracle to me. I just want to know how much time I'll be away from the system. His mind got filled with the memory of the one he left behind. Her melodic voice, her shiny blonde hair, her deep blue eyes. The monitor remained silent for a couple of seconds. I can make an estimate, but it will take me some time. That would also depend on how well you adapt to the work. For the time being, rest here until your body recovers from the decompression process. Entertainment will be provided to you through this monitor, and dinner will be served in 120 minutes. Sleep well, and my apologies for any inconvenience this situation may cause you. The monitor turned off automatically, leaving only a distorted dark reflection of him. Yeah, glad to help. Glad to. Oh, God. He threw himself into the bed, watching the immaculate blankness of his temporary rooftop. No matter how much time passes, it will be multiplied by five inside the Novus anyway. So I'm screwed. And most important of all, what happened to the staff of the Santa Maria? At least 50 adults, men, and women volunteered to work outside the Novus for the safety of the ship and its passengers. The only thought that kept him fully awake until dinner time was whether the entire crew had died in an accident. A very nightmarish idea. Good morning, maintenance assistant, Alan Warden. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling pretty well, Alan replied while standing in the center of the room, wearing the yellow working clothes that had been provided to him through a delivery tube. Was the shower temperature to your liking, Alan? Good enough. Thanks. I just have a brief question, Captain Isabella. You do not have to call me by that title. Just call me Isabella, and I would love to answer your questions. As long as, I won't ask anything classified, I promise. I was just wondering, who's cooking? Was dinner and your breakfast not to your liking? I mean, don't take it personally, it was edible. But was tomato and corn soup the only thing you had? I'm hearing a tone of discomfort in your voice. I will try to serve you a bigger range of flavors in your next meals. Can I be the one cooking? I'm sorry, but the Santa Maria has no kitchens. The food that you have ingested is a series of chemicals that, wait, never mind. You don't need to explain it. If it makes you feel better, the food you will be enjoying for the next year. Did you say year? Has a more diverse taste than the paste we provide to the other passengers. Isn't that great? You said a year. Will I spend that much time outside the Novus? One year and four months. I have run a simulation, and that is the estimated time for you to finish the work. Do you have a schedule? 
I will display it on your monitor. The screen showed a calendar, which Alan studied for a minute, using the touch screen to advance through it. So I'll be working 10 hours a day? Affirmative. According to the Department of Working Ethics, change it to 18 hours. May I advise against it? Such a load of work could cause mental and physical. I can do it, Alan said aloud, staring at the camera above the monitor. If you ever detect that my performance is plummeting, you can readjust the schedule again. Got it? Understood. Working calendar updated. One year and four months, he muttered, glancing at the monitor. That would turn into six years and eight months inside the Novus. I'll do my best to take less time than that. 37. 3. E-Emergency Maintenance. Announcement. This is a free, unedited version of this story. 3. Emergency Maintenance. Here is another one, Alan said aloud to the hovering drone following him. He crouched in front of an automaton lying on the floor and started a diagnosis. Let's see, it will need a new left arm. The battery is completely toast, and the breastplate, although it has burn marks, is still functional. And why the hell does it have burn marks? An autonomous cart advanced toward him, and after a few clinking sounds, it opened a small drawer with the solicited battery. Thank you, Alan said, grabbing it. Seconds later, a bigger drawer revealed a robotic arm. As soon as the automaton received the new battery, it turned on and sat, twisting its head towards Alan, staring at him with motionless lit digital eyes. It played a short melody, indicating it was rebooting itself. It's taking an unusual amount of time. Greetings, technician, Alan Warden, the automaton said, after scanning the code from Alan's badge. Thank you for assisting me today. You're welcome. Here, I have this other part for you, it's from an older model, but it should be compatible. Alan installed the left arm and a click sound signal that had been magnetically attached. Compatibility confirmed. Thank you. Hey, can you tell me how you ended up like this? Broken? The automaton asked before standing up. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid that I have lost my latest records after my battery ran out of energy. I'm currently using my backup data from March 19. Anything else I can do for you, Alan? before returning to my duties? No, Alan smiled at it. Thanks, go back to work. Have a nice day. The automaton made a salute and started walking away, being followed by Alan's gaze. Isabella? Yes, Alan? The AI responded through the drone hovering above him. Did you wipe his memory just now? Yes. The automaton could have leaked sensitive data to you. I need to learn what happened here, Captain. Sooner or later. I concur. You can review all the classified information once you end your work. So I have to keep working, knowing nothing? You're asking too much from me. He glanced at the once white walls, now tainted with plasma burns. The floors have been mopped, messily and rashly. Fine. Where is the next automaton? While working on this, I've learned how easy the life of a fellow human could end with a single malfunction. He stared at a passenger's capsule, just like the one he had abandoned to help Isabella four months ago. How many chambers have presented problems, Isabella? He asked while identifying the issue. There was a leak of oxygen from the glass. Besides this one, none. Once the Santa Maria returns to an autonomous state, you won't need my services anymore, you've said it already. I just hope I don't end up like the other members of the staff, wherever they are. He took the small glue gun from his belt and applied it to the visible crack. After an effervescent reaction, the chemical hardened in an instant. Before leaving, Alan looked at the sleeping passenger, a brunette girl around his age, who was oblivious to the fact that she could have died in a couple of hours. Fixing panels, opening jammed automatic doors, eating paste, drinking something resembling apple juice every day for the last 186 days. Having other automatons helping me has increased everyday productivity by 300%. Well, that's what Isabella claims, and still, 186 freaking days with no human contact. Isabella's digital voice has been the only thing keeping me sane. She promised to give me entertainment, but it is all curated by the vice captain, Kasuo, delete this indecent, immoral garbage Yoshida. Nothing but classical music and computer-generated landscapes. There's not a single thing on earth that could look that green or that blue. While sitting on the toilet, he held a screw aloft, examining its shape and metallic gleam as if he could discern the ship's secrets through it if he tried hard enough. 
Years ago, I watched a show where humanity started developing psychic abilities due to their exposure to space travel. Maybe I could do it too. Although after all this time with no human contact, it wouldn't be superpowers, just my mind going crazy. He flushed the toilet, washed his hands in the sink, and stared at his reflection, finding an 18-year-old male teen with dark marks beneath his eyes. His auburn brown hair had grown a lot since he had left his creopod, and wondered if one of the many automatons could help him cut it. I can still do it. I can keep working if that's what you're asking, he said to his green-eyed reflection before returning to his bed and throwing the screw into the air and catching it. Sorry for the interruption. Where was I? Ah, yes. Let's try again, New London's bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. New London's bridge is falling down. Your turn. Alan, would you prefer I change the tone of my voice? That may help with whatever you are trying to accomplish. Could you do that for me? Yes, please. How about this voice? Too high-pitched. How about this one? Try less deep. Like this? Whoa. Now try singing. New London's bridge is falling down. Try speaking 20% slower. Is falling down, falling down. Nice. Your new voice is so butter melting that I could die. Expect my performance to increase from now on. Glad to help. Hey, ISA? Yes? How can I help you, Alan? Could you tell me which capsule Astrid Bradford is in? I'm sorry, but that info is classified. For the well-being of her privacy. Because here, in Alvirium Enterprise, skip ad, understood. It's not like I wanted to watch her sleeping or something like that. Although, as a maintenance engineer, you can access some of her records from my database. Only if it is important to your. Am I an engineer now? Alan sat up. Yes, please, it's important. Understood. Request by maintenance engineer, Alan Warden, to consult level blue information. Access granted. Results regarding, passenger number 29316, Astrid Bradford. Five entries found. Alan jumped out of the bed and stared at the screen. Why is that number familiar? He muttered to himself while examining the files displayed. Astrid Bradford was registered seconds before you, Alan. Would you like to review her register interview? Yes, he said, his mouth ajar at the sight of the blonde appearing on the monitor. The date displayed on the video was from four months ago. She could be seen entering a stall with transparent windows. Inside and outside the Novus, she looks like an adorable living doll. A muse sent by the gods, no, an angel who lost her way back to heaven. Name, please. An electronic voice spoke on the video. That would be a street Bradford, she replied while tucking golden strands of hair behind her ear, barely looking at the camera. Registration found. Age 17. 5 feet, 3 inches tall. Currently weighing 112 pounds. Hey, can you keep it down, please? Please, tell us, why would you like to board the Santa Maria? Why? Well. It's this, or having a slow death here on Earth, am I right? She smirked innocently, making Alan chuckle. Wait, this is not being recorded, is it? Whatever. My father wouldn't have it otherwise. Happy? Oh, Astrid, I promise to return to you. Just you wait, Alan half smiled while caressing the screen until something made him frown. The video showed Astrid constantly watching at her side. What's distracting you? She is looking at the interior of the neighboring stall, Isabella answered. Would you like me to play the recording of that interview too? Yes. Video recording number one, from passenger number 29317, playing. Name, please. Alan Warden. Is that my interview? He glanced back at the other side of the monitor, where Astrid's video window had been paused, now eternally looking at her left. Registration found. Age 17. 5 feet, 10 inches tall. Currently weighing 150 pounds. I suppose, the recorded Alan replied with a tired expression on his face. Please, tell us, why would you like to board the Santa Maria? You're asking why? Because I failed my primary objective, okay? And my mentor told me that thanks to my efforts I had a guaranteed ticket to enter here. If you could say that failing counts as an achievement. Alan paused his interview and played Astrid's. Miss Astrid? Why yeah? What is it? She turned to the camera, looking confused. Could you answer the question, please? Absolutely. Um, could you repeat it? She didn't hear what I was saying, right? 
Alan asked. Affirmative. I keep the information collected in the interview process private from civilian passengers. What other records do you have of her? Playing recording number two. The video showed a security camera of her sitting in the Alvarium's facilities dining room with no company, although the recording's audio revealed more people were around. Alan read the video's date. That's from a couple of weeks before they launched the Santa Maria into space. Playing recording number three, another surveillance camera, from a later date. A strid could be seen leaning over a wall of the many staff corridors, carrying a dozen folded blankets. I recognize what she's doing there. She volunteered to assist others in the facility, running errands. But why is she standing there, doing nothing? Were you monitoring her at all times? He joked. My sister AI, Elizabeth, from the Alvirium headquarters on Earth, had been instructed to record any instance of strange behavior from any of the selected passengers. Wait, what? I was joking. Was eating alone in the cafeteria considered strange? That is correct. Elizabeth had suspected passenger number 29316, Astrid Bradford, of having depression or sociopathic tendencies. If that would have been the case, Astrid would have been rejected from the Novus program and another candidate would have been selected. Come on, you can't diagnose something like that just by. According to Elizabeth's logs, 15 instances of Astrid Bradford showing unfavorable behavior were recorded, but as requested by Executive Director Aston Bradford, Elizabeth re-evaluated her previous assessment. Aston Bradford? Is that her father? Something new was happening in the video, where Astrid started strolling through the corridor. A few feet away from her, a door had opened and a young man exited from it while distractedly talking to someone inside. Seconds later, the unaware guy crashed into Astrid, making her drop the blankets. I remember that day, he muttered, watching himself aiding her as she grinned at him. Don't tell me that she did that on purpose. On September 12th, Elizabeth finally registered positive social interaction from Astrid Bradford, closing the case. Playing recording number four, Alan watched himself talking to a smiling Astrid inside the Santa Maria. She was using the last set of clothes she would be seen with before entering the Creo chambers. Playing recording number five, passenger number 29316, Astrid Bradford, are you ready to enter the Nova system? Yes, a nervous Astrid replied from inside her capsule, a ventilator already attached to her face and no clothes covering her shoulders. Scanning. No health conditions have been found. Although your heart rate is higher than normal, there is nothing to worry about, Astrid. This process will be as simple as sleeping. It's not that. I'm already used to this. It's just that. I did something embarrassing just a few minutes ago. Was it an unpleasant experience, Astrid? Not at all. On the contrary. Jay just continue. With those words, the remaining seconds of the video showed her falling profoundly asleep. That would be all for today, Isabella, Alan said, in a dry voice. Leave the monitor as it is, please. Understood, Alan. Good night. Good night. The room's lights went out as Alan remained in his place, his face illuminated by the lit screen. He tapped it with his index finger and started watching the videos all over again. Name, please. That would be Astrid Bradford. Chief Technician, Alan Warden, congratulations on solving every issue on board the Santa Maria. Well done. Yeah, and it only took me, what, 241 days. Glad to be of service, he said, bitterly glancing at the hovering drone. What's next? As a sign of gratitude, today's dinner will be cake. Oh, that would be nice. His grin faded at the sound of an incoming delivery tube. The same method used to transport his usual meals made of paste. You have to be kidding me. He reluctantly grabbed the recipient. Cheers. I guess. He took a sip and frowned. I, Isabella. Yes, Alan? This actually tastes good. Is it strawberry? Even though it's paste like always, it's quite different from what I eat every day. Thanks, Captain. Glad to hear that. It was the product of trial and error until finding the right amount of mixed chemicals to achieve the desired flavor. What happened to the failed attempts? I thought nothing on the ship would go to waste. I feed it to the other passengers. Figures. Chief Technician, Alan Warden, it's time for you to learn what happened on the ship 243 days ago, and the reason I kept it as classified information from you until now. Goddammit, he muttered while rushing his way through the automatic track that would lead him back to the Creo chambers. 
A flying drone followed him. Chief Technician, Alan Warden, it would be wise to rest at least a day before entering the Novus again. I'll rest in the capsule anyway, he said, too impatient to wait for the doors to be fully open. I was referring to your mental health, Alan. Receiving all that info has taken a toll on your psyche. I've been here for eight months, so resting a day here won't help, trust me. He got in his capsule and removed his clothes as fast as he could. Once he stored them by throwing them inside, he laid down and put his ventilator on. Passenger number 29317, Alan Warden, are you ready to enter the Novus system? Yes, hurry. Scanning. Your heart rate is unusually high, and your stress levels are. Inject me with something to calm myself, or whatever, just let me in, now. As he got forcibly sleepy, a memory crept into his mind. Are you nervous? He had asked a frowning Astrid, 244 days ago. A little, she replied, looking away and puffing her chest out. Her lost in thought expression is especially cute. They, and a thousand others, were standing on the automatic track, being transported to where they would spend years sleeping and dreaming of another world. There's nothing to worry about, trust me, he said, grabbing her shoulder. This technology is not that new, you know? It has been tested for a decade at least. Twelve years, specifically, she blurted out. And that's not what I'm worried about, she said with a tiny voice, as a hovering drone got close to them. Alan Warden, please step onto the left track. Thank you for your cooperation. Astrid Bradford, please step on the right track. Thank you for your cooperation. Thomas Grant, please. Well, this is it, Alan said as he glanced at the forked road. Why yeah, she muttered without looking at him. Two different destinations were ahead of them. As Alan glanced at her bob hairstyle, he wished he could come up with something. He wished to find the right words and make that a moment worth remembering. But it's not like we'll never meet again. We can hang out inside the Novus again. At least I hope so. I'll see you around, he finally said, as the Y-shaped track separated them. A street did not glance back, which made his chest ache. It's fine, he said to himself. Alan. The girl suddenly cried while backtracking, pushing other girls aside. Yes, he replied, as both constantly grew apart. Once we get inside, we should remain together. You mean like, teaming up? He asked, inadvertently pushing away other passengers. Watch it, one grunted. I was thinking more like dating. Astrid shouted, smiling, making other girls in the line whisper to each other. Darty, are you serious? Yes, we should totally date. What do you say? I would love to. Such declarations of love made other men in line groan. Lucky bastard. Find me, Alan. Find me, please. She beamed. I will. He shouted, as it became impossible for the two to keep eye contact. I will. 33. For a emergency welcoming, Alan? As his body got used to his new surroundings a quiet voice called to him and a hand touched his shoulder. Am I? Am I in the Novus? Yes, Alan, we are. Are we, in Eunice Town? No, the system says we're in a place called the Renovatio Caves. Oh, man, did we return to the very beginning of the world? I suppose it's understandable. His partner remained quiet as he sat in his place, squinting. It will take us hours to reach Eunice Town. Damn it, I really wanted to see her right, wait, who am I talking to? He opened his eyes wide, and his heart skipped a beat. A brunette girl with emerald eyes wearing two frontal low pigtails was crouching in front of him. A blank expression on her face. Anne, who are you? I'm a copy of Isabella, here inside the Novus. Alan shook his head. Wait, hold on, why are you wearing those clothes? He pointed to her sleeved white dress. It was the same attire every woman used on their first day inside the system. Are you pretending to be a user? I'm practically a user now, Alan. We talked about this. I know, but when you told me you'd insert yourself into the Novus to help me, I imagined something quite different. Please elaborate, she said emotionlessly. For a moment I thought she would frown. Well, I thought you would log in as some sort of mascot, or that you would follow me everywhere as a spirit, or manifest all godlike, with administrative powers. I don't have power here, Alan. That is something the developers made sure of. They did not want me to intervene with their system. I. Yes, I know. You told me about it. He glanced at her, who was patiently waiting for him to stand up and lead the way. But why did you have to take such a cute appearance? 
he got closer to examine her face. It's okay, I'm not being a creep. This pretty girl in front of me is just a disguised AI. He poked her cheek, but there was no reaction from her. This is just a very convincing disguise, she's not a human, not that it matters. After all, I just have eyes for. A street, he cried, getting on his feet in an instant. Even if I'm in the middle of nowhere, I should still be able to send her a message. Let's see, by making a gesture with his hand, he made a screen appear in front of him and started tapping. Status. Equipment. Inventory. Social. Guild. Error. System. The fake girl leaned to him and tried to take a peek at the visible floating window, but for her, its contents were blank. What is that, she asked, and Alan thought for a second that she would squint. It's my user interface. You should have one too, don't you? How do I open mine? Are you seriously asking me that? You, a super advanced AI? Alan Warden, she said in an unemotional tone of voice, but Alan imagined she was upset. I assure you I'm not joking. Joking? While I, Isabella's copy, am here to assist you, think of me as a newborn human. Newborn? Please, trust me when I say that I have little information of the Novus or its many complex operations. Alan, who tried to maintain a serious expression, chuckled, making the girl stare blankly at him. Sorry, sorry. Fine, I'll teach you everything I know. Here, make this gesture, as if you tried to wipe something away with your fingers. He made a demonstration of it, and the girl did the same. You got it. See? Whatever information it reveals to you, it's for your eyes only, so don't worry that someone would spy on you over your shoulder. Understood, she said, and started tapping on her own. That's right. Now, about that message. He opened his friend list. Social. Friends. 1. Astrid Bradford. Lundoris Capital. Oh, thank God. I don't know what I would have done if her name had disappeared. Hum? It shows her current location. Lundoris Capital? Where is that? So I won't be able to see her in person until I arrive there. Fine, a message will do for the moment. He started writing. Hi. Long time no see, huh? Forgive me for being so. He stopped, deleted it, and rewrote it three more times. In the end, it only read, Hi. I don't think I'll be able to find the words to. He closed the messenger window and read his overall status. Status. Renovatio Caves. 9.35 a.m. Alan Warden. Level 5. Gold. 100,200. Class. None. Strength. Bronze. D. Vitality. Bronze. D. Agility. Bronze. E. Spirit. Bronze. E. Potential. Bronze. E. Still level 5, huh? Well, that's understandable. My old equipment is still here too, and what's this? 100,200 gold? What? Why do I have such an absurd amount of money? I'm pretty sure those 200 gold coins were already there before logging out. He stood up and took a peek out of his rock chamber. This place is empty and quiet. Obviously, this place's only purpose was for users to reincarnate here. The developers only wanted to create the narrative of why fully grown humans would appear in this new world out of nowhere. He glanced back at the girl, who was constantly tapping and scrolling down her screen. What's she doing? Her menu should be pretty empty, like mine. Let's get out of here, Isabella. Although your acknowledgement is correct, please remember that I'm not the real Isabella. Okay. So, Isabella the second? She stood up slowly. If you do not mind, I would prefer to be called differently. Isabella is a unique name among the Santa Maria's passengers, and it would raise suspicion. She glanced at her menu screen, still active. Fine, you're right. He shrugged. What should I call you then? She stared deeply into his eyes. Ashley. As they traversed the caves, a thick fog covered their path and the light from luminescent mushrooms led the way. Just because we're in the beginner's zone doesn't mean we can lower our guard. There should be level 1 monsters around here, so be careful. I have seen other users get killed by them, and they had to start from the caves all over again. Since I'm level 5, I'll take the lead in case something happens, okay? Understood, Ashley replied, while consciously looking at her feet. It's cool, right? He gazed at her, then at her legs. Being able to move in 3D, I already have experience doing it. I have maneuvered some of the ship's automatons to take care of tasks personally. Oh. I didn't know that. 
He swallowed, wondering if he had crossed paths with her without knowing it. Still, it's weird, you know. Being able to speak and look you in the eye at the same time. Even though she's a copy, it's the copy of someone that has interacted with me for eight months. She's like a big sister to me. A fake big sister. This situation is new to me too, she said, looking at her hands. This body differs greatly from an automaton. Can you, feel things? She crossed eyes with him, remaining quiet for a second as if she was processing her answer. It seems so, yes. A squeaking sound crawled out of the corner of the naked rock. Quiet, Alan whispered and took a peek, finding a regular green slime, endlessly looking for living beings to dissolve in its gelatinous bodies. That's what I was talking about. Equip set A, he ordered, and the system automatically geared him up with an iron breastplate, old leather boots, and an unsharpened short blade. Hey, Ashley, since you kind of cheated your way inside the Novus and all that, did you bring a weapon or, I don't know, some kind of OP unique skill with you? I have some stuff on my inventory. Do you want me to equip them now? She has? Yes, I don't want to risk returning to the Renovatio Caves again. Understood. Wait a moment, please. Equipping. She opened her menu and, with quick wrist movements, materialized a shiny silver breastplate, gauntlets, and steel boots. On her back, a quiver full of arrows appeared, a sheathed dagger in her belt, and a bow hovered in front of her for a couple of seconds before she grabbed it. A marksman, huh? Alan nodded. Do you know how to use that? To prepare for coming here, I have analyzed thousands of data recordings on the use of distinct kinds of weapons. That sounds about right, but there's not much space here and it will be difficult to shoot. For now, just use that dagger of yours, okay? Understood. Changing tactics. How odd, she shouldn't be able to equip silver gear right off the bat. And I can't see her level. Could these irregularities be the product of her, hacking herself inside the Novus? He shook his head. Focus, Alan. Stay close to me, and don't attack unless necessary, got it? Yes, Alan. I'm ready. It feels strange having a lenient partner this time. Astrid would have attacked head-on without consulting me. He took a deep breath. Go. Alan raised his sword, ready to strike the very first slime in his reach, but what he found instead, froze him in his place. There was indeed a low-level creature in front of him, but when he looked closer, it had the shape of a boy crouching to grab a mushroom. The green kid stared back at him, although it had no eyes nor a face. It produced a sound similar to a cry for help and ran away. Why did you stop, Alan? Ashley asked behind him. I. I. Um. Another humanoid got into his sight of view, holding a bag with both of its gelatinous arms. Alan could see its info, level 12, advanced slime. It was wearing pants and a shirt, just like any other farmer or worker. The thing that looked like a child was pulling it by its clothes and pointed at the couple stepping out of the shadows. The worker tilted its head to its right. Wait a minute. It talked, but its voice sounded like it was underwater. Are you two coming from the caves? Once Alan left his bewilderment behind, he glanced at the bag he was holding. In it were the shiny blue mushrooms that he had seen growing on his way there. Why yes? Alan replied, putting away his sword. And you. You're slimes, correct? Oh, for the love of Viola. You really are coming from the caves. Have you all evolved? Alan asked while following the humanoids down the road. That's a simple way to explain it, yes. All thanks to the goddess Viola. Bless her. Alan, Ashley got close to whisper in his ear. That's the name of an administrator. Viola language. Alan did not reply, frowning. If that's the case, this whole situation sounds messed up. Just a little heads up before we get there, the slime man said. As you can see, we do not mean any harm to you. The days when we fought against new users have long passed. So please, we won't try anything weird, we promise. And it's funny that he addresses us by what we practically are. The more they advanced through the tunnels, the more they could hear the sound of people. Alan could remember a large spacious area inside the mountain where a subterranean river flowed through. If I remember correctly, Astrid and I spent our first whole day killing slimes until a boss appeared. What he found instead was a completely operational town. Bridges to cross over the cliffs, stone houses, and even a building that resembled a church. If they worship Viola Lang there, I'm going to puke. 
Alan stared at a quadruped creature he recognized as a low-level monster, being used as a carrying animal. There were also workshops, construction materials, and furniture. As the group walked through, every translucent humanoid stared at them with a blank face. Their concern could be seen in their body language. Some wearing skirts shared whispers with each other, and those wearing vests and jackets scratched their heads or folded their arms. When was the last time they saw a human walking through this place? Smio, one of them called aloud. Explain, now. Why are these users here? You know as much as I do. They just walked out of the Renovatio Caves. Their guide turned its head to Alan, expecting him to corroborate the story. Alan cleared his throat first. He's telling the truth. And if you excuse us, we would like to cross through your lands with no issue. That doesn't explain why you come from that direction. As the others surrounded them, the bulky slime blocked their path. A dangerous number 20 clearly visible above its head. Oh, come on. Alan cried out loud, crossing his gaze with everyone. Is it that crazy that some of us would be simply late to the party? You're level 5, and that's impossible since there's no living creature left back there for you to level up. Unless, the huge guy cracked his knuckles, even though no sound came from them. Crap, is he suggesting that we killed some of their people? I'm ready, Alan, Ashley whispered at his back, making the threatening slime back off. And no, we will not retaliate, he replied while gritting his teeth, wondering if they could escape through the crowd until they heard another commanding voice. Back off, Smollett, I would like to talk with them. The group stepped aside to let another slime person, wearing pants and leather boots, stroll towards Alan. Its exposed torso showed a rib cage. Pardon the manners of my people, travelers, but you have to understand that we have seen no humans in these parts of the caves in a long, long time. Follow me. Smio, you too. Alan followed him, feeling piercing, non-visible glares from everyone around them. Thanks, man. Um, shouldn't have said that. I'm Smudok, leader of this humble tribe, the seemingly older slime man said, as it led the way to the town outskirts. I'm Alan, and she's Ashley. He glanced at her, noticing that she was holding the slime kid by its hand. Cute. So, Smudok, do you believe our story? I only believe the facts. Your levels don't match your story and that's simply suspicious, but I suppose it has something to do with you having been logged out of the Novus, correct? The slime child left them behind to play with other kids. Between them was a pair of regular limbless slimes, jumping and running. Ah. Are those supposed to be babies? Wait, what did he say? Do you know about the Novus? Alan frowned, halting. Are you asking if we know that this is a virtual environment? Every NU that has spawned here in the system knows it. What's an NU? Non-user, he looked around. Smio? Yes, chief? The slime man they had met from the beginning took a step forward, with a very human-like reluctant attitude. Ride them to Eunice, will you? Yes, chief. You too, come this way. Do people from Eunice know about you? Alan asked Smudok before parting. Yes. Although the closer you get to Lundorus capital, the more users that oppose our existence you'll encounter. Oppose? That's an interesting way to say it. It'd be a good idea to keep quiet about this place then. Yes. We would appreciate that. Chief. Ashley stepped forward, making Alan stop in his tracks. We would equally appreciate it if our arrival could be kept a secret too. Understood. No one has to know that we just logged in, correct? Alan whispered to Ashley as they got transported in a wooden cart pulled by one of the creatures residing in the area, a black, giant insect with frontal claws that hissed silently as it walked forward. We must not create panic among the other users, Ashley replied with a straight face. The locals have already questioned you about your low level, so keep it in mind while contacting other people. Alan sighed as he lied down. Yeah, I'll have to come up with a clever excuse or something. The entrance to the caves was now out of sight, and the mountains on top of it looked blue on the horizon. Alan estimated that for them to reach Eunice, it would take at least half an hour. So much time has passed that even these creatures have their own trading business. He glanced at the crates at his side, filled with blue, glowing mushrooms. Hey, Smio, what are these used for? Originally, users would create low-ranking mana potions with them, but since those have become practically useless, they're now used as ingredients for food. 
although I've never tried a dish myself, I see, Alan said before yawning. To combat his boredom, he opened his user interface, checking the tabs more thoroughly. What is this? Guild menu? Oh, right. I never had the chance to check it out since I logged out after forming it with a strid. He tapped it, getting a complete list of every member. What? Alan jolted in his place. 100 members. And all of them are part of. Yes, I'm not misreading it. Shooting stars. These 100 members are part of our guild. That's crazy, Astrid. Did you do this all by yourself? A cracking sound startled him, then the ground trembled. He leaned towards Smyo's seat, only to see an enormous figure approaching them. What is that? Oh, my goddess. Smyo cried as he ordered the insect to come to a halt. It's the Weezenarx. The, instead of a Weezenarx. Alan wondered as he watched the red-furred mammal beast with an elongated body. It started salivating at the sight of the black insect tied to the cart, which was shaking in fear. Alan noticed the number 15 above the Weezenarx. Oh, shit. Smollett is usually in charge of guarding the cart every time we go to Eunice. Smyo cried as it rushed inside to look for its weapon, a wooden staff. Who, that bulky level 20, advanced smile. Alan asked as he saw Smyo shake terrified. But why is he so afraid? If Smyo dies, he should be able to respawn back in his town, right? He glanced at the carnivorous beast, waiting for them to retaliate and crush them under its paws. Out of the cart, now, the top of the fragile vehicle got torn apart by a quick swing of a tail. Alan pulled out his rusty sword, while Smyo remained in its place, covering its head, crying, I don't want to devolve. I don't want to devolve, I don't want to. Devolve? Alan frowned, coming to a realization. So those regular-looking slimes back in town were not babies? He swallowed. Ashley, battle mode, Alan? Full-on battle mode, girl. Engaging. Listen, I'll try to, Alan stopped mid-sentence, as he noticed a blurry silhouette jump from his side. The next thing he saw was Ashley on top of the Weezenarx, stabbing its head with her dagger. The beast wailed agonizingly, trying to crush Ashley against a nearby boulder. The girl would not let go, even after being smashed into the rock. That last push seemed to have finally knocked out the creature, which plummeted lifelessly into the road, Ashley by its side, retrieving her weapon. Hey! Smyo, Alan muttered. Yes, user? She's the reason your chief didn't send Smollett with us, Alan whispered. I just remembered the reason I couldn't see her level. The level gap between us must be enormous. Target eliminated, Ashley said, strolling back to them, seemingly unharmed. Yes, I noticed. Alan beamed at her. But why didn't you use your bow? You should have more proficiency with it than your dagger. Ashley stared blankly at him. You told me to only use the dagger. Announcement. Click here to buy it. 27. 5 E emergency loaning. Is that Eunice Town? Alan asked, flabbergasted, watching new, tall buildings that did not exist during his previous visit. It is, Smyo replied, instructing the insect to take the road to their left, circling the outskirts. I'm going to deliver the gloom shrooms. What about you? We'll be fine. Will you be okay returning on your own? Yes, the Weezenarx only spawns once a day. Drop us here then. And good luck. Farewell, users. May the goddess Viola bless your path. Do you think Viola programmed them to worship her unconditionally? Alan asked Ashley while observing the cart parting. That is something worth investigating, but it is not our priority. You're right, but I don't see us fulfilling our primary goal anytime soon. He crossed eyes with her. I was in a hurry to enter the Novus, but now that I'm here I don't know where to start. Ashley stood silent for a bit without taking her eyes off him, making him nervous. She's pretty cute, but damn she's weird. Although it may be wise to ask the residents if they have noticed anomalies in the system, remember that we must work as discreetly as possible. We must not let classified info get to regular users. What do you suggest then? The only people in all of Novus we could talk to regarding this issue are the administrators. Alan exhaled while scratching his chin. I knew you would say something like that. Let me take the lead for a little longer, we'll still need resources and information. So let's first travel to Lundoris capital and reunite with Astrid, okay. I bet she'll help us contact an administrator. Understood. Just remember that no one can know about our mission. Not even her. 
Yes, I get the importance of keeping it a secret. Come on, let's find a way to get there. We'll also need a map. The one I have only covers part of the Renovatio Caves and the road to get here. They walk through the back alleys, the smell of food getting to them. This must be a restaurant area, and since cooking inside the Novus doesn't produce waste, this place doesn't reek of trash or decay. Alan? Ashley called out, while putting a hand against her stomach. I don't feel so good. You must be hungry. I'm starving too. But why is this body suffering such a thing? Wait, can she even get hungry? He first frowned at her, before remembering she did not have information about the Novus. This must be new to her. Listen, although the pods are constantly feeding us users with nutrients, this doesn't change the fact that we'll feel hunger here. And even though you're not human, the system is just doing its work by making you feel that way. See it as a necessity instead of an annoyance. Although this hunger is fake, I suppose the developers implemented it so that we wouldn't forget our human fragility and dependency. Alan glanced forward, noticing that they were a few feet away from the public street. Let's not gather unwanted attention. We must be like shadows. Try to blend among the whoa, whoa, whoa. He looked at his surroundings, seeing fancy restaurants, giant ads, and brilliant colors everywhere he turned. This place has changed a lot. It looks like a little city now. People passing him by stared at him. Alan, Ashley grabbed his shoulder. We're gathering unwanted. Look at that place. They serve ramen there. Wait, that other place serves pizza. Alan, Ashley insisted, while the surrounding people frowned at both. Wait. If I'll finally be able to get decent food after so long, I want it to be special. Come on, Ashley. Let's go to the biggest one, that one down the street. He pointed at an establishment where a dragon decoration seemed to try to scare them away instead of inciting them to enter. Alan rushed there while holding Ashley's hand, before noticing what he had done. Eh sorry, he said, blushing. Her hand is so soft. Like a real girl. If it's really necessary, let's go then, she said, emotionless. Damn it, Ashley, at least pretend that you're embarrassed too. Welcome, an NPC opened the door for them. Table for two? Follow me, please. Alan looked around. The establishment was almost full of users drinking and laughing to their heart's content, some wearing workers' clothes and others using leather and silver armor. What stood out was a giant projection in the back, showing a pink-haired girl, dancing and singing like a pop star. Asterisk asterisk, my hea art, goes boom boom when you're arooned. So don't leave. Asterisk asterisk, there's even entertainment created by users now? That's cool. I wonder if they have tried making movies yet. Once they took their seats, the hostess smiled at them. I have never seen you around. First time coming? Why yes. You can access the menu by pushing this button and a waitress will bring your food as soon as she can. Enjoy your meal. Just as the hostess walked away, Ashley quickly leaned towards him to whisper. Alan, please provide me with a crash course on how to eat. I never thought I would hear something like that in my entire life. He cleared his throat, making his best effort not to chuckle. Don't stuff big pieces into your mouth. Chew first and then swallow. Don't talk while eating. You know what? Just follow my example. Understood. The sight of an NPC waitress caught his attention, and his gaze quickly focused on her maid dress, apron, and thigh-high stockings. Just watching these beauties makes me feel rejuvenated. I had forgotten how cute girls, real or imitations, move and talk. Wait a minute. He whispered to Ashley, I have a task for you. If it's in my capabilities, consider it done, Ashley replied in a serious tone, which made Alan feel guilty. Just a little. Do you agree that we must blend between the people? Correct. If we can pass as regular users, that would help us achieve our goal. In that case, I think you should learn how to act more, girly. What do you mean? I've seen you walk. What about it? Your posture and movements are very rigid. She stared at him thoughtfully. Do I look, what you would describe as, unnatural? Yes. I didn't want to mention it earlier, but you move like the Santa Maria's automatons. I understand. I'll study the way these females walk then, she said, staring at a nearby waitress. Please, do that. Satisfied with that outcome, Alan pushed the button within reach of his hand and a virtual screen appeared in front of him. At the top was displayed the name of the establishment and a rudimentary animation of a dragon dancing. Ashley, order something too. 
Whatever you think you would like. I do not have experience knowing which food is the most appropriate for me. Order for me please, she said, without taking her eyes off every waitress that passed nearby. Fine. I suppose I could choose what could be considered, food for first timers. What am I even saying? What about this? Smashed potatoes, a bowl of chicken soup, and a lemonade for her. A hamburger with fries, lasagna, apple pie, and a soda for me. Oh, God, I can already taste it all. Only two minutes had passed before a waitress brought all the food to them, carrying the dishes as if they weighed nothing, and placed them all on Alan's side of the table. Sorry, but I haven't received the lady's order. Oh, right, that's okay, I ordered for her. See? He passed the soup and mashed potatoes to Ashley, who scrutinized the employee. I see, the waitress said, smiling widely like a doll. Enjoy your meal, haven't I seen her before? Alan thought, as both of them stared at her. Wait, we look weird acting like this. Ashley, please put a hold on your research and dig in. Why would I want to dig here? Eat, please. Ashley looked at her food, studying it. She took the bowl of soup first and lifted it, putting its edge against her lips. You should have used the spoon, but that's okay too, Alan said, nodding, ready to munch on his hamburger until a liquid sound made him turn his gaze towards her. Ashley, he cried with closed teeth. Swallow. She stopped. Lips, chin, neck, and chest soaked in chicken soup. By your reaction, I understand I made some kind of mistake. Here. He grabbed the spoon. Fill it first, like this. Put it in your mouth and practice how to swallow. It's like teaching a newborn. He glanced at her chest. The system's physics had accurately rendered how a wool dress like hers would look wet, lining her medium-sized breasts perfectly. It's not okay to stare, Alan, even if she's not a real girl. He massaged his forehead until feeling a set of eyes on him. He looked at the table beside them and found a man observing him while munching. Be a shadow, Alan. Hey, the man called aloud. Are you bugged? I'm going to regret this. Excuse me? It says that you're level 5. The man pointed at the number above Alan's head. That's why I'm asking if you're suffering from a bug. How to escape from this conversation without him asking more questions? That's the same thing I was wondering. It happened yesterday, so I'm going to Lundoris to get some help. Good, check that out. It's pretty odd. Maybe an administrator could help you out. The man's partner joined the conversation while sipping beer. Finally, a clue. Do you know where I could? Good luck with that though. Both laughed. Why you? You're right, Alan whispered before sipping his cola. Hey. Am I dreaming? Well, yes, technically, but this tastes amazing. He started munching on his burger, as tears of joy started running down on his full cheeks. Months working outside, so that this system can keep running smoothly. All worth it. Alan glanced at his partner, who remained quiet, staring at the contents of her bowl. Have you been able to swallow yet? Yes. So, how was it? A range of pleasurable sensations has been activated in my tongue. Yes. That's a way to describe it. Can I taste this too? She asked, looking at the mashed potatoes. Go ahead, those two dishes are all yours. Thanks, she said, using the same spoon. After taking a mouthful, her expression, although neutral at a first glance, showed a glimmer in her eyes. I'm witnessing something unique. Do you like it? He asked, grinning. Yes, here. He cut a piece of his burger and offered it to her. This is quite different, it's solid, you'll have to chew first. When will I know it's time to swallow it? I think you'll have to practice to get used to it, I don't want you to choke, so at least chew it like 30 times. Understood, she said while putting the whole piece in her mouth, chewing slowly, then quicker. Finally swallowing. Alan Warden, I do not intend to take away more of your food. Can I order the same thing for me? Sure, go crazy and order whatever you want. Ashley quickly pressed the button on her side of the table and started tapping every dish available to order. Oh, come on. He opened the menu again and checked the prices, ranging from 100 to 300 gold. Ah, this is all pretty cheap, actually. Fine, if you can't finish it all, I'll help you. He giggled, remembering the 100,030 gold in his account. Let's see who can eat more. Are you ready? He pointed at her face with her index finger while she remained silent, chewing. Oh, right, I told her not to talk while eating. Minutes later, 
Alan would find out that every dish had a temperature slider, which is kind of neat and crazy, you know. While eating, he consulted his user interface to check his status again and his friend list again, finally noticing that one of the menu options was not available. Error? It does nothing when I tap it, and I can't recall if it was available before logging out. ISA, I mean, Ashley, could you do me a favor and open your user interface? What does it say under the guild option? I do not have the guild option. Figures. Above system? She stared at the window for a moment. It says error dot. And this, my friends, is called gluttony. What was I thinking? He said before burping. I feel a minor discomfort in the stomach, but excluding that, this was a pleasant experience. Yeah, let's just call it that, grub. Hey! A new customer occupied the table next to them and called him aloud. Are my eyes deceiving me, or, it's a bug? I'll try to fix it once I travel to Londoris. Have a nice day. After putting away the last plate, the waitress strolled towards them, eternally grinning. Did you enjoy your meal, sir, miss? Yes, it was quite pleasant, Ashley replied, nodding for the first time since she had logged in. Quick learner. Grup. Oh, God. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks for coming to the dragon's belly. Here's your bill. While feeling heartburns, Alan squinted hard at the waitress, finally recognizing her. Miss. Did you used to work at the town hall? The NPC did not remove the grin off her face. That is correct, sir until a year ago when the new mayor rescinded my services. Fortunately, Lord Reed has given me work here. Anything else I can do for you? She pushed the floating window toward him, still smiling. I don't see a glimpse of resentment in her, as expected from a basic AI. He looked at the window, a circle waiting for him to put his thumb on it. I don't know why, but it sounded like she was sold to the owner of this place. All of them. He quickly glanced at the rest of the waitress and the hostess and wondered if the chefs were NPCs too. He pushed his thumb against the virtual bill to pay it. A message popped up. No funds. Huh? Sorry to bother you, sir, but could you try again? He did, finding the same results. What is happening, Alan? Ashley asked, quietly. I. I don't understand, he muttered while opening his status tab. I should have the money to pay for everything we, he opened his eyes wide at the sight of his money balance. 30 gold. I only have 30 gold left. He glanced at the silent waitress, who was putting a finger on the side of her head where she had something her left metallic fox ear. She's contacting someone. Are you shitting me? A slender young man cried from the second floor. Where is he? The waitress remained silent, finger on her communicator, as the man jumped down easily despite his fragile physique. Wait. Alan pleaded at the waitress who walked away without gazing back. Is this some sort of prank, kid? The man rushed to pull Alan from the collar of his clothes, lifting him off the ground. Alan could see he had golden teeth. What? No. Wanting to gain subscribers by making stupid pranks at hard workers like me. Where is your stupid camera? N no, sir. I'm not trying to trick you or to be funny, I swear. I don't even know how to tell a good joke. Like, why did the engineer backstab his co-workers? Because he was Sue's. Shut the F. The man stopped mid-sentence after looking at the number above Alan's head. Wait a minute. Are you level 5? Why? Oh, crap Alan also glanced at the man's level. 33? What? Double crap. Your orders, Alan, Ashley said while putting a hand on the hilt of her dagger. The man quickly sneered. Don't try anything stupid. His right, another voice was heard from the table next to them where a warrior rested, casually sipping coffee and holding a spear over his right shoulder. He's not alone. Alan could not see that man's level. Which only means one thing. Ashley, put your weapons down. Please, just let me explain. Before entering your fine establishment, I had 100,000 gold on my account, I swear. A level 5 with that kind of money, yeah, right. It's true. Let us pay you in another way then. My partner has a set of silver armor that. I don't want your shitty gear, kid. I want my. I'll pay his bill, a woman said aloud, from the second floor. Alan glanced at her, wearing purple robes and smoking from a sleek cigarette holder on the condition that he tells me that story of his. Come, young man. The woman turned around and walked back to her table. 
The owner of the restaurant let Alan go, but blocked his path to the exit. You heard Lady Monique, he grunted. Hurry up and go upstairs, Alan. Ashley called while not taking her eyes off the armed user at her side. Let's do as she says for the moment, Alan said, walking up the stairs. On the second floor was a more modest number of tables, and at the farthest corner, Lady Monique was waiting. A slim young woman wearing glasses, a business suit, and a braid stood by her side. Tea thanks, Lady Monique, Alan said, too nervous to get close, but the woman gestured for them to sit down. Monique looked in her late twenties, with straight platinum hair and caramel skin. Don't mistake this as an act of charity, young man. That would ruin my reputation. She took a bite of her steak while scrutinizing their clothes. A level five alleging to have a considerable amount of money, and yet, wearing such ragged clothes. Alan could feel Ashley's cautious gaze. Yes, I know. I'll be discreet. I'm not lying, I had that goal before entering the town. Maybe I got pickpocketed on my way here. Who would waste their time searching the contents of a low leveler? Monique's bodyguard said, glaring at him. And why does a noob like you still exist, anyway? Don't be like that, Rosette, I believe in his words. You do? Alan said, astonished. Sure, why not? I've heard crazier things during my time here. Tell me something first, is 5 really your level, or is it a systems error? An error? Definitely. Are you in a guild, she asked, making him purse his lips. Oh, don't worry. I just need to know where to look for you to retrieve this debt of yours. Because I'm just lending you the money until you can pay me back. He nodded. S shooting stars. What? Rosette squinted. If this is a joke. It's not, he said, making his voice deeper. Rosette shrugged. I don't really care, but if one of the real shooting stars catches you saying that, I don't think you would have the chance to lie ever again. And what is that supposed to mean? Alan cried, rising from his place and making the table move. You make them sound like a bunch of criminals. If the shoe fits, sit. We aren't done talking yet, Monique said without raising her voice, but Alan could sense a threatening tone. And don't interrupt us again, Rosette. I'm the one talking here. The bodyguard clicked her teeth and folded her arms. Monique mildly grinned at him. Instead of arguing like children, there is a way of proving you're right. Mr. Allen. Warden. Yes, Mr. Allen. She sipped on wine. Add me to your friend list and send me a message stating that you owe me. How much was it? Rosette, go ask. Fine, she muttered, walking towards the table where the owner could be seen, still glaring at Alan. If she doesn't ask me anything else regarding my level, I suppose this is an excellent way to get out of this. He watched as the woman started typing something in her user interface until he got a friend request. New friend request. Add Monique Asensio to your contacts. Sure. Nope. Rosette strolled back towards their table. The bill is for 4,800 gold. Very well, Alan Warden. Write that you owe me 10,000 gold. Consider the extra amount as interest. Alan reluctantly wrote the amount on the private message. I promise to pay you as soon as I can. I'll be waiting, she said softly as she glanced at her right, receiving a notification. She tapped on it and read the message thoroughly. This will do. You can go now. Alan did not need to hear it twice. Thank you. I will be in contact. Good night. He quickly stood up and walked away, followed by Ashley, while ignoring a glare from Rosette. Good night to you too, Monique said quietly as the couple took the stairs down, followed by the restaurant's owner's gaze. Very interesting, Monique said to her bodyguard, who took a seat. Was that clown telling the truth? Monique stared at her system window, where Alan's chat remained open. Private messages, from, Alan Warden, Shooting Stars co-leader, I, Alan Warden, O Monique Asensio, 10,000 gold. Thanks for helping me, you wonderful, nice lady. Hugs and kisses. We could use this info, Monique said, puffing from her cigarette and releasing smoke in her window's direction. Announcement. Click here to buy it. 24. 6. E finally. Allies? Glad that's over. He sighed, dropping his shoulders. What is our next objective, Alan? He looked up at the crescent moon, and then he checked the time on his menu screen. 8.15 p.m. We still need a map and a way to get to Lundorus, but we'll deal with that tomorrow. 
We need a place to stay the night, and who knows if I'll be able to afford it. I only have 30 gold left. Do users need to sleep inside the Novus too? Ashley asked, without taking her eyes off her path. Yes, it's the same as eating. Humanity must never forget what makes us imperfect beings. Speaking of imperfections, Alan looked at the surrounding people. Women looked gorgeous, wearing makeup and revealing clothes that accentuated their curves, and men looked gallant, of perfect physique and handsome features. I feel like an ugly duckling walking among beautiful swans. So, if you could change your physical appearance any way you like it, would you do it? I suppose these people have already given me their answers. He glanced at a handsome couple, looking neither man nor woman, holding hands and asking each other what they should dine tonight. Even their voices could not give away a clear gender. These model-like people make me feel jealous. I'd like to walk alongside a cute girl too, you know. He glanced at Ashley, walking while shaking her hips. Yaras. Ashley, you're perfectly blending among the other users now. Thanks, Alan. I could replicate every one of the waitresses' mannerisms and their way of speaking. Yes, I noticed. I mean. Good job. Is it considered evil that I taught an advanced AI to catwalk? Of course not. Just look at her. It suits her perfectly. Alan, what is that? She pointed at a purple light soaring in the sky. The surrounding people looked up too. It's someone's flying mount, a man said aloud. It looks huge. Make space before it lands over here. Go! The residents of Eunice took caution and left a space at the center of downtown, where a tacky monument of the current mayor stood proudly. The ball of fire and violet stardust came to a halt in midair and started descending slowly. It was a huge winged, black, chubby cat. The flapping of its wings blew the hair of the people around it and made the windows of the nearby establishment shake. Its impatient riders jumped down, a serious, stoic bulky man, a grim, tired-looking young man, and a smirking girl. The three were wearing black armor and red cloaks and seemed to look for someone as their mythical beast finally landed, quietly snarling. A girl next to Alan recognized their emblem immediately. They're from Shooting Stars. You're right, the guy next to her said. But why would they be here? This is literally the last place they would come to. Alan's heart raced. Astrid must have sent them. She must have checked my location in her friend list. Hey, shooting stars. Here. Alan waved at them, but Ashley quickly pulled him from the arm. Alan, wait. Something is wrong. What do you mean? Signals. Messages. The system is throwing me all kinds of information that I barely understand. What is she talking about? The group's girl spoke first, grinning. Hi, I'm Marissa Laflom. Nice to meet you. Alan Warden, see? I knew it. So you know who I am? Sweet. Listen, I was wondering if you could give us a ride to where Astrid Bradford is. It's important that I speak to her. Oh, we know everything about you, Alan Warden. That's why we're here. Finally, some good luck. Come on, Ashley, let's go. Alan stepped forward, but his partner remained still on her spot. What is wrong with? Alan heard someone approaching him. He turned around and found the tallest of the three guild members staring at him. Come with us, Alan Warden, the man said, grabbing his arm. A cracking sound was heard. God damn it. Alan cried, falling to his knees, startling the guild member and the surrounding people. What did that man do? I think he broke his arm. The surrounding people stared at Alan, finally noticing what made him worth searching for. Is he level five? That's impossible. Yeah, even if he was living under a rock. Hey, maybe it's a contagious bug. Don't get near him. That would explain why Shooting Stars is looking for him. He will get straight to quarantine or something. Does that mean he's a bugged fugitive? The crowd stepped back, looking at him like the originator of a plague. What the hell are you doing, Oscar? The lanky Shooting Star shouted from his place. We're supposed to bring him alive. Who knows where he'll respawn if you kill him with your stupidly large hands. I it's not my fault that he's weak as shit. Oscar replied, lifting Alan off the ground and carrying him on his shoulder. What the hell is happening? This sudden reunion has something weird about it. It's more like a random enemy encounter. Alan spoke, feeling nauseous. Hey, shooting stars, why does this feel like a kidnapping? Because it is? Marissa said, chuckling. Alan? Ashley called, trying to reach out to him, but Marissa grabbed her by the shoulder. 
don't worry about him, he'll be fine. Matthew here is the best healer in the guild, so he'll patch whatever that brute Oscar accidentally does to your friend. Unfortunately, we only had one seat available. Without an opportunity to get away, Ashley got mortally stabbed in the back. Drops of blood stained the paved ground. The residents of Eunice Town only observed without a glimpse of pity on their faces. But for Alan, that was his first taste of death inside the system. Watching his only ally drowning in her own blood reminded him of the outside world, where real lifetime transcurred slower, but with no room for error. Where there was no respawn system. Where one mistake meant the end. The security videos that Isabella had shown to him flashed in his mind and almost made him puke. Damn it. Focus, Alan, she's not truly dead. She'll respawn in the Renovatio cave since we never got to a new checkpoint in this place. Ashley. Alan cried, unable to escape his captor's grasp. Listen, reunite with Smyo and stay there. He shouted at the girl whose HP bar was quickly depleting. And don't come searching for me, you hear me. I'll come back for you. The trip to Lundora's capital was not pleasant for Alan. To fight her boredom, Marissa made Alan hold her hand while she applied fire mana to it. Come on. Marissa giggled. If you don't release mana of your own, you won't be able to resist the heat. D damn it, Alan groaned, unable to avoid his HP from depleting steadily. Before reaching zero, Marissa let him go, leaving him exhausted. Look at him. She laughed out loud. He's weaker than Lundora Sur Rats. Could you knock it off? Matthew, the gloomer looking young man, said, exhaling. I'm tired of healing him. Oh, come on, little bear. You're barely using mana, she said, hugging him. Just one more time, please. Fine, Matthew said, sighing. And here we go. She grabbed Alan's hand again, who was trying to sneak away, hitting Oscar's enormous back. Look at his HP go. Whoops, I almost killed him this time. After hearing that, Oscar, who controlled the enormous flying cat, turned to her, eyes shining like matches. Go on, Marissa, screw up the mission, and you'll have to report to Lord Marco that we lost him because of your stupidity. Geez, fine, I'm sorry. I won't do it again. Heal him, Matthew, Oscar ordered, grunting. Why is this happening? Alan quietly asked the young priest, hoping to get some sympathy from him. Matthew gave him an apologetic look at first, before forming a nasty grin that Alan never thought of seeing on a boy his age. You ask why? Because you made Lord Marco have a bad day, Matthew whispered to his ear while holding his hand and breaking his pinky. And you shall never make Lord Marco angry. He looked down to see his work. Each of Alan's fingers was broken and in unnatural positions. Minor light conjure, quick fix. Matthew cast the healing spell again, still wearing a mischievous smile on his face. Alan heard Marissa chuckle before she hugged him around the neck. As for me, I don't care what that whining Marco says. I'm just here for the ride. She bit Alan's ear, sending him a pleasing sensation that he would have enjoyed any other day, but at that moment, he could only feel annoyed and gritted his teeth. His reaction made her giggle. Hey, since I may be the only one around that doesn't hold a grudge against you, let me give you a little forewarning of what's awaiting you. Since all of us gamers are practically immortal here, the only way of making someone pay is through torture, which is forbidden by the administrators, obviously. But as you will see, there is always a way. Greetings, oh great, William, the hall keeper. Good job keeping this building safe. Marissa shouted once arriving at the main hall, where a man in his thirties, bald, seven feet tall, was awaiting. Two soldiers by his side. I'm not in the mood right now, brat, he said, grunting. Is that the one, he asked after Oscar took Alan down. In front of them was the monument of a lion made of marble, snarling still at every visitor. That's right. This is our brave, all-powerful, guild founder in person. Marissa said while making a mocking bow, which made William grunt. You have done your part. Now go away. Fine, fine. I was getting hungry anyway. Let's go, darling, she said to Matthew, who followed her without looking back. Oscar grabbed Alan's arm and forcibly made him touch the emblem below the lion's monument. A blue light showed that something had been activated, and a system message popped up in Alan's line of vision. Asterisk new checkpoint. Lundorus capital. Shooting Stars Headquarters. 
Alan read it with an appalled expression on his face. Oh, no. Is it done? William asked gruffly at Oscar, who nodded and stepped back. Good. Hey, Alan Warden, do you know where we are? What's with this condescending tone of voice? Alan glared at the man. Lundorus Capital. Shooting Stars Headquarters. William chuckled. This is our PvP area, kid. Where we can have all the fun we want. Members only. He crouched to whisper in his ear. And you're one of us, right? Before Alan could frown at him, William quickly rose and stomped on his face. From Oscar's point of view, the smashed head of Alan got blurred and disappeared quickly in a display of lights and glimmer, the system's auto-censorship keeping any brains or blood from being realistically rendered. The job is done, I'm going, Oscar said, disgusted, as Alan's pixelated silhouette started reappearing in front of the statue. William clicked his teeth. Why are you leaving? I only told Marissa to go away because you know she's always being a nuisance. Don't you want to kill him at least a couple of times? Fine, more for us. Pussy. Alan got revived again in front of them and quickly jumped back, crashing against the monument. What the actual hell? Why are you doing this? I'm part of this guild founders, you know? Where's Astrid? William loudly exhaled. If you hadn't opened your mouth. I could have been lenient with you, he said, before sucker punching Alan, easily decapitating him. Eighty-three minutes had passed. Word of Alan's arrival traveled through the other members of the guild until a third of them reunited in the main hall, bringing alcohol and snacks, and forming a circle to act as a ring. Alan could be seen in the center, fists in a defensive stance, his face all bloody. He dashed forward against his opponent to attempt what they had forced him to do, get a clean hit on any of us, and you can go. The smirking shooting star in front of him twirled like a ballerina and made him trip. The crowd laughed and cheered as Alan stood up and turned around to try again. Huh? Where did he go? Hey, ghost, his opponent said at his back, before applying an arm lock on him. Do you need a hand? The collective laughter erupted after seeing Alan's detached limb on the ground. What the hell is happening here? He thought seconds after reviving, glaring at his next opponent who was asking the crowd to cheer for him. I refuse to believe that Astrid would approve of this. Although the damage to his body had been reset, his mind was starting to falter. Alan could be seen squinting and gasping for air, although he was breathing through newly rendered lungs. Hey, ghost, you don't look so well, his new opponent said, making a spear appear from his inventory. Here. I'll give you an advantage. Take it. Alan knew it was a bluff, but rushed to grab the weapon anyway until an invisible force prevented him from even touching it. Alan, you idiot. You do not have the required level to use this weapon. The group burst with laughter, and the guild member kicked Alan in the jaw, making him fall backward. Sorry, sorry. I couldn't resist, the man sneered. Here, I'll give you a chance this time. No joking. I'll just stay still, I promise. Alan snickered and spat blood over the guy's boots. The man remained silent, wincing, before furiously kicking Alan in the stomach, getting rid of some of the bloodstains. How weak, he muttered while returning to his spot in the crowd, crossing eyes with a girl, drinking from a bottle of wine. Amelia, why don't you try it? Is it a good way to relieve stress? She asked after gulping. A good way indeed. Fine. She finished her bottle and strolled to Alan, who was still respawning. He heard the sound of high heels stopping in front of him, but when he looked up, he could only see a blurred silhouette towering over him, and a small red glimmer coming from it as if it was the eye of a demon. Stand up, the young woman ordered, putting her hands on her hips, glaring. Although Alan looked like collapsing at any moment, he instinctively took a fighting stance before his sight finally focused on the glimmering red jewel encrusted in the choker necklace in front of him. His eyes then focused on the owner, a girl his age of curvy figure, wearing a long, black, thigh-high slit dress, with long fiery red hair that reached her thighs. I have a question for you, Alan Warden, she whispered. Where have you been all this time? I. I asked, she started saying, while her hand emanated a red aura. Where the hell have you been this whole time? Major firecrafting, dragon breath. Flames burst from her palm and scorched him in an instant, forcing a mage from the crowd to cast a force shield in a fraction of a second before the fire reached them. Damn it, Amelia, watch it. As soon as Alan started regenerating, Amelia decapitated him with her open palm. 
While we were working our asses off making this guild a top ranker, what were you doing, huh? She shouted, not waiting for his silhouette to take human form, stabbing him in what seemed to be the chest. And what do you do when you finally decide to show up? Steal from Lord Marco? Did you think you would get away with this? How many times has she killed him already? A guild member asked another, who shrugged. I've lost count. Eight, nine times? That's enough, Amelia, a thunderous voice made himself heard from the hall's entrance. The crowd made way and saluted him. Welcome back, Lord Marco. Amelia made a curtsy in front of him, grinning warmly. Her right hand was still stained with Alan's blood. Hi, Marco. The man grabbed her by the chin. Were you punishing him on my behalf? How cute. Amelia blushed brilliantly. I could do it all night if you ordered me to. No, sweetheart, it's my turn to speak to this, man. Alan's body was still covered in pixels when he had Marco in his field of vision. Is this the guy whose name I've been hearing this whole time? Marco appeared to be in his mid-twenties. A man of pale skin, black short hair, and golden eyes, wearing an elegant black business suit. Disgustingly handsome and irritatingly charismatic. I wonder how many times he has changed his features to look like that. We finally met, Alan Warden. My name is Marco Souza, the true co-leader of Shooting Stars. Following his words, the surrounding people cheered and got silent once he made a gesture with his hand. Or well, that's what I would like to say because, since this morning, someone has usurped my job. Alan could barely sneer. Are you saying I did it? That's what opportunists do when given the chance, the man spoke in a soft tone of voice. They usurp, lie, steal. Like what you did today. Not only did you snatch away my position in the guild, but you also stole my paycheck. 100,000 gold. Did you think you could get away with it? Did you think you could just walk through these halls and everyone would call you leader after all this time? That effortlessly, you take command when everyone else has paid in blood and sweat to rise through the ranks. Yeah, show him, Lord Marco. Make him pay. Pal. Alan said, returning to his boxing stance. I don't know what you're talking about. Marco stared at Alan thoughtfully before shortening the distance in a second, grabbing him by the neck and lifting him off the ground. A cracking sound was heard. Huh, I broke his neck. Marco patiently waited for the system to respawn Alan while speaking. I don't have proficiency in elemental magic, you see, I can only cast the most basic of spells, such as this. Minor fire crafting. He started casting, as flames emanated from his palm. Blaze. Alan's body got incinerated in a matter of seconds, barely leaving him time to scream. What was the most basic ice spell called? Marco asked his followers. That would be, chill, sir. Oh, right. Let me help you fight that heat, Alan. Minor ice crafting, chill. And now something that will shock you. Minor lightning crafting, zap. Alan's body fumed before collapsing and being reborn again, while everyone present stood silent. Not a single member was amused by the punishment anymore, but they did not take their eyes off as if it was their duty. That son of a... Amelia whispered after watching Alan stand up for the thirtieth time. Hey, Marco Souza. Alan cried, displaying anger for the first time since the challenge started. I didn't steal from you. This is a mistake. Marco chuckled while staring deep into his eyes. As I was saying, I'm not an elemental mage. I specialize in dark magic. I'm a warlock, you see. We like to mess with our opponent's minds and inflict them with pain that the best of armors can't stop. Allow me to show you, Marco started channeling mana. That looks like it'll take him a longest time. Alan pulled out the only weapon in his inventory, his rusty sword, and launched himself forward, but Marco got out of his sight. The next thing Alan saw was Marco's palm. Mare Dark Kunja. Stop. Slumber Mare. A scene unraveled in Alan's mind. A picture of something he did not want to think through. Please don't. The Santa Maria's white corridors, stained with blood. I don't want to see it. And small drone units mopping the floor, removing every trace of ruin. But the stench remained. I refuse to believe it. Automatons carrying bodies. Please, just stop. And throwing them into the dark coldness of space. Don't show me this. Did you think I hadn't thought about it? Of course I did, I'm not stupid. But I refuse to believe that things developed in that way. 
another vision of an automaton, engulfed in shadows, with red electronic eyes, entering the cryo chambers. No, 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 no. Standing in front of a sleeping pod, where a blonde teenager rested. Was that a Strid's pod? Marco, are you seeing this? The automaton stepped into the light, carrying a knife, revealing it wore Ashley's face. Because I hope you're enjoying the show, asshole. That's what I've been dealing with for the last eight real-life months. So while you enjoyed your stay here, acting like a goddamn mafia boss, I was out there, making sure your asses remained glued to your backs. You prick. 22. 7. If finally, a reunion? Marco. Are you okay? Amelia cried out to the unconscious warlock, who had suddenly collapsed. Marco sat down slowly, still shaken, looking at the smirking, sweaty guy kneeling in front of him. Alan sneered. If what that cute redhead said is true, and shooting stars are at the top of the world, I don't believe even for a second that it was you who made it possible. What? Marco grunted, standing up. Amelia watched as he clenched his fists. Marco, I bet it was all thanks to Astrid's effort, and you were only here for the ride. Alan continued. I bet that she whipped your lazy bums daily until shaping you all into elite warriors. Grunts of discontent and promises of making him suffer were heard, but Marco shut them all up after making a hand gesture, smirking. Do you know how we used to call you before meeting your stupid face? Alan, the ghost. We joked about you being invisible, or that you had died and your name was nothing but a glitch on the guild's member list. So how could you know how we rose to the top if you've never been here? To everyone gathered here. Alan shouted, still too weak to stand up. Your beloved lord has told you all that I stole his paycheck, right? Do any of you have a pickpocket ability? If so, use it and see how much you can get from me. Come on. Spoilers, I don't have it. Just think about it. How could I take money from him if I wasn't even here? You called it a paycheck, right? That means that there's someone in charge of the guild's vault. How could I, a pathetic level 5, steal it then, huh? Think for yourselves for at least one second, you morons. Alan observed the crowd, desperately searching for someone nodding or sharing whispers, someone who was finally reflecting on his words. But all the guild members had their lips sealed, and their gaze remained unapologetically cold. Even if that's true, Amelia spoke aloud, that wouldn't justify that you snatched away Lord Marco's position as co-leader. Yeah, even if you're the guild's founder, what makes you think you can come here and steal his rank after playing around somewhere else? We don't like deserters, and even less so those that weren't here during this guild's hard times. Try to defend yourself from that, ghost, Marco said, smirking. They know, Alan thought, glancing at Amelia's mocking grin. All these people should know Marco is wrong, they just don't care. Alan gritted his teeth, glaring at the initiator of it all. After what you saw inside my mind, do you still want to continue with this charade? What I saw doesn't concern me. Marco shrugged. As I see it, those images were nothing more than the fractured psyche of a shadow of a man. Wow, Alan said, raising his eyebrows. I can now see that Astrid didn't hire you for your wits. Marco chuckled, raising a hand and engulfing himself in a black aura. Major Dark. An explosion shook the building. Something crashed through the ceiling at high speed, cracking the tiled floor. In front of them stood a black lion, which folded its white wings to let its rider get down. Alan first heard heeled boots stroll towards them. The moonlight entered through the breach in the ceiling and shone on a blonde girl wearing a blue formal military uniform. Her blue eyes looked like two orbs of dry ice. Wait, is that? Aestrid, Alan muttered as soon as he met her gaze. Seeing her familiar face was more than comforting, wow, he chuckled, as he gradually lost his balance. You look damn good, he thought, before blacking out. It started as a group of shadows pursuing him, yelling unintelligible things at him. I can only hear their grunts, but I know they hate me. Alan saw himself running through brick corridors lit by torches. The place reeked of blood and oil. Its layout, strangely similar to the Santa Maria's engine area. When he came to a dead end, he turned around to face them, but no matter what he tried, the black silhouettes in front of him were indiscernible. Then, a giant hand rescued him from the hellish labyrinth and held him aloft. Alan could only distinguish a pair of enormous glacial blue eyes inspecting him as if he was an insect. Don't stare at me like that, you creep. He was put inside a glass bottle and got discarded, so that time itself would also forget all about him. 
sitting hopelessly while hugging his own legs for eternity fitted him. Written in cursive, a label on the bottle read, forgotten. It should say unloved instead, but that's okay too, he said to himself. A girly giggle answered back soon after. Unloved, huh? I could fix that, it was a voice from inside the bottle, but Alan looked at his surroundings, finding nothing. I'm here, silly, inside of you. He stared at the crystal wall behind him, and the reflection stared back, but it was not his. A girl with red skin and golden eyes was looking back at him. She giggled again, and reached out a hand, seemingly escaping from whatever mirror dimension she had been sealed in. What the hell, he cried, falling on his back, as she crawled towards him. Hell? That's what I call home, handsome. The girl grinned with black painted lips that contrasted with her white, gleaming pointy teeth. Once she sat on his crotch, her long, red hair moved on its own like a group of silky snakes, tying him up. Although captive, his fear quickly turned into arousal. She's clearly evil, but I wouldn't mind getting eaten by her. Even her demonic horns look pretty. That's the spirit, she said in a soft, enticing voice, while grinding her hips against his. At her every movement, her stacked bosom, barely covered by a black leather bikini, wiggled as a way to mesmerize him, in the same way a cobra does with its prey. Unlike her, I'll let you stare all you want. You'll just have to pay the price. She leaned forward, seemingly looking for a kiss, but with a loud hiss, bit his neck instead. Blood sprouted like a fountain, filling the bottle and blocking the view from any potential peeper. The phrase, this isn't such a bad way to die, echoed through his head until he opened his eyes. Alan found himself soaked in sweat, lying on a bed that smelled of lavender, in a room he did not recognize. Dreaming inside a lucid dream. It's so, freaking confusing. Does succubi exist in this digital world? The images from his dream were still clear in his mind, and the warm sensation of that devilish redhead biting his neck still haunted him. He touched the skin around that area trying to hold the feeling as much as possible, until something between his legs got his attention. The awakened little buddy beneath his underwear seemed to say, quite scary at first, but it ended up being a pretty neat dream, huh? Wanna play with me while it's still fresh in our memory? He cringed, forming fists. This isn't such a bad way to die? Are you kidding me? He tore from his hair, and started rolling on the bed, shouting, disgusting, disgusting. These kinds of fetishes are harmful for my pure, innocent mind. Did you hear me? Forget all about it or I'll never play with you ever again. Panting, he buried his flushed face against the pillow. This is what I get after months with no human contact. Especially female contact. Admiring Ashley's cuteness was fine at the beginning, but all these fully developed women's bodies are on a whole different level. His mind flashed with the few glimpses he caught of the redhead's black tight dress from last night. After being surrounded by rough, metallic surfaces, 60 feet meches, service robots, and digital panels for eight straight months, finally being able to watch healthy, and by healthy I mean big, breasts, feels like returning to being human again. He sighed while looking at the ceiling. Cleavages are the best. All worth it. After finally venting out, he inspected the room. Compared to the emptiness and lifelessness of the Santa Maria's room 13, this is actually cozy and relaxing. The light of the Nova Sun entered through the window and reflected on the wood pattern tiled floor. In front of him were plenty of furniture at his disposal and a large, oval mirror from which his reflection stared back. But this time, nothing will come out of it. Right? He stood up and looked through the window, finding tall buildings and busy streets to explore. This is a real city. Eunice Town could never compete with this. Glancing at the furniture again, he noticed a yellow piece of paper stuck to a drawer. It read, Open me. Inside, he found a pair of white sneakers, black baggy pants, a red sporty jacket, and another note, I hope you like them. The signature, a star. He was putting them on manually, until remembering that the quick equip button existed. Oh, right, I'm on a simulation now. With a single tap, he got fully dressed in a couple of seconds. He checked his reflection, nodding approvingly. It was the first time he inspected his appearance inside the Nova since he logged back. Even though I slept like a rock, these things haven't vanished yet, he thought, examining the black bags under his eyes. Doesn't matter. Disregarding that and the fact that I need a haircut, I'm looking good. Thanks, Astrid. I know you got this for me, he chuckled. He really looked good yesterday, didn't she? 
I know that even if I found the Novus engulfed in flames, you were going to be safe and sound, no matter what. But actually seeing you prideful and beautiful as always, melts my heart. While forming a smile on his lips, the memory of the alluring Demonis from his dream hijacked his mind. That face. I remember her now. Amelia. The gal that killed me repeatedly last night. Feeling guilty and angry with himself at the same time, he stared right into his own reflection's eyes and punched himself in the cheek. Deserved, he mumbled to himself as he exited the room. Outside, a girl quickly swiped her user interface out of sight and beamed at him. Good morning, Alan Warden. The guildmaster has instructed me to, uh, she squinted at him. What happened to your face? Hi. Please don't mind it. I was just wait, he suddenly blushed. If you've been here all this time, you didn't hear me yelling a moment ago, did you? The girl stared at him, confused for a second, before shaking her head vigorously. What? No. Of course not. These walls are quite thick. I didn't hear a thing. She heard it all. But that looks like a very nasty bruise, she continued, staring at his cheek. Let me heal you. No, thank you. That would defeat its purpose. All right then, the girl with black hair and twin tails said with a warm smile. My name is Tamara Morin. We couldn't introduce ourselves last night since we met in a very hectic, brief way. He frowned. Huh? We did? She blinked repeatedly before looking away. Oh, I see. Eh, sorry. Alan. Forget what I just said, please. What is she talking about? Alan thought while taking that opportunity to inspect her figure. Beneath the blue cape and white robe he could see a feminine petite figure. Almost the same frame as Isabella II. I mean, Ashley. Alan then stared at Tamara's young features, making her tilt her head. Would Ashley look as friendly as this girl if she acted like a regular human being? Is something on my face, too? She asked. What were you saying about the guild master? Right. Listen, Astrid instructed me to give you this message. Tamara opened her user interface and made a video window appear in front of Alan. A recorded Astrid could be seen walking nonstop through a corridor, giving her back to the camera. Tammy, I have to go. Tell Alan I won't be able to show him around, but that we can have dinner tonight. In the meantime, I'll let you be in charge of protecting him today. Understood? I don't want a repeat of what happened last night, or ever. Yes, Guildmaster. Great. Thanks, Tammy. I owe you, before crossing a door, Astrid glanced back, gasping. Tam, are you recording me again? Do not show this to. I love it when she calls me Tam, Tamara whispered. A blushed, dreamy expression on her face. She looked quite busy, Alan whispered, grabbing the cloth around his chest. It's okay. I'm finally here. We'll have plenty of time to hang out later on. He then turned his gaze towards the smiling girl. And I also need to reunite with Ashley. Tamara, is it possible to send a message to someone I've been traveling with lately? Does my user interface keep a record of everyone I meet? Tamara tilted her head slightly. No, I don't think so. That sounds more like what an administrator would keep track of. Do you know the name of this person? Only her first name, sadly. And with that alone, I can't add her to my friends list. Bummer, she said, pouting her lips. Even if I could communicate with someone from Eunice Town like Monique Asensio to keep an eye on Ashley, I'm pretty sure that she would charge me and increase my debt. Besides, I told Ashley to wait for me at the Renoviato Caves. She doesn't have a reason to leave without me. At least I hope so. Okay, another question. Is there a way to get in contact with an administrator? Unfortunately, they only talk in person with their moderators, and they're a different kind of worms, believe me. The only reason we know the mods exist is because they occasionally make live announcements about some important update or big event. But, Alan, even if you get in contact with one, I doubt they'll help you find your friend. Alan scrutinized her youthful face. She seemed like the very first honest person he had crossed paths with since he logged back. Astrid trusts her. That's all I need to know. Thanks for all this info, Tamara. Was I really that helpful? I just said what I know. No, really, you truly cleared my doubts. Glad to help. So, by Astrid's orders, you're stuck with me today. That's right. Do you like pancakes? Follow me. Tamara beamed and led the way, leaving behind a trail of flowers sent. You can order breakfast from your room and an NPC will bring it to you, but it's more fun to eat at the cafeteria.
As they walked through a corridor long enough to hold close to a hundred windows, Alan could see a pool outside, where some guilders were having a private competition. Beyond it were the training grounds, where Alan witnessed someone magically bring a 32 feet tall bipedal dinosaur that bowed to its master. Alan stood in awe, wondering if he could also use the facilities and maybe finally learn how to use his stupid sword. His gaze then landed on a crumbling building in the distance as if it was calling him. It no longer had a rooftop, and through a crack in the wall, he could distinguish the familiar monument of a lion. This way, Alan, Tamara called, urging him to catch up with her. Yes, he replied, glancing at the building one last time. Sorry, you were saying? Do you like what you see? Our headquarters has all an adventurer could wish for. We have plenty of training areas for whatever field you'd wish to master, and look over there. That's one of the damage calculator rooms. Say good morning to Karen and Phaser. Alan looked in the pointed direction where two girls were about to enter. The tall, black-haired one noticed the two approaching and grimaced after crossing eyes with Alan. The short one, with a drowsy expression on her face, as if she had just awakened, faintly waved back at Tamara before closing the door. Where was I? Tamara continued. Yes. Tell me, Alan, is there any class you'd wish to learn or perfect? You want the truth? Sure. Shoot. At the beginning, I wanted to be a swordmaster, and Astrid always cheered me on about it, but I quickly discovered that I sucked at it. Maybe I could take a glance at the other classes available and find something that really fits me. What am I doing? He shut his eyes, blushing. I definitely said too much. Tamara looked away, pretending not to notice. We can visit the library after breakfast, then. Hey, let's take a brief detour to show you my favorite place in all the HQ. Come, this girl is too damn polite, Alan thought, following her lead towards a short corridor. This is the trophy room, she continued as she entered a large room decorated with framed videos. Every shooting star can immortalize their most finest hour by by hanging a. She pursed her lips after recognizing who was there. Marco Souza, the man that had rallied a third of the guild against Alan, was standing in front of the monument of a winged lion. By his side, a muscular guy and a childish-looking teenager. The big one is William, the first guy that killed me. And the young one is Matt, the one that broke my fingers while on our way to this city. Alan noticed that Matt was manipulating a system menu coming out of the monument. It seemed to be the room's control panel, for a framed video disappeared out of the corner of Alan's eye, and then another on the front wall. Are they rearranging them? Alan met eyes with Marco, who smiled gently at him, contrasting William's glare. Why are you smiling at me, you? Hey, anyway, the cafeteria is right this way, Alan, Tamara said anxiously as she pulled him from the hand. The feeling of her soft hand immediately triggered something in Alan's brain, for a scene flashed in front of his eyes. He saw Tamara's distressed face, she seemed to be looking at someone else, as a blinding light came out of her hand. The last thing he remembered was a warm feeling embracing him, and something resembling a bubble protecting him from a sea of fire. What the hell was that? It looked nothing like a dream. That really happened. But when? He looked down until watching his own steps. As a matter of fact, I don't remember anything from yesterday after Astrid arrived. Do you miss Isabella or Ashley? Yes, I need my AI waifu. Meh. Astrid is the only owner of my heart. Total voters, 85. Cast vote view results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. Do you miss Isabella or Ashley? 21. 8. E finally, a place to call home? Alan noticed how hungry he was after the smell of melted butter and coffee reached him. At the cafeteria, close to 20 people chatted while enjoying scrambled eggs, bacon, orange juice, and tea. This reminds me of the lively recreational rooms from the Alvirium Enterprise HQ. The teens that would later become the Santa Maria's passengers spent some time there, getting to know each other before leaving Earth. So nostalgic. I met Astrid there, and it was the best week I, his smile faded as half of the present stared at him. The rest also noticed him once Tamara grabbed his hand to lead him to the food bar. Come, Alan, she said, oblivious to the fact that the whole place had gone silent. Before looking away, Alan did not recognize any of their faces from the previous night. Which means that word of my return has already spread to the rest of the guild. He looked down at Tamara's small hand, grabbing him. And who knows if people here support that Marco guy too. 
the expression Marco dedicated to him in the trophy room made him sick. How can you smile like that after what you did to me? With the help of Tamara, Alan filled a tray with pancakes, coffee and eggs, and returned to the tables, where people were now whispering at each other while sending him furtive looks. Hey, level 5, a known girl waved her hand at him. Come and sit with us, Ashley's killer. Besides her, a long-haired redhead hissed at her, what the hell are you doing? And the devil from my dream. Alan exhaled deeply and walked towards them, ignoring Tamara's suggestion that they should sit somewhere else. Hi, kidnapper girl, he said, approaching them. Don't call me that. You wanted to come here voluntarily, remember? I just helped. And use my name, Five. I've already introduced myself yesterday. She waited, but seeing Alan's blank face made her groan. I'm Marissa Laflamme. M-A-R-I-S-S-A. All right, Marissa. My name is not Five. I'm Alan, he said as he took a seat, to the dismay of Tamara, who reluctantly joined them. Morning, Tammy. Marissa smirked. Morning, Marissa. Amelia. Amelia did not answer, pretending to be busy on her user interface. Good. The more the merrier. Marissa clapped. Five, I suppose you already know my sister. Who? Alan frowned, looking in Amelia's direction. Wait. Are you guys sisters? That's right, Marissa replied, while stuffing her mouth with food. The deadly flowers of Carcella. Alan kept staring at Amelia, who was changing the color of her lipstick by tapping her user interface. Her lips changed from pink to blue to black. Marissa swallowed her food before giggling. Do you like what you see? Hearing that made Alan blink repeatedly and shake his head. I I wasn't. Tam is showing you the facilities, isn't she? Do you like what you've seen so far? All right. Very impressive place. I can't imagine how much you've all ins. After deciding to wear a dark crimson shade of lipstick, Amelia snapped her fingers, making her breakfast catch fire and burn into a crisp. I've lost my appetite. She then stood up and passed by Alan without glancing at him. Seeing that fruit salad combust reminded him of how painful dying by her pyromancy was. What was I thinking? Just because I had a wet dream about her doesn't change the fact that she opposes me being here. He closed his fist under the table. What am I even doing here? Tamara. Punch me, he blurted out. W what? Why woo, I mean, N-O. Can I do it? Marissa raised her hand like a child. No, Marissa, you'll kill him. It'll be a small hit using my index finger, I promise. Do it, Alan said. Before I change my mind. Both of them nodded at each other and leaned forward. You know. Marissa whispered, while holding her finger in front of his forehead. I kind of get the idea why you're punishing yourself. After Alan dedicated her a puzzled look, he noticed Marissa's finger glowing with a red aura. Crap. I'm regretting Alray, O-U-C-H. Holy shit. The hit took away 20% of his health. That looks like fun, a high-pitched male voice said, giggling, as he approached their table. While still holding his forehead, Alan recognized the tall pale guy wearing a monocle and a business suit. He's one of Marco's followers. This guy did not punch me, but enjoyed slapping me instead. He killed me twice while keeping a nasty grin on his face. Do you need something, Jason? Tamara asked aloud, and Alan noticed her tone of voice changing from joyous to severe. I'm just here to have a quick word with our guild founder. It won't take much of your precious breakfast time, I promise. Jason then put his left hand against his chest and turned to Alan. Mr. Warden, I'm Jason Foreman, Shooting Star's Treasury Secretary, and your humble servant. El listen, I'll go straight to the point. I was the one that screwed up yesterday. Remember the whole fiasco about the money our first guild officer, Marco Souza, alleged you stole? Jason then grimaced, showing something resembling diamonds encrusted in his teeth. Why yeah. Sorry, founder. That was on me. Alan's first reaction was to glance at his other two acquaintances. Marissa seemed to be enjoying the show, Kami sipping coffee, and Tamara looked tense and her facial features looked rigid. What do you mean? Alan asked cautiously, as Jason smiled apologetically. It's pretty simple. It was my fault. Accidentally, of course. Yesterday, I didn't know that we had a new first officer in town. And in my stupidity, Jason hit his forehead with his palm. 
I just filtered the guild members list by rank and sent the gold to you without giving it a second thought. When I realized my mistake, I sent a claim to withdraw the gold from your account to resolve the issue. He chuckled, putting both hands on his hips. What a mess, huh? Is there something else you need to add? Tamara asked dryly, prompting Jason to correct his posture. Right. He cleared his throat. I owe you an apology, founder. I promise to you, no, I swear that as long as I work here, you'll never see a mistake like that ever again. Alan took a peep at the other tables. Was everyone in that place watching? What am I supposed to do? Smile and say, try to be more careful next time, silly. Fuck off, you, monocle weirdo. Wait. Something doesn't add up about his story. It's okay, pal. Alan forced himself to smile. Try to be more careful next time. All right? Alan noticed a grimace briefly forming on Jason's lips that quickly faded. But of course, founder, it won't happen again. Now, if you excuse me. Ah, by the way, try the chocolate muffins. They're to die for. That apology didn't feel sincere at all, Alan commented as he watched the guy walk away. Marco Souza was angry at me for supposedly stealing his gold, right? That's what he said, Marissa responded, sighing. That's how he convinced the righteous Oscar to find you and bring you here. Matt only went to ensure Oscar didn't screw up, and I went because I wanted to be close to my little teddy bear. But by the time you showed up, the money had already disappeared. Marissa snickered, shrugging. We didn't know that. But you're right. It's pretty suspicious, huh? Astrid thinks the same, that's why she sent Jason flying. Marissa, Tamara called in a stern voice. Our breakfast has been spoiled already. Could you please talk about something a little nicer? Whatever. Is there something you'd like to know, Five? Could you? Alan began, feeling that his face started to blush. Talk to me about Astrid? Thanks for ruining my breakfast, you freak, Amelia Laflamme mumbled while forming fists that fumed and constantly sparkled. Even her steps left burned footprints on her way to the damage calculator room number three. Since the room was soundproof, the tranquility of the hall was broken once she opened the door, letting out the cry of someone inside. Do you have any idea how much gold I lost last night? 415,000 gold, Amelia replied aloud, shutting the door behind her. You've said it a million times. Karen Svensson, the enraged black-haired young woman, groaned as a response. She then cast balls of fire, blades of ice, and gusts of wind at rapid speed, striking a target 100 feet away from her. Her spells had no finesse and instead looked like out-of-control machine guns. I am so sick of her. The white specialized walls were programmed to withstand the attack, but outside of the damage calculator room, such magical firepower would have demolished half of the headquarters. When the elemental witch ran out of mana and the smoke dissipated, a system window appeared above a dancing unscathed mannequin. Amazing. Damage rank, silver A. Yeah, that'll show Astrid, Amelia sneered, sitting on a black leather cushion in the spectator area. So, what are you going to do about it? You're badmouthing our great and valorous guild master. She might be stupid and childish, but let's not forget that she could do that same amount of damage with just one punch. Karen, wearing black sporty clothes, stomped out of the testing area to yell at her. Are you being sympathetic to that bitch, Red? Amelia's amber eyes shone with a fiery intensity. Don't even joke about it, Karen. A sonorous slurping sound made them turn to Phaser, the dark-skinned girl wearing a panda-themed hoodie, who was vigorously munching ramen next to them. She glanced back at both, blinking. Sorry, did I interrupt your bickering? She shrugged while mixing her food with her chopsticks. But Amelia is right. As long as Astrid is our leader, we can't do shit about it, she then started mumbling, we shouldn't have been there in the first place. I told you that yesterday. I lost money too, you know? Karen narrowed her eyes at her, grimacing. Hey, give me a bite of that. No way. Phaser hugged her bowl protectively. You were the one that said, it's too early to eat ramen. Come on. Just a little, Karen got close enough to snatch the bowl, but was pushed by an elephant-headed spirit that manifested out of Phaser's body. Do you see that? Phaser pointed at a system window hovering above a coffee table. That's the menu. Order yours and leave me alone. Fine. Karen stretched out her arms to her sides. Someone doesn't know what sharing means, huh? 
Red, since our Lord Marco is taking his sweet time, I'm going to order some ramen. Have you eaten breakfast yet? I was going to, but Amelia sighed. Just order black coffee for me, please. Damn, ghost. Who the hell does he think he is? Amelia thought, biting her lower lip. Just because Astrid supposedly cleared his name, he thinks he can sit with us so casually? Seriously, Marissa, that was low, even for a prankster like you. Amelia stared at the end of the room, where the dancing mannequin taunted her, ready to test her power. She wondered what rank she would get for stabbing or beheading it with her bare hand, as she did with Alan the night before. Are you guys sisters, he had asked, while maintaining a dumb smile in his face. Makes me sick. That was fast. Karen beamed at the sight of the male NPC entering to deliver the food. Amelia did not glance at him. She was too busy observing her own hands. The feeling of taking Alan's many virtual lives was still palpable. She checked her nail polish and decided that the black color did not fit her anymore and changed them to red with the help of her user interface. Red, like his blood. Here is your coffee, miss, the NPC spoke, but Amelia did not reply. Just leave it there, sweetheart, Karen said from her seat. Someone is a little cranky today. Amelia snickered. Says the one that was popping a vein just minutes ago. What's taking you so long? She thought, watching the NPC taking Phaser's empty noodle cup and taking his sweet time to leave the room. She then tapped the mug to display a temperature slider, lowered it, and gulped it down immediately. Guys, don't you think that Ghost's coma story is bullshit? She began. It's too convenient, Phaser pointed out, quietly. Exactly. So what do you think it's the real story? Phaser shrugged, hiding her gaze under her hoodie as if she was ready to take a nap. Maybe he was working outside with the rest of the ship's staff. Amelia stared at her. What makes you think that? Aren't we just guessing? Yeah, and you suck at it. Karen interjected, pointing at Phaser's face with the chopsticks. If one of the ship's engines exploded or something serious like that, why would they choose him to help them out? He's a teen, just like us. If he was some sort of hotshot engineer or something, he would have bloated about it last night. I didn't say that they woke him up to do some important stuff. Phaser suddenly shouted. Maybe they just needed a janitor or someone to rub the captain's shoulders. Karen vigorously shook her head. Why are we talking as if working outside was the only valid theory? What do you suggest, then? Don't ask me. I don't even know why we're talking about that piece of crap. Astrid literally pissed off a third of the guild because of him, Amelia reminded Karen in a soft voice. Don't you want to know why would she risk everything she has built for a guy like him? Maybe they used to be fuck friends. There. That's my theory. She defended him because he was her little pumpkin. Astrid with a guy like that? Phaser loudly sneered. Please. And you said that I sucked at guessing. Whatever, who cares? I don't care. You. Karen shouted, furiously mixing her noodles, until noticing Amelia's lost-in-thought expression. Too bad you couldn't make him talk yesterday, even though you literally tortured him. Karen giggled, pointing at Amelia's bosom with her gaze. Maybe he was into it, just to see those balloons of yours wiggle over and over again. H-U-H-U. The guy kinda strikes me as a masochist after all, Phaser added, embracing herself and shivering. Risk everything she has built for a guy like him, eh? Karen quoted after slurping noodles, smirking. One can only hope, the room's door opened, prompting Karen to quickly wipe her mouth with her sleeve. There it is. Welcome in. Marco Souza entered at a calmed pace, accompanied by his confidants. William the Stoic looked like a bodyguard, Matthew Bernstein crossed eyes with Amelia before nervously looking away and Jason Foreman quietly giggled as if he had heard a joke inside his head. Sorry for keeping you waiting, ladies, Marco said, slightly bowing, putting his right hand against his chest. But as you know, organizing all this resulted in quite a challenge. But you're bringing us good news, right? Karen beamed at him. Are we finally free of that harpy's claws? Marco smiled warmly at her for a brief moment, holding the information for a little longer. Kathleen Mayer is awaiting us at the drinking banshee, yes, at last. Karen cried, ecstatic, dashing towards him to hug him. I knew you could do it. I've instructed the rest to go there as soon as they can, Marco continued. As for you, my most trusted companions, she has sent for us a special transport. 
it'll arrive shortly. That's our boss. Seeing Karen keep embracing Marco made Amelia frown. It's so reassuring seeing you here, beautiful, William, the seven-foot-tall hulking man said, sitting beside her. You made the right choice, as if I had plenty. She sighed. I couldn't bear sharing the same roof as that bitch another day, so, Jason, what are you doing here? Phaser asked, looking at him through her hoodie's panda eyes that also acted as goggles. Aren't you supposed to respawn in like half a day? Jason giggled while rubbing his hands constantly. It takes more than a punch of the golden bitch to take down this chad, or you got lucky thanks to your flip coin passive skill, Matthew whispered, which only emphasizes how awesome I am. Jason cried, before invading Marco's personal space. Even Karen stepped back too. By the way, boss, at what time is Kathleen picking us up? Marco winced as if Jason's breath had hit his nostrils. Any moment now, he replied patiently. Why? Afraid that a strid will crash through the ceiling again? I could ask the same to you, Amelia thought, sneering, which did not go unnoticed by Marco. I seriously think we should go right now, Jason said, making Marco twitch one eye. Listen. I can't cancel Kathleen's ride. Why don't you relax a little and, Marco went silent after Jason whispered something in his ear. Even Karen slightly frowned. You didn't. You aren't mad at me, are you? Jason asked, hunching like a grounded kid, but Marco just chuckled. Not my way of doing things, but I can't blame you for being so, daring. William, could you escort this fool to the drinking banshee? Don't make any stop and don't take your eyes off him until you arrive there. Sure thing, boss, William said, and leaned towards Amelia before standing up, let's have a drink later, yes, he whispered to her. Can't wait, she replied, without gazing at him. I I'll go with you, guys, Matthew rushingly said after cautiously glancing at Amelia for the third time. She groaned. Stop looking at me as if I'm going to scorch you, kid. It always happens when you and Marissa have a fight. Did you have a fight? You, little. Will you wait for Kathleen's transport, boss? William asked as Jason and Matt crossed the exit. Yes. Marco smirked. The rest of the guild needs to see Emmy leaving. That'll make the cogs in their heads work. As the door closed, Amelia examined Marco's expression. There was a gleam in his gaze that Amelia had only seen a couple of times. Although he looks like in control of the situation, why do I perceive something else? Marco crossed eyes with her, making her flinch. There's still a spot available for your sister, he said. I hope she can join us. Thank you, Lord Marco, I appreciate it. Did you really convince that Snow Diamond to receive us? Karen took the word, embracing him again. Only you could pull it off. This is like a dream come true. It was something that took months in the making, Marco said, chuckling. Thanks for your confidence in me, Karen. Noticing Amelia's lost in thought expression, Faiza got closer to whisper in her ear, for how long is she going to continue hugging him? Is that what you're thinking? You don't know me that well, Faiza, Amelia replied, rising from her seat to stroll towards the test area where the dancing mannequin reset the score and waited. She stepped on the designated spot, then focused on the dummy. Firecrafting, Amelia intoned, getting surrounded by a fire whirl, hoping that the roaring of the flames could drown Karen's annoying voice. The spell intensified, giving birth to a flaming serpent, which gradually turned into a ten-feet-long dragon. Amelia reached out her hand aloft, commanding the monster to rise while channeling a fire breath. Her mind superimposed Alan's stupid face on the dummy doll. Your entire existence doesn't matter to me. I couldn't care less if you were really in a coma, or working outside. The only good thing you've done for us is give us the little push we needed. She giggled and commanded the dragon to launch an incandescent fire beam. The explosion startled Karen and made Marco purse his lips. Amelia then sent the monster forward while transforming its entire body into a long metallic projectile. With the banging metallic sound of what now was a giant lance, the impact created a shockwave that blew the caster's hair away, along with the coffee mug and Karen's bowl of ramen off the coffee table. I'll go get my stuff, Amelia said, passing by her companions. Bitch, Karen whispered, watching the test's results. Outstanding. Damage rank, gold E. Seven. Nine is separated paths. After recognizing Alan, a couple of guilders decided to leave. This place is haunted by a ghost now, one of them said loud enough for him to listen. 
It's called a library, but there are no books here, Alan thought, glancing back at the people leaving, and at the white room with small individual cubicles. So, there's an engineer class, A, eh? Alan muttered, while consulting a system screen. What do they do? Is that the class you're interested in? Tamara got close to him and read over his shoulder. Look, it's divided into three subclasses. One that specializes in empowering themselves by crafting their own custom weapons, one that acts as a support, creating healing and boost devices for their team, and the one that allows the user to build their own robotic minions to fight for them. All of them sound quite interesting, Alan said, tapping the screen until Marissa's loud groaning made him cringe. Are you seriously going to waste all day reading that? Marissa said from her spot, lying upside down on an armchair. This is your first day in Londoris. You should do fun stuff instead. Practically, this is my second day here. True, Marissa smirked, but you're now free to take a tour. What do you say? Tamara shook her head. Um, Marissa, you know what? I'd love to take a walk around the city, Alan said, looking expectantly at Tamara. Londoris is a safe zone, Tammy, Marissa insisted. The young mage pursed her lips, as if she was mentally fighting with herself. F fine. But we have to be here before Astrid returns, okay? Remember that you'll have dinner with her tonight. Yay! Marissa beamed, jumping out of her seat. Where should we go first? Before we go, can I copy this engineer info to my user interface? Alan asked. You could borrow a book instead. Tamara smiled at him. There's the print option on the top right corner of the screen. Tap it. Alan did, and from a crack on the desk, a blue, leather book was delivered. Cool. Alan tapped the item and saved it inside his inventory. Let's go, then. Marissa sang, marching to the exit, but Tamara pulled her from one arm. You're just tagging along because Astrid told you to stay, am I right? Tamara whispered in her ear. I'm bored and grounded, yes, but I'd rather believe that she indirectly told me to keep an eye on his guest wherever he goes. Marissa responded, chuckling. Tamara puffed out her cheeks and let her go. Reaching the front gate took them a couple of minutes, and ignoring the other guild members' gazes was easier with Marissa by his side. The lanky young woman marched as if she was the real guild master, confident and prideful. Even Tamara looks insignificant beside her. Alan glanced at the petite witch, who walked cautiously as if danger hid at any corner. When the front double doors opened, Alan was face to face with a lively city. He walked through the front yard blindly, admiring the motorized vehicles passing at great speed, looking at the street vendors, watching the people riding winged beasts. The Victorian buildings looked sturdy and elegant, and all the passers-by were good-looking, wearing shiny and colorful clothes. This resembles a city from Earth, but at the same time, is like something out of a fantasy. Just watch your step, five, Marissa said, pulling him from the collar of his jacket, as a black. Slick car halted in front of the HQ. This thing almost runs over me. T thank you, Marissa. She did not respond, as something at their backs got her attention. Alan and Gilders looking through the windows, followed with their gaze the group of four exiting the building. Marco Souza was leading the group, hands inside his black dragon leather coat, holding the most arrogant smirk in all the Novus. Two stunning, beautiful women walked by his side, looking more like supermodels than powerful witches. Sporting a navy blue, cocktail dress, Karen Svensson dedicated a last condescending look at the surrounding people. Wearing a front zipper, strapless black leather mini dress, Amelia Laflamme tossed her hair behind her shoulder, ignoring everything and everyone. Lastly, Faiza Khalil followed them at the back, hiding her face inside her panda hoodie. Inadvertently, Amelia noticed the three standing on the sidewalk, before getting into the car. I've been looking for you all over the place. Why weren't you answering my messages? Amelia asked Marissa, as her companions entered the vehicle. She then stretched out a hand to her. Doesn't matter. Come. It's time to go. Marissa got closer to the astounded Tamara instead, and grabbed her hand tightly. Marissa, what are you doing? It's now or never. Amelia insisted, tensing her jaw, but her sister would not move an inch. The redhead's voice broke, W.Y. She made her choice, Amelia, Marco said aloud from his seat's window. Let's go. Amelia's expression suddenly turned severe. Fine. Suit yourself, then. 
She then glared in Alan's direction. What the hell was that? Alan thought while watching the car take off. 9.2. As you can see, Lundorus has been modeled after one of the greatest cities of the old world, Tamara was saying proudly as they crossed a bridge, but Alan was too busy thinking about what had happened to reply. He did not even notice the hundreds of gazes staring at the one-digit number above his head. More than one tried to approach him and ask him about it, but Marissa would scare them away just by glaring. Can we go to Jack Robbins, she suddenly said in a tiny voice. I have a craving for a milkshake. It's the first thing she'd said since we left the guild's HQ. She's asking as if she was a child. Alan caught Tamara's gaze and nodded. Sounds great. Minutes later, Alan thought they were entering a kid's store. What am I thinking? There are no kids in this spaceship. We were the last kids on Earth. The pastel colors invaded every wall of the establishment, as well as the NPC's uniform and the ice cream cups. He squinted as if his eyes hurt. Pink. Everywhere you see. Here you go, Alan, Tamara said, bringing him a chocolate ice cream cone, which he inspected before tasting it. I've changed my mind. I love this place. Turning around, he watched Marissa already eating her dessert absently. Do you want to talk about it? He whispered at her but the strawberry blonde responded by hitting him in the forehead with her index finger again. Ark. W what was that for? Shut up. It kinda is your fault, you know, my fault? What are you talking about? Hello, my dear space conquerors. Are you feeling cosmic today? Let me hear you, people of Iagorn. What's that? Alan looked at his surroundings until finding a video screen at the back of the establishment. A pink-haired girl wearing a gleaming purple dress was addressing the camera. Her smile was wide and cute, her mannerisms were mesmerizing, and her body captivating. If space was a kingdom, she would be its queen. Hey, I know her. I watched one of her music videos yesterday. And I think she's also a commentator? I'm not sure. What's her name? Miss Cosmica. Tamara replied from her place near the cash register. She's awesome. The idol danced and sang accompanied by another young woman, wearing a matching dress. A banner on the bottom of the screen read, Live from Iagorn, Burning Love Summer Tour. And the gal dancing with her is Constaline, Tamara continued, taking a seat. By Alan's side, Marissa slurped her milkshake in a louder way, finished her drink, and started tapping on her user interface. Neat names, Alan commented, before looking at the 5-liter ice cream cup Tamara had brought. Are you really going to eat all that? Of course. Why? Seconds later, Alan got a system notification. Marissa Laflom has sent you a friend request. Huh? Alan turned to Marissa, but she kept tapping her window. Once he accepted, a different request popped up in his field of vision. Marissa Laflom wants to start a party chat. Why are you not? Marissa pinched his leg under the table, making him flinch. Baffled, he glanced at Tamara but the ice cream cup blocked her from view. He reluctantly accepted. Don't say a thing out loud, Marissa's voice was heard inside Alan's head. If you filter your thoughts, we can privately talk using this. How, he said using his normal voice, shut himself, and cleared his throat. He imagined himself talking inside his head. Like this? Yeah, that's it. Whoa. This is like telepathy. Awesome. I call it handy. Alan looked in Tamara's direction once again. Why do people not talk like this all the time, then? It's considered rude. Figures. But we're being rude to Tamara, then. Did you enjoy your ice cream? Tamara suddenly asked. Chocolate is a no-brainer. Yes. He shook his head. I mean, yes. I'm glad that we came. You were asking if I wanted to talk about it, so here we go, Marissa continued. I just don't want Tamara listening. I mean, she's a cool gal, and I trust her but, okay, I'm all ears, all brains, get it, shut up, Marissa took a deep breath, if you ever wanted to take revenge on Marco and the rest of last night's welcoming party, you're out of luck, she crossed eyes with him, Marco and his most loyal followers quitted the guild today, what, what's wrong, Alan, Marissa asked before Tamara could, I saw someone identical to Miss Cosmica outside, She's performing live on Iagorn, Alan, Tamara said. But I wouldn't be surprised. Since her debut, her look has become popular among the novice youth. No one rocked the pink hairstyle as well as she does now. I see. It was a lookalike then, he chuckled, 
before returning to the party chat. Marissa, there's something I need to know and Tamara seems reluctant to speak about it. What happened last night after Astrid showed up? Tamara would say that ignorance is a blessing. You were the one who started this private conversation and told me this was all my fault. I said that, didn't I? Well, let's say that the reason all of these assholes quitted was because they didn't like being punished by Astrid yesterday. And by punished, I mean obliterated. It was glorious. It's pretty well known that Astrid is super ruthless, but last night she took it to the next level. I thought you weren't there last night. I wasn't, but Helen told me every single detail. She's the one that informed Astrid about Marco's private party and saved your level 5 ass. She giggled. She even captured video of last night's highlights. For instance, here's Astrid after finding out what Jason did. Alan received a file through their private chat. By opening it, a video window popped up inside his line of vision, showing a blonde punching a lanky guy and sending him crashing against the nearest wall. The video's sound implied that the victim continued traveling outside of the HQ's grounds. Was that Jason? The monocle guy from earlier? Yep. You know, now that I think about it, it surprises me that he survived that. Whatever. This is what happened next, you're gonna love it. In the second video, a spectacle of blue and red lights, at first mesmerizing, turned into a hell show. It was impossible for the camera to keep track of all the chaos, but Alan discerned what seemed to be silhouettes attacking each other. Although, nah, it can't be. For a moment I believed watching that all of them were attacking the same person. The camera turned to its side, where Tamara could be seen reaching out her hand to the air. Please, tell me your shield will last, a voice said, out of view. We're safe. Tamara replied in a distressed voice. It has to endure. He has suffered enough. The camera then looked down, focusing on a dormant Alan, resting in Tamara's lap. Is this what I suddenly remembered hours ago? It must be. So Tamara and this other girl, Helen, I suppose, were protecting me while... That happened. He continued watching the recorded battle unfolding a few feet away from them and swallowed. Tamara, configure the arena's settings, a street could be heard shouting. Leave a quick spawning as it is, but turn death gold penalty to ON. A little context here, please? It speaks for itself, but fine, I guess, Marissa said, finishing her milkshake. Oh, before that, I forgot to mention that a street told everyone the reason for your three year absence. Alan sweated cold. She, did? Yeah, she told us all about your comatose state. That the cryosleep is not perfect, and that it can induce coma in one person out of 100,000, or something like that. Whatever. Since Marco wasn't going to back off nor apologize for what he did. Well, she looked him in the eyes. Hell broke loose shortly after. Astrid threatened to kill them all as punishment, and high levelists don't like that, word. Can you wonder why? If I remember right, you lose a portion of your gold when you die. Correct. Half or your gold to be precise. Imagine what that means for a high-level user. So, what we saw an hour ago outside HQ. Yes. Amelia wanted me to join Marco's new guild. And you rejected the offer. That's why she looked so hurt. You sisters won't be able to hang out anymore. Hey. I was hurt, too. You're right. Sorry. But what's going to happen to shooting stars now? Wasn't Marco the first officer? Guilds are created, disbanded, and merged all the time, five. Astrid will find someone that can fill the role in a heartbeat, trust me, unless you want the job. She smirked, making Alan get silent for a bit. Consequently, she received a series of noises and unintelligible words. Gosh, clear your thoughts, five. Where is he now? He asked. Who? Marco? I thought you'd ask about my sister. Wait. Why are you asking that? There's something I need to talk about with him. You're not planning something stupid, are you? She asked. Alan did not respond, but something in his eyes made Marissa chuckle. Okay, then. There is someone I need to see, too. Hurry, mention that you're thirsty. Just like that? Um, okay. Tamara, don't you feel thirsty after eating all that ice cream? Alan asked. He could finally see the petite girl after she had consumed half of the cup. Come on, Alan, another push. Because I need a drink. You know what I mean. Tamara narrowed her eyes at both, especially at Marissa. If that's what you want, how about the drinking banshee? Marissa suggested. 
Tamara left the spoon on the cup, exhaled, and responded in a deeper tone of voice, count with me. Oh, God, what have we done? Seven, ten, in looking for trouble. Marissa's black lynx, big enough to carry two people, soared the sky at great speed. Although she promised it to be a five-minute flight, that did not deter Alan from missing out half of the fun. Come on, five. Stop burying your face in my back and take a good look at the city. The levelless like you can rarely enjoy a view like this. I, I am trying, Alan replied through party chat. The wind hit his face once he craned his neck down to peek at Londoras. The vast city not only housed mansions and diverse establishments but also stadiums, parks and public training grounds, with plenty of space between each lot of land. According to my mentor, a hundred years ago, Earth's cities were overpopulated and crammed. It was normal for a small city to have a million people. It's hard to imagine it, but why would my mentor lie? 100 000. That's the Novus population. Even if only 5,000 people live here, it already feels full of life. Alan Warden, Isabella had said before he entered the Creopod, it's time for you to learn what happened to the Santa Maria's crew. He also recalled the scene from earlier, Amelia stretching out her hand to her sister, and Marissa rejecting the offer. It's so comforting to see that the only conflicts you all know are regular problems like these. Disagreements are nothing compared with what humanity has already suffered. I relentlessly worked for eight months so that people like you could have adventures, eat delicious food and be free to do whatever you want. His mind got full of the many nasty stares the other guilders threw at him. His body trembled by only remembering a tenth of the many painful deaths he experienced. And yet, Alan shut his eyes, leaned his face against Marissa's back, and exhaled, thinking of the one that was now his guild master. I want to keep this peace as long as I can. Five, are you smelling my hair? Huh? No. A little. Can't help it. She smells of vanilla. Do I have to remind you what the rules of being my co-pilot were? Don't grope, don't puke, don't fall, right, he replied. But I'm not groping. Let's do a barrel roll. Just for the fun of it. T that won't be nice, wah. Here we go. Marissa maneuvered her flying feline beast in a spiral trajectory, forcing Alan to embrace her waist more tightly. Did you like it, five, she laughed out loud, as Alan swallowed his vomit. It's so weird to become friends with the person who killed the only ally I have. Her laughter is like that of a child, even though she's taller than Amelia. Marissa is like a childish, annoying little sister. He exhaled while staring at his user interface. Friend list. Status. Astrid Bradford. Online. Marissa Laflom. Online. Monique Asensio. Online. He glanced at Tamara, riding her own mount and keeping her distance. She was sitting with her legs crossed while finishing the rest of her ice cream. Can I ask you something, Marissa? What is it, five? Yesterday, I could see Astrid's location on my friend list, but not anymore. Do you know why? Hum, it sounds as if she purposely let you see her location at all times before, in case you came back, but changed the privacy settings today. Whoa. That's. But why would she change it? Did you listen to what I said? You two have finally reunited, end of story. Why would she let you know where she is all the time anymore? True. Can I ask you something else? What is it now? Why didn't you stay with the others last night? You know, when they were. It didn't look fun to kill you over and over again. Remember Matthew, the healer? I was super horny, and I preferred to spend my night making out with him. With everything that has happened lately, I forgot I haven't kissed a girl ye, I mean. Focus, Alan, focus. It didn't seem that way yesterday, he continued, and after what happened an hour ago, it's clearer now. You stayed at Shooting Star because you don't get along with Marco and his followers. Am I right? Marissa chuckled bitterly after remaining silent for a bit. I'd love to answer, but we have arrived. So, let's do a nosedive. Oh, come o. Oh. As the lynx flew downward, Alan repeated Marissa's rules in his head. Don't grope, don't puke, don't fall. You really are a brat. An annoying little. You're not wrong though. She said, ordering his lynx to open its wings and land safely at the last second. We're here. You made it in one piece, five. Alan jumped down in a hurry and placed his forehead against the ground as if it was sacred. Oh, thank God. Did you enjoy the ride, baby boy? Of course not. I, I felt like I'd die at any moment and I almost peed my pants. The drinking banshee. 
Tamara cried ecstatically, landing calmly beside them. I've never had the opportunity to come, but I've heard lots of good things about this place, she beamed, clapping. Shall we, Alan? She turned to him, showing she was drooling. As he stood up, his companions ordered their winged felines to disappear inside a jewel that they stored in their inventory absently. Neat, he thought, before turning his gaze towards the three-story brick Tudor-style building. Located at the western edge of the city, with no other neighboring buildings within a 1,500 feet radius, it looked as if it wanted to distance itself from Londorus. And yet, it looks like it could fit everywhere in the city just fine. Listen, we're partners in crime on this, so keep Tamara busy while I look for someone. He surely knows where Marco is, Marissa said privately as they crossed the lobby, decorated with dissected monster heads. Okay, I count on you. Alan glanced back, but the lanky girl was nowhere to be found. And if I were you, I would keep my head down for as long as possible. There must be a lot of ex-shooting stars here. The ones that hate you, you're telling me that now? He halted at the sight of a place full of people. Just by looking at the nearest tables, he could recognize at least three guilders easily. That's the guy that threw a sword at me as a joke. Calm down. They won't be able to read your level if they can't see your face. I could have lent you one of my cloaking artifacts, but your level it's too low to use them. So, it's time to prove that you can be a strong-willed guild co-leader. Good luck. A strong will, oh, for the love of. God damn it. He instinctively covered his mouth with the collar of his jacket, but knew he would only gather attention. Oh, it's already crowded. But look, we can sit at the bar, Alan, Tamara said, leading the way, and Alan wished she was taller so he could hide behind her back. It's not a bad idea. He leaned forward, grabbed her by the shoulders and whispered in her ear. Thanks for everything you've done for me today. No problem. I'm having fun. Besides, I've always wanted to know you. Really? Wow. Um, his gaze locked on a napkin on the edge of a near table, which he snatched without someone noticing. He covered his nose and mouth with it. Does that mean that Astrid used to talk about me all the time? Now that I think about it, in the two years I've been in the guild, she barely mentioned you at all. Ark. See critical hit to my heart. I I don't need to glance at my HP to know that it dropped to 10%. Ouch, that hurt, Marissa commented. But she's telling the truth. Tamara isn't trying to be mean. Five, she's just that honest. How reassuring. Once they reached the bar, Alan was giving the back to almost 50 people. Even if not all of them are ex-shooting stars, it only takes one of them to ruin everything. Is doing this even worth it? His mind reminded him of Marco's wide smirk while walking out of the HQ. Oh, right. He formed fists. What can I get you? A human male bartender asked Tamara and squinted at Alan, who was covering his nose. What's wrong with you? Don't mind me, I just have a, he thought of his excuse for a second. Allergy, he mumbled. A what now? The bartender grimaced. There are no allergies in the Novus, five. What could have triggered it? Tamara asked, pouting. Excuse me, Tamara, I, I am going to the bathroom. Sure, I'll be right here that way. The bartender pointed to his right, still staring at him. Nice getaway, five. Why didn't you tell me you were great at stealth? Have you considered being a rogue? I could teach you a thing or two. Shut up. He passed by three other occupied tables, feeling hundreds of eyes examining his every move, but once he reached the pointed corridor, he relaxed his shoulders. This is harder than I thought. I'll go hide in the bathroom while you find Marco, okay? Yeah, yeah, leave it to me. Alan followed the signs while still covering his nose with his left hand, and ignored the gaze of someone passing by him, wearing cherry perfume. Um, this smell is kind of familiar. Five more steps and he would enter the restroom. Hold on, a woman said behind him while grabbing his right wrist. Someone strong enough to stop him in his tracks and force him to turn around. A pair of amber eyes scrutinized him for a second. Of all people, the worst imaginable person had to find me first. She pulled his other hand, revealing his face, and Alan found himself at a loss of words. Saying nothing either, she wrinkled her nose and pulled Alan inside the women's restroom, where she pushed him towards the sinks. Amelia, please, there's not a single thing you could say that could justify you being here, she said in a collective voice, although the gleaming in her eyes looked full of killing intent. 
She placed her hand in the door for a couple of seconds, before revealing that she had created a rustic black lock, out of thin air. But I don't want you to think that I'm unreasonable. She chuckled. So I'll give you ten seconds to explain yourself. Depending on your answer, I may even send you back to Lundorus myself. Shooting Stars HQ is still your last checkpoint, isn't it? That's the most terrifying smile I've ever seen. T trust me, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have a good reason. Eight. Hold on. I just want to talk to Marco. I mean, I need to talk to him about. Five, she said, forming a ball of fire in her palm. Oh, come on. I heard he quitted the guild, so this might be my only chance. Two, she took a step forward. I won't be able to move on if I don't speak to him. He shut his eyes, ready to suffer the burning of his skin and bones, but Amelia did not throw her spell. She was staring at him with a troubled face on her face. What does that even mean, she asked. Eh sorry, but I can't tell you. I said no bullshit. Her eyes were as fierce as those of a predator, which made Alan step back, remembering how ruthless she could be. I'm sorry, Amelia, I know you're his confidant, but this is something between. Alan's voice died as Amelia grabbed him by the neck and lifted him off the ground. His HP dropped considerably as her long nails drew blood. Is this all a joke to you? I barely know you, Alan Warden, but I can already tell that you don't care about anything. You disgust me. WWA chat. Look at your actions. After what happened to you last night, you come here looking for more. And worse of all, even though you know you're useless, here you are, expecting Lord Marco to listen to your charade. If you want to make a clown out of yourself, fine, I don't care. But can you at least think of the consequences of your recklessness first? W. Weary, immortals, here. T. There's, no, cons. That's what an amateur would say, she cried, pushing him against the white tiled wall. Every time you die, your money gets cut in half. Amass a great capital and you'll start picking your fights more carefully. Without money, you can't equip yourself better, you can't buy a house, travel, or eat well. Make enemies out of anyone with that laid-back mind of yours, and people will start harassing you, making your stay here a complete nightmare. So I ask you again, why are you here? I can't tell. She let him go. Alan collapsed, coughing and holding his neck. Every person that messed with you last night has already quit the guild, so what were you thinking? Hum? Are you trying to impress your beloved Queen Astrid by sticking it to the man that upset her? I, I am not, cough, trying to. You're so pathetic, she said, showing her canine teeth. Your lack of self-respect is impressive. Do you think she would have? Amelia shut her mouth and shook her head as if she was reprimanding herself. I'm not doing this out of recklessness, I promise, he said, standing up but thanks for worrying about me. What the hell are you talking about? What makes you think I care about a loser like you? She winced, prompting him to tilt his head to one side as if her statement was obvious. We wouldn't be here if that was the case. He folded his arms, regaining his confidence. You brought me here to talk me out of this madness of mine. Is that so? She sneered. Are you telling me you can tell all that just from my actions? What if I'm just luring you into a trap? What kind of trap would this be? You can kill me just by blinking. Fine, she shrugged, smirking in a way that terrified him. If I'm that easy to read to you, tell me what else your third eye can see in me. Oh, crap. I, I am more concerned about what's to come once I find Marco. He tried to create some space between them, but the enclosed room only let him move to his right side. Amelia followed him, like a cat cornering a mouse. So little me isn't worth a tiny fraction of your time? I thought we were having fun chatting. Am I that insignificant to you? Or do you just hate me that much? Actually, I don't. She quickly lifted her leg back. Say something or I'll kick your balls so hard that. I don't think you're a bad person, Amelia. Amelia froze in her place. Huh? Although you killed me several times, I don't hold a grudge against you, he started blurting out. You were doing it because of him, right? I could see it in your eyes. Every time you killed me you showed anger, yes, but just because you thought I had stolen Marco's gold and Guild's position. I can't see you as an evil person if you care for others. Is that all, she cried, still in a kicking stance. He only nodded, waiting for it, but she stepped back, grunting. Go. He slowly opened his eyes. Really? Yes. I'm done with you. Whatever you say to Marco, I bet it'll be freaking entertaining.
She snapped her fingers, making the lock in the door combust, but Alan was still in his place, staring at the exit. You won't tell anyone I'm here? Honor your name and disappear from my sight, ghost, she said, folding her arms. My sister is in a good mood, huh? Your puppy eyes really worked on her, Marissa said through party chat. By the way, I got your info. You can find Marco in the Sakura room. I'll tell you how to get there. Thanks, Amelia, Alan said, reaching the open door. I owe you one. Whatever, Amelia whispered as he stepped outside. After sighing, she opened her palm and created a small orb of fire that quickly turned black and sprouted wings and insect-like legs. Taking fly, the little creature got out of the restroom and quietly attached to Alan's jacket. Do you see a staircase to your right? Go to the first floor. Marissa instructed. Marissa, do you also think I'm a nutcase? He asked as he climbed up the stairs. Alan heard her side, even though it was a telepathic communication. Well, as my sister had already said, why would you risk coming to the wolves more after what they did to you? Just because you don't hold a great amount of gold and have nothing to lose, doesn't mean they can't kidnap you and ask Astrid for a ransom. Marissa paused so that Alan could reflect about it. Now that you're under her protection, you're something else to worry about. Everything will be fine, I promise. From the first floor, having a wide view of the bar, he found her at the far right corner, sitting with Matthew Burstein, her boyfriend. After all, you're keeping an eye on Astrid's guest, don't you? From his place, Alan saw Marissa looking at him. Did you hear that? Oh, you, en foie. I don't know what that means, but it sounds cute. Alan smirked at her before turning around. In front of him, a series of doors. He read each sign as he passed them by. Dahlia, Chamomile, Iris. Here it is. Sakura. He took a deep breath before storming inside. Marco Souza, we need to talk. 5. 11. Bitter Memories. As soon as Alan stepped inside the room, he was stopped in his tracks by someone pointing a knife to his throat. Excuse me. I'll get rid of this pest outside. Hold on, Rupert. Let me see his face, a young feminine voice said, making Alan glance at the girl wearing a ruffled dress and ribbons on her silky, long brunette hair. Level 5? She squinted at Alan, and the realization made her clasp with slim, delicate hands. You're him. There's no doubt about it. Rupert, treat this gentleman as our special guest. Rupert bowed at her and stepped back, while Alan found Marco sitting next to the young teen. What are you doing here? Marco asked, leaving his cup on the table and standing up to confront him. Although his voice sounded composed, his golden eyes were shining with the same murderous intensity as Amelia's minutes ago. Calm down, my sweet prince, the girl intoned, grabbing his wrist. Didn't you hear him? He only wants to talk. She turned her gaze towards Alan. It's okay, honey. Why don't you take a seat? I didn't expect him to be alone, but I never thought he'd be accompanied by someone like her, either. Alan glanced at the delicate young lady smiling at him. And how old is she, anyway? She looks 14 or less, but that would be impossible. I'm sorry, miss, Alan spoke, maintaining a stiff posture, but I'd like to borrow him for a couple of minutes if you don't mind. You and I have nothing to talk about, Marco said, forming fists and irradiating a dark aura around them. I said seat. It's rude to reject a lady's hospitality, you know? Alan and Marco turned their gazes towards the teen, who for a moment had turned her voice severe. Do as she says, Rupert whispered to Alan, bringing him a cushion. A Zabutan? Alan then glanced at the low table, at the room decorated with paintings of pink flowering trees and at two NPC servants waiting in a corner, wearing kimonos. A Japanese-styled room. I don't feel like being in Londoris anymore. Alan reluctantly sat, and one of the cat-eared NPCs rushed to bring him a cup and pour something on it. Wonderful. The girl beamed. Drinking is a social activity, you know? More people, more fun. Why do I feel like being hostage all over again? Alan thought, gulping his drink. The liquid immediately burned his throat, making him cough. What's this? The hostess giggled. Look at him. Is this your first time drinking alcohol? That's sake, and it can be a pretty strong beverage for a first-timer. Would you prefer my servant to serve you apple juice? No, hold on. He gave a shorter, quicker sip, nodding. It's actually good. She giggled. 
I own this place, you know, so you can drink and eat to your heart's content. With her white, slim hand, she pointed at the center table full of snacks, fruit, desserts, and meat servings. This is not what I expected. Alan watched the NPC fill his cup again, but this time he was reluctant to sip. I never stopped to consider if this was poisoned. Come on, the girl said softly. Enjoy yourself. Why are you being nice to me? Do I know you? No, Alan Warden, but I know you. We have a friend in common, you see. Lady Monique? Does it ring a bell? Alan nodded vigorously. Oh, from that restaurant, yes. She's another nice lady I met when. Wait. Does this mean that Lady Monique told her everything she knew about me? He glanced back at Marco, who was making his best to remain calm. Oh, holy space crap. Pardon me, I haven't introduced myself yet. She stood up and made a curtsy. I'm Kathleen Mayer, leader of the Deathbringers Guild. Nice to meet you, Alan Warden. That prompted him to stand up, too. Tea the pleasure is all mine. Marco only sipped and rolled his eyes. Oh, so she's really here, huh? Marissa's voice was heard inside Alan's head, which made him feel less anxious. Do you know this brat? Yes, unfortunately. Don't let her little princess masquerade fool you. She's a monster as strong as a strid. Both have been rivals almost from the start, and she deliberately chose to look like this. Hey, don't judge. Five. Some change their appearance to that of their opposite sex, some women enlarge their tits, and some decide to look like a lowly. Do you have a problem with that? Wait, did you say there is boob customization? Shut up. Here, try the chicken. Kathleen smiled at him. I assure you that the food prepared by my NPCs is quite superior to anything you could eat at the dragon's belly. Just don't tell the owner that though, he's a friend of mine. Tee hee. I'll have to play along for the moment. If you insist. Alan beamed and grabbed a chicken leg, taking a bite. Oh, wow. This is. The dragon's belly's food tasted nice, but this is on a completely different level. It's the seasoning. Kathleen smiled in a motherly way. That's right, I was able to replicate my family's recipe here inside the Novus and teach it to my servants. Try this apple pie baked with the Mayer family's secret recipe. Um, God. It's amazing. You'll turn into an excellent wife someday. Do you think so? How flattering. Although the NPCs would be the ones cooking for my future husband instead of me. If I was the lucky one, I would just pretend you were the one cooking. These are your recipes, after all. Oh, how sweet of you, tee hee. Marco, who was gritting his teeth, leaned toward Kathleen and whispered, Are you going to let this guy ruin our meal? This guy. I know, she said in a serene tone of voice before turning to Alan. But I can't lose the opportunity to express my gratitude to the man that helped me destroy shooting stars. Not everyone enlarges their breasts, Alan blurted out telepathically. Tamara is practically flat, yours look of average size, and if my memory serves me right, Astrid's look the same as when. Why are you still thinking about that? Pay attention to their conversation, damn it. The one that destroyed. Alan blinked and turned to Kathleen, frowning. Wait, you're not talking about me, are you? Of course I am, silly. And for that, you have my eternal gratitude. She turned to her servant. Kasumi, would you mind showing us that video I liked? please? Right away. After making a short bow, the NPC's eyes glowed and projected a video on the wall in front of them, her mouth acting as an audio speaker. Alan watched a group of commentators having a fierce debate about last night's battle stream. Suddenly, one of them pointed at the screen above them, making the camera focus on a list of made-up names, but Alan recognized those in fourth and fifth place. Shooting stars and death bringers. The commentators roared in surprise when Astrid's guild dropped out from the top 10. This is in real time. This is happening as we speak. Let's scroll down to see where Shooting Stars is positioned right now. Alan swallowed hard as the list went down, and down, and down. 110th place. Oh, how low the big have fallen. Let's reiterate that this list only ranks the overall guild power, Tim. Good luck getting into the top 50s again though. Kathleen burst out laughing. It was a childlike but refined laugh. It's still as funny as the first time. Alan lowered his head, looking at his reflection on his cup's content. Oh, so that's the game we're going to play. He gulped his drink. You know, you seem to be very old friends. And you. He pointed at Marco with the half-eaten chicken leg. 
You found a new guild pretty quickly. You even came all the way here, as if you had planned it all along. Kathleen smiled ear to ear. You think? I've been friends with Marco since the very first Novus days. Is that so? Alan smirked at him. That's right, she said, and pouted. Unfortunately, when I could finally form my guild, he got snatched by that gorilla woman. But nothing will separate us again. Isn't that right, my prince? Well, glad I could help you reunite at last. Alan said, raising his cup. Let's make a toast. Sure. Kasumi, fill his cup. Come on, Marco, grab your drink too. Marco did, after exhaling. For eternal friendship, Alan toasted. For eternal friendship, yeah, she giggled. The two drank in unison, followed by Marco, who gave a modest sip. Five? It may be too late to say this. Oh, don't worry, Marissa. It wouldn't be the first time you freaking do it. I don't know what kind of relationship you and Astrid had, so, spit it. If you needed another excuse to hate Marco Souza, he dated her for like a month. Alan spat out his drink, making Marco and Kathleen wince. Marissa Laflom, you are chaos incarnate, just like your sister. Ah. This is the good stuff. Tamara beamed, leaving another empty mug of beer on the bar. And where is Alan? He's missing out on all the fun. She rested her chin in one hand and grabbed a fistful of peanuts with the other, munching them absently. I haven't seen Marissa in a while, too. Although she's always like that. I sometimes think she doesn't like me. Cheers, cutie, a man suddenly said beside her, holding his mug aloft. Tamara squinted at the bulky man sitting by her side. William? Do you also like coming here? I'm here because of business. He chuckled. What are you doing here? A few feet away from them, Karen Svensson noticed the two chatting and stomped her way towards them. Hey, what is one of Astrid's bitches doing here? She cried, pointing at Tamara. I was asking her that, William said, with closed teeth. And it wouldn't hurt you to be nice. I don't have to anymore. Karen was shouting, while Tamara looked at them, confused. Am I missing some context here? Frowning, she turned around to look at the rest of the clientele. Some of them wore the emblem of a skull inside a snowflake. Look upstairs, a voice whispered behind her. When Tamara turned around, she found a couple passing by. A young man was being held by the arm by a tall girl with strawberry blonde hair. Was that Marissa? Repeating those words in her head, she looked at the first floor, from where a young-looking girl could be seen, exiting a room, crossing the corridor, and taking down the stairs. W what is the snow diamond doing here? Tamara's face turned pale and felt that the entire place seemed to twist around her head. Karen Svensson was still nearby, glaring at her. She was with Marco just a couple of hours ago, wasn't she? That means that Marco is here too, but why would he? Her heart skipped a beat. No. He wouldn't. Tamara opened her user interface, tapped on the guild's tab, and checked the members list. 68 current members. We've been 100 for over a year now. Dear goddess. She swallowed, feeling that the alcohol effects disappeared in a second. But most importantly, where is Alan Warden? Tammy? William whispered in her ear. I've convinced Karen to leave you alone, but I can't guarantee your safety if others see you. I would leave if I were you. Come on, I'll escort you out. Tamara felt William's huge hand pressing against her shoulder. I. I need to call Astrid. Some things are better forgotten. 12.05 digital days ago a heavy rain hit Eunice Town. As people ran, searching for a dry, warm shelter, a teenage girl remained still, sitting on the town hall's porch, absently watching ponds forming and people stepping over them. At first glance, she looked like a statue, until she embraced herself. Although the rain could not reach her, she felt cold. Bloody hell, she muttered, shivering. Once you come back, I'll smack your face so hard your whole head will twist. Opening her user interface for the 100th time did not help her feel less anxious. She gritted her teeth and violently waved her hand so that the floating window disappeared. Whatever info she was checking on it, it had not changed. The sound of steps drowned by the rain made her turn to her right, where someone carrying an umbrella had stepped over a puddle. Damn it! Why are there cracks and depressions on a virtual town's road? What's their purpose? It's just stupid, he mumbled, making her chuckle. I was wondering when would someone get inside Holmburg. The young man frowned at her. What's that? 
She pointed at the hole below his feet, making him half smile. Saying nothing else, he entered the town hall's porch, closed his umbrella, and inspected the floating window in front of the door. We are closed. Office hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. She heard the guy sigh before sitting beside her, maintaining a modest distance. You should move on, he blurted out. Excuse me? She cried, standing up. Who the hell do you think you are? I'm no one, he replied while looking at the street. But I've seen you come here daily for the last three days. Whoever you're waiting for, it's not worth the hassle. Mind your own business, pal. I would, but it's annoying to see you stay here, missing on what the novice has to offer for all of us. Shut your bloody trap, she muttered, clenching her teeth. You know nothing. I agree, he said while opening his umbrella, ready to go. I don't know what you're going through, and I won't ask, but you're forgetting one thing. He waited until he got her attention, and for the first time, he gazed deep into her icy blue eyes. He can message you whenever he wants. You don't need to be here at all times. Aren't you hungry? No, she shouted, but her stomach growled loudly, objecting. A little, the young man got closer, offering her the umbrella. Come, I know a restaurant with decent food nearby. Decent won't be enough. NPCs make everything around here. What can you expect? Fine. You've convinced me. You stupid, eloquent meddlesome passers-by. I have a name, you know? You, NPC impersonator, dot. She chuckled. I'm Astrid Bradford. You? He smiled mildly. My name is. Astrid opened her eyes before the memory could continue and clicked her teeth. Whatever. Someone's looking like wanting to tear down a mountain, her companion intoned, chuckling. Astrid glanced at Helen, who was riding beside her on her winged puma. Mind your own business, Astrid replied through party chat. Come on, Bradford, you can do better. The strong currents blew their hair back and threatened to take them down out of their mounts if they were not careful, but for max levelers like them, flying was second nature. Astrid was folding her arms, maintaining a straight position and Helen was casually lying face down on her puma's back while maintaining a smirk. At least let me see you a bit excited, Helen said. In a couple of hours, you'll have a nice dinner with your once lost, long-time companion. Only the two of you, catching up, locking eyes, Astrid sneered. There's nothing to catch up, Helen. What do you expect him to tell me? All about his travel through the deepest levels of his unconsciousness? About how his mind drifted endlessly to a point of no return? Helen's lips turned upside down. Don't do that to me, Bradford. Don't keep me in the dark like the others. I know you made up that coma story, and pretending otherwise, it's, it's like insulting my intelligence. If you don't want to feel stupid talking about it, don't bring up the subject again, then. Jeez. How many moontain dews did you drink? That bloody thing makes you more aggressive than normal. I'd like to deny that, but it's true that sugar always. Hold on, Tamara is calling me. Guild master, please tell me you're on your way back. I am, Astrid answered, frowning. Why? Have you checked your guild tab, yet? It'll be easier to explain once you check it. Astrid did, getting dozens of notifications at once. What the bloody hell is? Her bewilderment soon turned into disbelief, then confusion, before gritting her teeth. Helen, what is it, Bradford? Helen asked, examining her glare. Is everything okay? It's not. Go to HQ immediately and check the vault. Astrid turned to her, showing a collected expression. I just want you to make sure that Jason Foreman hasn't stolen all the guild's gold. Four. Twelve long-term promises to kick butts. Is this another one of your jokes? Alan asked Marissa privately, while Kathleen stood up from her seat. Excuse me for a minute, gentlemen. I'll be back in a minute. Please, Alan, keep enjoying yourself. Kathleen exited the room, accompanied by one of her NPC maids, and Rupert, her bodyguard, who silently closed the sliding door. No, five. It's true. Marissa responded. They broke up half a year ago. Only Alan, Marco, and the female NPC called Kasumi remained, who rushed to fill their cups. That's Kathleen's way of saying that we can freely talk, at least for five minutes, Marco said, before sipping. I can't, let that information deter me from my main mission. Alan felt his throat dry and gulped his cup. Focus, Alan, focus. So, what is it, Alan the ghost? Marco asked, loosening his tie. 
What's so important that you came all the way here just to talk? Alan looked down at his cup, already getting filled by Kasumi. Come on, speak. I risked a lot coming here because I knew I couldn't leave this unsolved. I endured Marissa's crazy flight, lied to Tamara, and even confronted Amelia Laflamme. Don't let that info get in the way. Alan took a deep breath, opened his user interface, and closed Marissa's party chat. He then wondered if it was okay to talk in front of the female NPC. I'll have to watch what I say, just in case. That nightmare spell you cast on me last night. How much did you see? I saw everything. Marco shrugged. To others, it may have been a couple of seconds, but for me, it was like watching a one-hour video reel of your secrets. You know what this information may cause. Marco sneered. Is that why you're here? If I told anyone about your eight-month escapade, it would only make you look like a martyr or a hero, and I have no intention of doing that. Fine. Keep it that way. Alan straightened his posture. But we must address the other subject. I'd rather not, Marco said, shaking his cup so that Kasumi could serve him more. You're the only person I can talk with, so please, listen. You want my help, don't you? It pains me to say it, but yes. Call it bad luck, or destiny, but you ended up getting involved in this, one way or another. So, destiny? He snickered. Do you believe in that crap? It's just a way of saying it. Then I'd recommend that you choose your words wisely. I get bored easily. And just as a reminder, the clock is ticking. Alan showed his teeth, grunting. This is a serious issue, Marco. The integrity of this ship and its population is at risk. I'm struggling to see why that's my problem. You're the one that was selected by that computer. This involves all of us. And yet, you choose to maintain it a secret. Alan got over the table to grab Marco by the collar of his shirt, spilling their drinks. Are you fucking drunk? I wish. Since my vitality increased to silver rank, I can barely feel the effects of alcohol. Can't you see the implications of this? This ship was sent to space so humanity could have another chance. If we don't do something, everything will be in vain. You're Kathleen's special guest, so I won't retaliate. But touch me again and I'll make sure that you get nightmares every single night for the rest of your pathetic life. Alan bit his lower lip and returned to his seat as Marco readjusted his clothes. It's been three years, ghost. Three years since that event supposedly happened. And since your return, have you seen this world in shambles? Marco asked, staring at Alan's frown. The answer is no. Because nothing has happened. I may even bet that nothing is lurking in here. But, you wanted to talk? Let me finish. Let's look at the facts first. If what that computer says it's true, and that thing got inside, it may be hibernating, or it's incompatible with this system. Computer? Are you referring to Isabella? Alan shook his head slightly. Why would that thing be incompatible? From what I have been told, the Novus mainframe it's the most organic machine humanity has ever developed. Neural symbiosis, perpetual REM state. Would you relate those terms with what a regular fridge or toaster can do? This is not a regular toaster we're dealing with, and you know it. And this is not a regular VR headset. Marco raised his voice. The fact that three years have passed and nothing has changed, it's the best proof we have. The Novus it's the most secure place on this ship. So, do you want me to sit here, drink, and forget everything about it? Just like you? Marco sneered. Oh, by all means, go. Run through all the Novus in search of this boogeyman. I bet you could do a better job than the administrators that can detect everything inside their system. A memory flashed in Alan's memory of a young teen, resembling Kathleen but with black hair, walking among the shooting stars that forced him to fight repeatedly. She moved as if no one could see her, and as if the Nova's physics did not work on her. Could she? Do you know any of them? An administrator? No, Marco replied, mildly smiling. Do you know how to contact one? No but I wish you good luck finding them. I can't believe it. You're a moron, and you're truly unfortunate. I wouldn't like to be in your shoes. At least I tried. Alan snickered, saying nothing more. As he stood up and walked towards the exit, Marco followed him with his gaze. Wait, Marco said, exhaling, there's something else I'd like to discuss. You said that this was my problem, right? So I'll solve it myself. Alan was about to open the door, but a phantasmagorical silhouette rose from the floor and blocked his path. 
It was a black humanoid with the head of a crow, and without moving or making a noise, it told him to stay or else. When Alan saw its bottom, he noticed that a shadow stretched out all the way to Marco's seat. I had to listen to your charade. It's my turn now. Come, it's something you need to learn, eventually. Marco took a sip. It relates to your beloved Astrid. Hearing that name coming out of his mouth made Alan form fists. After kicking Tamara out of the bar, Kathleen's co-leader instructed a pair of Deathbringers to stand guard at the entrance. To pass the time, the two guys smoked, cursed their luck, and watched the last stream of Miss Cosmica from hours ago. They nodded in unison while watching the idol dance and shake her hips. Although she only sings girly stuff, she sure is hot. Tell me about it. His companion chuckled. When I'm in the mood, I just lock the door, get comfy, enlarge the video screen, freaking mute it, and just. They heard a sonic boom, followed by an explosion that made the ground shake a 100 feet away in front of them. Squinting, the two strolled towards the newly formed crater, ignoring someone from inside asking what had happened. From the smoke stepped out a blonde girl, wearing a sky blue battle suit, who glared at the ones approaching them. They snickered once they recognized her. It was one of the most famous faces in all the Novus. Look what we have here, the Golden Comet. Or was it the Golden Bitch? Like her ex-partners call her. Are you lost, miss? This is a private party. Deathbringers, Astrid said after glancing at the emblems in their armors. So it was true that some cockroaches were hiding in my territory. You're the ones that lose their way home. Florella is far away from here. The two guards armed themselves with lances that appeared in their hands out of thin air. Are you sure you want to do this? We may be on the edge of this city, but this is still considered a safe zone. In this place we're equally matched. One of them smirked. We're equally matched, says the dead man, a street mumbled, strolling towards him. The guy grunted. What did you? A strid punched him in the gut so hard that he bent his body forward. If the safe zone's restrictions had not lowered all of Astrid's stats, that hit alone could have killed him easily. So, I'll have to hit him again. Only a second had passed, and Astrid performed a roundhouse kick to the guy's head, knocking him out for good. The second gilder thrust his spear forward, trying to pierce her in the back, but she moved aside at the last moment, grabbed the spear so he couldn't use it again, and punched him in the face, breaking his nose. The Deathbringer fell backward, covering his blooded face, whimpering. You bitch. I bet you hadn't felt pain like that in a while, Astrid said, throwing the spear away. The pain endurance passive skill also gets nerfed inside your beloved safe zone too, Moran. Remember that pain well. People quickly gathered at the building's entrance, among them, some ex-shooting stars. What are you doing here? Karen Svensson cried, red-faced. We're finally free of the damn mess you call a guild, and you dare to come here. Don't do it, Karen, William whispered to her, holding her by the shoulders, but she brushed him off. Oh, dear, he sighed, watching her stroll forward. Where is Jason Foreman? Astrid asked, calmly. Karen replied to Astrid, spitting at every word, I don't have to answer that. Hell, I don't have to speak with you ever again. From one of the building's windows, Faiza Khalil chuckled and glanced at her partner. She's looking for you, ooh, ooh. What did you do? Jason Foreman did not dare to peek outside. Shut up, shut up, he cried, covering his head while crouching. Outside, Karen manifested magic seals above her, channeling. Your fucking tantrum cost me 400,000 gold. I wonder how much you'll lose after this, Karen. William warned her once more but the magic circles around her increased in number. Gold. Is this why you all quit? Astrid asked at the increasing crowd around William. Dozens of glares coming from known faces stared back at her. I see, Astrid snickered. Have you forgotten what I told you? What use could a cannon have if you don't know how to? She shook her head and met her eyes with Karen's. Whatever. This will be my last lesson for all of you, see? This is the best part about not being under your command anymore. Karen shouted. We won't have to hear your fucking charades ever again. Multi-elemental. Never interrupt an enemy when they're making a mistake. Astrid said before shortening the distance between them in a second. Karen instinctively rushed her spell, being able to launch a third of the magic attacks, but it was too late. The bolts of lightning, ice lances, and orbs of fire were thrown randomly through all the drinking banshee's courtyard. 
while a street grabbed Karen by the face and threw her to the ground. A cracking sound came out of Karen's neck and column. Safe zones suck especially for mags. It turns them into glorified slugs. F fuck why you, Karen hissed, immobilized, while tears ran down her cheeks. A street then turned her attention towards the crowd, from where William stepped forward. Are you going to be in my way too, stoic, she asked. Come on, Comet, give me a break, William responded, folding his arms. There are at least 50 people here. Exactly. Astrid suddenly giggled. Her blue eyes glowed like a pair of aquamarine gemstones. Isn't it sad that you all have to attack me at once to take me down? William gritted her teeth. Are you saying I'm we? What's the matter, sweetheart? Is someone bothering you, a girl said behind William, tapping his back. He moved aside to let Kathleen Mayer take center stage. Oh, I see. Someone must have lost their hound. It's running freely like a wild beast. Her smile faded for a second to whisper at William. Help your friend quickly. This is going to get ugly. Astrid exhaled. Hi, Pauline. I see you opened a new establishment here. But I don't see your regular clientele. You know, 40-year-olds. Oh, Asford, it's so sad to see that you're still running that potty mouth of yours. But this time I can let it go. After all, I would also feel upset if a third of my guild suddenly quit at the same time. Kathleen paused so that their allies could sneer. It's a good thing that I'd never let that happen to me. Tee hee. Astrid remained unfazed and just sighed. You're talking as if you had earned a great victory over me. But is it truly a win if you pick up someone else's trash? Watch your mouth, Asford, Kathleen said, stepping forward, and the ground beneath her started to freeze. Your stupidity caused a diamond to fall off your hands. Weird. I can't recall having something that valuable before. Astrid snickered, advancing too, and her every step left burned footprints. And even if I had, it surely lost its value so much that it escapes me. But whatever it is, I'm glad that you found it. After all, we've already established that you like secondhand stuff, right? Both stared at each other, maintaining a ten feet distance. One more word, from any of them, would open the gates from hell. After what you did, you dare to say her name. Alan said, wrinkling his nose. Having Alan's full attention made Marco chuckle. What do you know about the gold used inside the Novus, ghost? Gold? What's this all about? What is he pretending? Alan examined Marco's smirk and decided to take the bait. It seems to work like in any other game, doesn't it? Alan said, returning to his place, but refusing to sit, leaning against the wall and crossing his arms instead. You earn it from missions or by working, and you buy stuff with it. But most important of all, if you die here, your gold balance gets cut in half, right? And where do you think that subtracted gold goes? What kind of question is that? I would prefer to not make an ass out of myself in front of this dip's hit, but I have nothing. No idea. Back to the system? Very good, ghost. You have shown to be more intelligent than the average monkey. I'm going to kill this man. Someday. That is because the Novus Gold is a cryptocurrency, Marco continued. All of Earth's money got transferred here into the Novus. How do you know that? The administrators revealed it on the Novus first anniversary, Marco said, sipping. Back then, the entire world went crazy and started forming guilds late in the game. Since those players were inexperienced, we crushed them like insects. He crossed eyes with Alan. Tell me, technician, when the time comes, can you figure out what this money will be used for? Alan squinted for a bit, while remembering himself giving maintenance to the machines and weapon crates in the Santa Maria's hangar. No way. Whoever implemented this gold system into the Novus knew exactly what would happen, Marco continued. Everyone started from level one here, even the rich. Now, only those with the best leadership skills or those with raw natural talent can reach the top. No longer the highborn will dictate or govern us. If you want to be someone on the next new earth, you'll have to conquer this world first. He smirked. This, this is messed up. Why are you telling me all this? Because Astrid is a ranker, ghost. One of the most powerful users in all the Novus. Seventh place in the individual category. Even I can't compare to her. I'm in the top fifties. Marco chuckled bitterly, examining Alan's thoughtful expression. Do you think Astrid has the time to play this glorified hide-and-seek game with you, especially now that her guild is crumbling? 
Peeking at him for a second, Alan locked eyes with a plate of cookies close to Kathleen's seat and got close to snatch a handful. With power comes notoriety, and with that you can gain even more influence, Marco was saying, staring at the munching Alan. If she was any smart, she should prioritize the rebuilding of the guild and get rid of any source of discord that may cause another severance again. Is that a donut I'm seeing? Alan thought, leaning forward to snatch it, but Marco pierced the table with a knife, right in the middle of the pastry. Are you listening to what I'm saying, ghost? It's unfortunate that you had to get out and fix other people's mistakes, but life is like that sometimes. Call it destiny, if you want. The point is that you now live in a different world than ours. We, the top guilders, are already in the endgame. While you'll struggle to level up, killing slimes and searching for a menace that might not even exist, we're preparing to shape the future of the next new world. I don't kill my friends, Alan said, letting the donut get ripped in half by the knife. And last night, things didn't seem like you described them to be. He stuffed his mouth with the food. A street is not concerned with amassing a substantial amount of gold. That's why she didn't blink an eye when punishing you all, wasting your precious money. He swallowed. Is that why your interests didn't match hers, deserter? We had different goals, true. Contrasting visions to what the future of the guild should have been. All that fuss you made about me logging back and taking away your stuff was just an excuse to leave. Not an excuse, ghost, an opportunity. When Kathleen learned about your existence, she messaged me, offering me a co-leader's position in her guild, which I gladly accepted. Even though you loved Astrid? Alan asked and was sharp enough to notice the brief twitch in Marco's lips. Is loyalty nothing to you, or did you do this out of spite because you broke up? You can't fall in love with a comet, ghost. It's beautiful and holds tremendous power, but it follows a very straight, rigid path. It doesn't matter how much you try, it's unreachable. You can't reason with it to change its course. Is Kathleen your wish granter then? Absolutely. Yes. What makes you think she wants the same as you? That doesn't concern you. Are you going to betray her, too? Unlike Astrid, Kathleen would never let that happen. We're done. Marco pointed at the exit, and the Dark Guardian dissipated. I would appreciate it if you could leave without making another fuss. Fine, I'll leave now, after telling you this, Alan put one foot over the dining table, making the plates shake and his cup of sake fall. That coincided with an explosion from outside the building that shook the entire room, although he did not notice, for his eyes were locked on Marco's. You know what I do, Alan said in a deeper voice, I fix things, and you may think you're the smartest guy around, but I can tell when something's broken just by glancing at it. And you, used Emmy, as a literal tool. And that's something I'll never forget. I promise you that one day, I'll make you pay with interest. Marco's serene silence broke with a sneer. I'd love to see you try, ghost. Maybe I should start by punching that smug face of yours. Move another inch, and I'll make a hole through your chest, Marco grunted, while Tamara opened the sliding door wide. Alan, no, she cried. T Tamara, sorry for not telling you where I was. And it was just a joke. I know I couldn't hurt. Forget that. Tamara shouted, grabbing his wrist. We have to go. Now. She pulled him out of the room and forced him to run down the corridor. What's wrong? Did they find out we're here? Tamara stopped in her tracks to push him from the chest. You knew? Alan Warden, did you know this place was full of death bringers? Why yes, I'm sorry. But I really needed to. I'm so mad with you that I could, never mind. The priority is that you help me stop her. Stop? Who? Astrid, she cried, taking down the stairs. She's outside. She came, looking for you. Astrid, it's here. Wait, didn't Marissa say that Kathleen is her rival? Oh, holy space crap. She's strong, all right? There's no doubt about it, Tamara continued saying with tearing eyes. But we're in a safe zone, so she cannot fight with all of her strength. If we let her fight, she'll lose millions. Marco's words suddenly gained more weight. Oh, okay. Let's hurry. By then, all the tables were empty and they could walk through the establishment without issue, but Alan noticed at the distance that the exit was impossible to cross through. This way. Tamara said. They kicked me out, but I managed to enter again through the kitchen. They ignored the NPCs that gently asked them to leave, cross the exit, and rushed their way to the front yard, where Astrid was about to battle Kathleen. Astrid. 
Both guild masters turned their gazes towards him. Astrid turned her battle aura off first. Alan glanced at the reunited crowd and shivered. Were you really thinking about fighting here, Alan? Astrid stretched out a hand to him. Let's go. He strolled towards her, making his best to ignore the dozens of gazes poking his back. Passing by Kathleen was extremely difficult, for she was piercing him with a glare. Are you kidding me? She cried. I refuse to believe that you made all this fuss for him. You were about to risk your gold. Congratulations on getting new guild members, Hawleen, Astrid said in a calm voice, turning around. You're made for each other. As Tamara rushed to reach her guild master's side, Kathleen snickered. Do you see that, guys, she asked aloud, regaining her composure. Should we call her Golden Nanny from now on? The entirety of the drinking banshee erupted in laughter. It was a pleasure to meet you, Alan Warden, and thanks for your help. Alan saw a female shooting star riding a puma waiting for them a few feet ahead. She smiled warmly at him once they met eyes. Good to see that you're both all right, she said. Nice to meet you, Alan Warden. I'm Helen Reed. Nice to meet you, Helen, he said, quietly. Can we leave the chit-chat for later? I don't stand this place, Tamara said, trying in vain to not hear the laughter and mocking remarks coming from the building. She called her winged beast at the same time as Astrid, who did not ride it right away. Her eyes looked lost in thought. It's so painful to see her like this. I shouldn't have. One year. Astrid shouted, turning back. Enjoy your one-year advantage, Mayor. That will be the time it'll take me to reach the top ten again. Try not to miss me in the meantime. More provocations could be heard, but she ignored them all as she mounted her lion. Let's go, she said to Alan, offering him a hand. Her eyes looked cold and her lips looked severe. I'm so sorry, he said, behind her. Not here, she replied, as she ordered her beast to take off. We'll talk later. Why do I have the impression that we're forgetting something? Tamara asked aloud. Five. Thirteen e eyes as bright as the lights of the city. Seven minutes before Alan and company left the drinking banshee. Marissa came out of a bathroom stall, holding a smirk on her face. That's what I call a good makeout session, she beamed, glancing back at Matthew sitting in the toilet, bleeding from his slit throat. WHWHY, he barely said, as she grinned innocently at him. Because you dumped me first, silly, by choosing that prick of Marco instead of me. Whatever, you're not worth my time anymore. CYA. She waved goodbye as his ex-boyfriend's body turned into pixels. Humming, Marissa walked to the sinks and examined her reflection. This desperately needs a change of look. She opened her user interface, but before choosing the customization tab, she realized that Alan had shut down the communications minutes ago. I wonder if he's doing well. She checked her friend list, confirming that he was still online. At least Marco hasn't killed him yet. So that's good. She browsed through different hairstyles options that would change her appearance with a push of a button, until a party chat notification interrupted her, this time from one of her guild partners. She sighed before answering the call. Marshrissa. Helen's joyful voice was heard inside her head. How's my favorite jumpy person in all the Novus? Ribbit, ribbit. I'm not in the mood, Rosbiff. Unless you brought me something from Iagorn, I bought you a box of those twisty lollies you like. How about that, Buttercup? Oh, I really need one of those right now, Marissa said while trying out new hairstyles. She watched how she looked in a high ponytail before shaking her head. Long hair is more of Amelia's thing. She sighed. Have you received the news yet? Yep. Marco turned out to be a complete blighter. Marissa took a second to frown. A what now? Whatever. Damn Brit and her slangs. I know, right? What does Astrid think about all this? Does this mean that we're now disqualified from the Iagorns tournament? She was talking with the organizer, so she might make things work out. Tell me, are you still in the drinking banshee? Yes. Why? Marissa answered absently, opting to wear a pixie haircut. This will do for her. Wait, what did she say? She opened her friend list and checked Helen's current location, Lundorus, Shooting Stars HQ. Her guild master's location was, West Lundorus, the Drinking Banshee. Marissa then heard an explosion from outside that shook the entire room. That must be a strid. She surely honors her comet surname. Have you received the other news yet? Helen asked teasingly. 
What other news? I just checked the guild's vault. It seems that Jason stole it all before quitting. W what? Is that even possible? I mean, isn't it a failsafe so that a single user can't? Sweetie, you're asking too much for a game that encourages you to gain all the money you can get. Whatever means necessary. That bastard, Marissa made her best to remain calm, forming fists and walking in circles in that short space. This must have been Marco's plan all along. After all, he was the one that selected Jason as the guild's treasurer. Maybe, Helen said. But what can we do about it? That place is full of max levelers. Did Amelia know about this? That question lingered in her mind until she started tapping on her user interface with more force than necessary. You're suddenly too silent, Marshrissa. Where are you now? I'm on my way to pick you all up. I'll stay, Marissa said, making a white ceramic mask appear out of her inventory. Someone sounds ballsy. If you're planning on doing something risky, I'm in. No. I'll do it alone. Just don't tell Astrid any of this. Marissa hung up, wore the mask, and recited, Now you see me, look again. You think you know me? Try again. Another I am, malice I have. The artifact transformed her whole body into a shadowed silhouette, which she could customize with the press of buttons and sliders. She made herself shorter, turned her hair golden blonde, enlarged her breasts and buttocks, and her facial structure changed beyond what the regular avatar customization should allow. To finish her disguise, she wore a strapless dress and makeup, inspired by her big sister. This will be fun, she spoke in a deeper tone of voice. Minutes later, when she made sure that everyone had returned to their seats to continue feasting and drinking, she walked confidently among them while searching for her prey. It's a good thing that not everyone here is a gilder. She glanced at some of her male ex-guild partners being accompanied by ever nodding, easily excitable level 40 girls. Those women wore skimpy dresses, knew how to handle alcohol well, and had enormous boobs that would make her sister shake her head. Diggers. Girls that have quitted fighting, and now rely on others' pockets. I despise them with all my heart, but for tonight only, I'll thank their pitiful existence. H-U-H-U. Marissa glanced at her new boobs and grimaced. Even though I'm copying Amelia's boob size, I can't believe she's comfortable having these things all. She bumped against someone that snarled at her. Look where you're going, you bimbo. S sorry. Marissa stuttered, being face to face with her sister, who quickly examined her clothes with a dirty look. Pitiful, Amelia hissed after reading the number 42 above Marissa's head and walked away. Well, I never doubted my disguise, but it's always reassuring to know that it's working as intended. Although it's kind of painful to be at the other end of Amelia's trademark mean look. She exhaled. Finding Jason Foreman turned out to be a simple task, for he was shouting at the top of his lungs. Watching the golden bitch make a fool of herself in front of everyone was the funniest shit I've seen in a long time. There you are. Marissa stole a cup from one of the nearby tables, unnoticed, and strolled towards him. Jason continued laughing out loud, to the distress of his companion, Faiza Khalil, who was grimacing. Don't worry, girl, I'll take him out of your hands. Marissa intentionally tripped, spilling the drink on Jason's pants. Oh, how stupid of me. So embarrassing, she mumbled. Are you okay? Jason asked, helping her stand up. No, it's not. I was about to toast with my friends, but wet your pants instead, she looked him in the eye and giggled. Wait, that sounded kinda dirty, tee hee. I can fix this in a second, Jason said, tapping his user interface to change his clothes for an orange full suit. See? Why were you toasting again? Because you all got rid of that dreaded bitch, of course. He nodded, smirking. I like you. I'm Jason Foreman. What's your name, beautiful? Brittany. Are you a death bringer? I will, after tomorrow's ceremony. Where are your friends? Maybe you could introduce them to me. I was looking for them, but it seems that every single one of them has company. Everyone except for me. I hate that. I'm always the last one to get a date, or don't get one at all. Well, why don't you come with us then? My friend Phaser here, he turned around but she was nowhere to be found. And she's gone. Whatever, he smiled. Just as planned. Marissa smirked as he examined her cleavage. An hour later, back in the shooting star's headquarters, someone knocked at Alan's door. The guild master asked me to deliver this to you, sir, a male NPC said, as Alan stared at the clothes being offered to him. Is the color or the design not of your liking? 
Alan shook his head vigorously. N no, it's not that. Thank you. And thank Astrid too. You're welcome, the NPC said, bowing slightly. Astrid Bradford has also instructed me to tell you she'll be waiting for you at the main building's entrance at nine o'clock. Understood. I'll be there. After closing the door, Alan sat at the edge of his bed and continued to do what he was doing before, stare absently at his user interface and the current list of guild members. What a freaking mess. He then glanced at his new clothes, folded over the bed. I should take a shower first. Regulating the water temperature was easier than in the Santa Maria, it had way more space, and he could say it felt more pleasurable, but his mind was still in perpetual chaos. Not only Marco's words, but Amelia's comments tormented him, too. After the longest shower of his life, he returned to his bed, lied naked, and refused to dress up for half an hour. It's 8 colon 35 p.m. Almost time. But. I'm scared to get out of this room. I'm scared of seeing Astrid's face. I'm scared of not being able to find Ashley when I return. I'm scared of this freaking mission Isabella assigned me. I'm fucking scared of what Marco said. I don't want to leave this bed. Please, everyone, forget about me and leave me alone. But at 8.41 p.m. he stood up and examined the clothes, a red shirt, black formal pants, and black leather shoes. I don't think red really suits me, Astrid, but it would be rude if I didn't try them on at least once. He put them on in the traditional way and stared at his reflection. He looked taller and more robust than usual, which made him chuckle. He wanted nothing more than to break that mirror, but it was the property of the guild, not his. On his way to the promised place, he walked as if his legs were made of gum and that his arms were as big as a gorilla's. Ignoring the gazes of other guild members was even more difficult than before, due to what had happened earlier. I don't think that going out is a good idea, he thought, while looking at the street. I should tell Astrid that we should stay instead. She should assemble an emergency meeting with the remaining guild members and discuss what shooting stars should do next. He shut his eyes tight. And most important of all, I should. Kept you waiting, someone said behind him after tapping his shoulder. Alan turned around to find a girl wearing a light blue sleeveless sweater dress, thigh-high white stockings, and blue high heels. A long side braid rested over her left shoulder, adorned with a blue ribbon. Alan gasped as if he had seen an unearthly being. My goodness, Astrid. You look amazing. Thanks. You look handsome, too. She got closer to pick the helm of his shirt. Red really suits you, B but of course it does. Or maybe, he turned his voice deeper and stroked a simple model pose, putting one hand on his chin, I'm the one that makes this look good. Look at you. She giggled. Let me get my camera. No photos, please, or I'll have to charge you. Is giving you these clothes not enough? She asked, turning serious. At a loss of words, Alan stuttered until she grinned. I'm kidding, silly. You should have seen your face. I'll pay for them, though. Once I get some gold. No, Alan, she said, putting a palm on his chest. I gifted you all this because I knew that the day you came back, you'd only have your bronze armor. She smiled at him. They are a gift. Alan glanced back at the guild building. He knew that from one of its many windows, someone was peeking at the two, judging and cursing them. Astrid, come, Alan. We have reservations in a nice place downtown. We can't keep them waiting. I can't say no to you. He walked alongside her, promising to leave his gloomy attitude once they left the guild's property. But he was not able to. Do we really deserve a single moment of peace? Hey, Novus to Alan. Are you listening to what I'm saying? He blinked repeatedly. Sorry for zoning out, Astrid. It won't happen again. Were you saying? She squinted at him. Um, deja vu. Anyway, I was asking you, what do you think about this city? He looked at his surroundings. Despite being the same road he had already traversed alongside Tamara and Marissa, the lights of the city rendered the streets in a more gothic way as if this place was now inhabited by creatures of the night. And yet, I feel like nothing bad is lurking in every corner or alley. There were still vehicles and mounts passing through, but once they disappeared into the distance, a bubble filled with quietness formed around them. Only the sound of her heels kept them company. A reassuring sound. Confident, firm steps. I like this place, he finally responded. Glad to hear that. This will be your new hometown, after all. Ashley's face flashed in his mind. One thing at a time, Alan. 
while crossing a bridge, Astrid stopped halfway through and pointed at the other side of the lake in front of them. They could see Lundorus extending on the horizon. Look at it, Alan, she said, leaning on the railway. Isn't it beautiful? It's modeled after the greatest city ever built by my fellow countrymen, the British. Supposedly, she muttered the last bit. I'm pretty sure the developers took some liberties about certain landmarks. I'd like to explore it all someday. Count with me. I know Londoris like the back of my hand. This place has everything. It has a stadium, theaters, talent studios, and in all modesty, the best coffee shop in all the Novus. While she puffed out her chest in pride, Alan stared at a giant animated billboard, where the pink-haired pop star promoted a new soft drink brand. Forget your troubles drinking something cosmic. I wouldn't mind a sip of that, he said before Astrid pulled him from the wrist. We'll drink something better, I promise. I'd forgotten how soft her hand was, he thought, while staring at the back of her neck. Wait. Huh? Astrid's sweater dress had an open back, displaying her white, soft skin, all the way to her waist. This view is way more beautiful than admiring the city. He shut his eyes, feeling guilty for staring, and an unexpected calmness filled his heart. He continued walking blindly while Astrid led the way. Like back then. She could walk him through the deepest layers of hell, and he would feel safe. Yes. Although her hand is just a simulation of the real thing, I still feel that this is the place I belong to. Alan took a deep breath, noticing a surge of noise nearby. We must have arrived at Lundorus downtown. He returned his attention to the world surrounding him, meeting the gaze of people reading his current level. He then noticed that he could not see Astrid's. The realization caused him to feel a piercing pain in his chest. Here it is, she beamed, as he read the place's name, New Lundorus Cafe. But, Astrid, it says it's closed. It's okay, she said, pulling him inside. The sound of a bell signaled their entrance, and the small size of the place perplexed him, which could only accommodate five tables. At that moment, it was empty. I thought she'd bring me to a fancier place. But, this place is not bad at all. He filled his lungs with the smell of something being prepared with butter. It smells of coffee too, the real one, unlike that black liquid Isabella fed me. It reminds me of my father. A tall woman with dark skin greeted them from the counter. Hi, fellas. Table for two? Correct. A street beamed. We're here for your nicest table, please. Right this way, sugar, the woman nodded, pointing at the stairs leading to the first floor. A male NPC also stepped out of the kitchen to welcome them. Upstairs, the place looked like an apartment, but she did not stop there, pointing to another staircase to get to the rooftop. The establishment was at the edge of the lake they were admiring minutes ago. Alan stepped forward to look at it. The Novus moon and the lights of the city on the other side were being reflected on it. It's like seeing a sea of darkness, trying to engulf the forces of light. Alan, a street called, standing beside a table and two seats. A vase with a flower and a lighted candle waited for them at the center. He strolled to his chair, mouth ajar. You, prepared all this? Yes. Well, Mona did, but I told her to do it. Wait, do you own this place? What gave me away? She chuckled. Do you like it? My dad used to bring me to a cafe just like this when I was little, and I recreated it to be as close as possible from memory. Astrid caressed the black table, making Alan wonder if the texture of its wood was also engraved in her brain. There she was, smiling with pink-painted lips. Her crystalline, ice-blue eyes seemed lost in thought, and her sulky expression looked like something worthy of immortalizing in a painting. Thanks for sharing this with me, he said. Why are you thanking me? You haven't tasted the food yet. Please, take a seat, and don't let this place fool you. You can order whatever you want, and Mona will prepare it for you. Alan found a button on his right side of the table and skimmed through a menu. Okay then. If you insist. Hey, pancakes. It's been so long since I tasted them. Good idea. Let's have that. Wait, no, it's too late to eat that. Besides, it was a very childish choice. I already told you to order whatever you want. And who decides if having pancakes for dinner it's childish? Hearing Astrid's sudden serious tone made him question if she was joking again, but as the seconds passed, she did not giggle. I'll order strawberry pancakes. You? The same. Coffee? Yes, please. Astrid placed the orders in silence, while Alan formed fists under the table. 
Earlier this morning, I envisioned this to be a mature dinner with steak and wine, and I've already thrown it out of the window with painful ease. When did you get back? She asked. Yesterday. If you had messaged me, I could have traveled to Eunice Town to pick you up. He cleared his throat. What you said last night is true. Were you part of the Somnium Project? You never mentioned it. That's cool. Do you mind if I ask you? I'd rather not talk about it. Oh. S sorry. I'm not trying to be rude, it's just that. It's not a good story to share while dining. For the same reason, I'd rather not talk about what's happening with the guild right now. She pursed her lips. Although there is something I should address immediately. I'm so sorry for the way the guild treated you. It's okay. They're not around any. No, it's not okay. She cried, rising from her seat. She then kneeled in front of him in a knightly fashion. Seeing her act like that while wearing such a cute outfit was bizarrely contrasting. Although you're the original founder, those imbeciles knew nothing about respect, so I take full responsibility for it. They mocked you, they tortured you, and, Astrid, please, stand up. What's the meaning of this? I'm nobody. She's the guild master. This shouldn't be like this. I swear that I'll make them pay, Astrid said with closed teeth, showing a gleam in her eyes that resembled Amelia Laflamme's killing intent. He rushed to take her by the arms. What happened last night was not your fault. Even though you were their leader, you can't control how people think or what they decide to do. She opened her eyes wide. But they listened to Marco, didn't they, she said, frowning. If only I was a stronger leader. I don't want to even imagine how much weight you've carried under your shoulders all these years. He gritted his teeth and grabbed her by the shoulders. How can you say all that? You made it possible for shooting stars to reach the top. I've seen what you've built. That HQ is amazing, and you're surrounded by strong and skillful people like Tamara and Marissa. Besides, you said it yourself, remember, in front of Kathleen? You got rid of the bad weed. In a year, shooting stars will be stronger and better than ever. Do you really think so? Astrid looked up at him with watery eyes. I believe in you. Oh, Alan. I'm so glad that you came back. She embraced him tight. Although Marco told me that Astrid is the seventh most powerful user in all the Novus, her arms are so skinny and fragile. If he hugged her back, his hands would touch her exposed back, and trying to hold his breath was impossible, for her lavender aroma was alluringly intoxicating. Don't do this Astrid. I'm not used to being near a woman just yet. If you hold me like this, I'll... Everything's going to be all right now that you're here, she continued. I just know it. W what is she implying? Prove that you can be a strong-willed co-leader, those were Marissa's words, right? But no, no way. Uh, and? Marco used to date her half a year ago. That other sentence hit him like a brick. Oh, right. I wish. I could just forget that. Here are your orders, m the male NPC with koala ears said, approaching them. Red-faced, Astrid stepped back and wiped what seemed to be tears. Let's dig in, Alan. Yes, he replied quietly. Meanwhile, at the drinking banshee, Marissa Laflamme, disguised as Brittany, had encountered her first challenge. This freaking pig. Just like Kathleen says, more people, more fun. Jason Foreman said, laughing out loud, surrounded by three other girls. Although I'm not really trying to seduce him for real, it really stinks that he didn't settle just with me. But it's all right. I have an ace under my sleeve. She pulled out three pills from her inventory and waited for the other gals to leave their cups on the table. And now, thanks to my sharpshooting passive skill, I should be able to. Using her thumb, she shot each pill inside her target's cups, five feet away and smiled when the first girl sipped. Perfect. 5. 14. E hardcore gold farming. The pancakes and coffee tasted better than anything Alan had eaten during his time outside, but he could not bring himself to smile. Because I know something is wrong. Alan swallowed, peeping at her. She continued being gorgeous and talkative. Could it be me who's at fault? Looking at the distance, he found a familiar yet alien world to him. Alan Warden. Isabella's electronic voice echoed through his mind. It is time you know what happened to the Santa Maria's crew. His mind tricked him into seeing the lively Londoris in flames, the lake beneath it bathed in a deathly orange light. Such a vision made him feel nauseous. He put a hand against his face, getting her attention. Are you okay? Damn it. Not now. What did you say about a dungeon? 
he asked, meeting her wide grin. I bought one, just for you to train. That she what? But, how would that? Don't worry. I have it all planned. I hired a group of level boosters, who are all nice people, and will help you reach max level as soon as possible. It took me two years to reach level 100, but thanks to these professionals and my weaponsmith, who'll constantly provide you with new gear, I'm sure you'll do it in eight months. Eight months, huh? The period I spent outside. He glanced at his sleeve over the table. These clothes, this dungeon she's mentioning. Astrid's NPC picked Alan's dishes and replaced them with a cup of wine, and a juicy steak with salad. Enjoy, the servant said, while Alan glanced at his koala ears. What's with those fluffy teddy-like ears? They don't suit him at all. Female NPCs are way cuter. In the meantime, Tamara will take the co-leader's position, and, meantime, you promised you wouldn't zone out anymore. Or are you daydreaming about what your new equipment will look like? She giggled. You'll look cool, I promise. I said that Tamara will be the co-leader until you're ready. But, Astrid, what if the rest of the guild doesn't want me in that position? What do you mean? W well. Only a day after my arrival, a third of the guild has quit. And the rest will surely think that a more experienced guilder should take the spot. I shouldn't be entitled to become the co-leader just because I came up with the guild's name three years ago. Astrid studied Alan's distressed face for a moment before slowly shaking her head. Alan, she said, turning her voice deeper, giving him another instance of what beautiful but dangerous eyes looked like. Whoever blames you for what happened will have to deal with me. That would only make more people leave. Good. It's better that they leave now than later. Alan felt dizzy. Was it caused by the wine? No, I haven't taken a sip yet. Alan Warden, this information is classified. This threat, lurking who knows where, this whole guild drama, and this new Astrid. This all business Astrid. Everything is so. I'm just trying to provide you with everything that has been taken away from you, Astrid said, placing a hand near his. After all, you had to go outside. So it's not your fault that the power gap grew so much between us. Something she said made him shiver. Oh, outside? You were in the real world, weren't you? It's okay, you can trust me. Did your Creopod fail? Did someone force you to log out? Did something happen to the ship? It was hiding in the ship, Alan, it followed us from Earth. I was in a coma, just as you said. Astrid stood in silence while reaching out to hold his right hand. Alan was admiring her smooth skin and blue nail polish until noticing that she was observing the marks on his palm. Scars I didn't have before. He pulled his hand away, startling her. Alan, she called as if her face reflected physical pain. Do you think I haven't noticed that you look older? More tired? Even your hair looks different. Those statements inevitably made him sneer. Come on, Astrid, how could you remember how I looked back then? We only knew each other for what, two weeks? And for you, it's been three years since then. What are you saying? Seven days in the real world, and a week here. I remember every single thing we did together back then. She looked away while playing with her braid. I even remember that, technically, we never broke up. Are you talking about our little week as an almost couple? She lost the color of her cheeks. A almost coup, is that how you see it? Something inside him broke. If not, why did you date that prick, then? Seeing the surprise in her eyes made Alan hide his face with both hands. What's wrong with me? I said I shouldn't be entitled to be the leader a minute ago, just to contradict myself saying this. After a moment of true silence, as if the world itself had held its breath too, she called him softly, Alan. It's true. We dated for two weeks only, but I assure you that nothing. There is no need to explain, Alan said, feeling that his throat suddenly got dry. As I said, what happened between us was purely informal. Not to me, she blurted out, but seemed to regret it immediately biting her lower lip. I'll understand if you can't forgive this transgression. Stop being so formal, Astrid, he whispered. Meanwhile, the black metallic beetle that Amelia Laflamme had created hours ago continued to be attached to Alan's clothes, unnoticed. Having accomplished its purpose, Amelia snapped her fingers, and the black speaker in the middle of the room got consumed by flames that dissipated quickly, not leaving a single trace of ash. Glad that was over, Faiza Khalil said, yawning, hiding her face inside her panda hoodie. Did you find that conversation boring, my dear? Kathleen Mayer asked from behind her desk, in a sweet tone of voice. 
To me, this was truly fascinating and very revealing. She crossed her eyes with Marco. I didn't believe the golden bitch could feel attached to someone else besides her huge ass, I mean ego. She giggled. Fascinating? I'd use another word, but it's true, Amelia Laflon thought, as Marco placed a hand on her shoulder. You did a great job, he whispered in her ear. Glad to be of help, Amelia replied quietly. Yeah, even though I omitted the part that I also heard your conversation with Ghost from hours ago. His cryptic, after using that nightmare spell on me, how much did you see? Followed by Marco's, I saw everything. Ark. That just fuels my imagination. And now this. Astrid sold us that coma story, just to throw it out of the window. This is so intriguing. Until this day, I hadn't thought about the outside world. We're plugged into a machine, right? How could I forget that this is nothing but a well-constructed illusion? She looked around Kathleen's office, which could easily be mistaken for a preteen's dorm room. The color pink covered the walls, as well as the couches they were sitting on, and the soft pillows with lace embellishments. In a corner, a shrine dedicated to the Nova's most popular idol, featuring a poster of her, a figurine, and a mannequin displaying one of her outfits. Yes, this is all fake. All, wait, is that an official Miss Cosmica outfit? Something she actually wore at a concert or event. From her desk, Kathleen caught her admiring the mannequin. Yes, it's genuine, Kathleen said, giggling. Behind her, the only serious-looking part of the room, the Deathbringer's emblem on the wall, with a menacing skull inside a diamond. Sorry for staring, Amelia mumbled. It's okay. It warms my heart to see a new fellow cosmic fan entering my guild. Tee hee. Good job getting on the new boss good side, Phaser whispered to Amelia. Unlike that poor thing. Look at her. She's still traumatized. Amelia glanced at Karen, sitting in an armchair next to them. Her fractures caused by fighting Astrid had magically healed, but he had remained unnervingly quiet since then. One of Kathleen's guilders had to heal her since Matthew is dead. He won't respawn in a day and no one knows how it happened. Phaser blames Tamara, but I'm sure it was Marissa's doing. So, after hearing this, pantomime, Marco interjected, standing up. Was it worth it? He's upset. I know him too well not to notice it. That conversation revolved around his embarrassing brief history with the bitch after all. What should we do with this info? Kathleen asked, humming and doing a pondering expression. She then clapped, beaming as a child would. My sweet prince, I think that's obvious. The golden bitch is severely wounded, so let's deal the finishing blow. Seeing her grin made Amelia shiver. Only Kathleen Mayer could say something that terrible and look seemingly pure at the same time. Sweetheart? Kathleen turned to Karen. Show your friends what you got, so they can see that you didn't kiss the ground in vain. H-U-H-U. -h -u. Karen took her sweet time opening her user interface and pulling something out of her inventory. She showed it aloft, smirking. Amelia could not see it until it gleamed goldenly. I is that. A strand of hair, Karen said, returning to her usual prideful self. No way. Phaser gasped. Did you get it that time? When she threw you down, Amelia's heart raced and felt her stomach twisting. There is only a spell that requires something like that. She turned to Marco, who was maintaining a poker face. You're not planning on using it, do you? She asked him, but Kathleen replied, giggling. The opportunity presented itself, dear. We'll end this with a grand finale. Alan Warden doesn't have the skills to see through illusions, so it must be done far from any nearby shooting fart, I mean star. Can I leave then? Phaser jumped out of her seat and walked to the door, hands inside her pockets. Marco knows I'm not good at that shit in the slightest. Kathleen glanced at Marco, who nodded. Sure, sweetie. Thanks for coming anyway. After the door closed, Marco spoke softly. If that's your wish, my snow princess, you can count on them. He pointed at the two remaining girls. They're my most reliable partners. He crossed eyes with Amelia first, as she felt her hands getting sweaty. Wait, hold on. I. I'll do it. Karen raised her hand. It won't be a problem at all. Thirsty for vengeance, eh? Kathleen nodded. We'll leave Londoris tomorrow, so remain here while you wait for the perfect opportunity. Can't wait. Karen beamed. I won't disappoint you, Guild Mars. Are you being serious?
Amelia interrupted, locking eyes with Kathleen. What do you mean? She asked, smiling. We've already disrupted the shooting star's progress. Their rank is so low now that they might never reach the top 50s again. Astrid's credibility? In the gutter. Word that she's a terrible leader is already spreading out through the Navinet. Amelia, Marco whispered, grabbing her by the shoulder, but she stood up. And speaking of Alan Warden, we have already given him a lesson, especially me. I humiliated him so many times that the guy might have developed pyrophobia by now. But this? What you're suggesting comes out as plain petty. Kathleen squinted as she rose from her seat. What was your name again? Amelia Laflon. Tell me, Amelia. Were you present when the golden bitch showed up? Kathleen asked, circling her desk to stand in front of her. Yes. I watched it all from a window. Let me ask you this, then. Who do you think won that fight? And I'm not talking about the ass whooping your friend got, Kathleen said, stepping forward. You mean when you confronted her? Amelia cleared her throat. You, of course. The whole place was filled with your allies. Besides Tamara, Astrid was alone. Why didn't I give the order to attack her, then? Well, Amelia could not continue talking, for Kathleen grabbed her by the cheeks. Those fingers, although delicate, were as cold as ice sticks. Because I was the one that lost that fight. Kathleen hissed. She was in a safe zone, so my guild could overpower her easily, right? But you're forgetting I was repressed too. Without being able to cast my defenses, that mad dog could have gone for my throat as soon as I gave a signal. Do you have any idea how much gold I'm holding? I'll give you a hint. Enough to prevent any deathmatch against my dreaded swore enemy if I can. Kathleen let go to examine Amelia's face, which had turned blue and displayed frostbitten finger marks on her cheeks. So, let's recapitulate, shall we, dear? Kathleen continued. Not only did she come to the welcoming party I prepared for all of you, uninvited, but she also attacked three of my guilders and threatened to waste half my gold. And why was that? Because that level 5 cockroach decided to show here. So yeah, pardon me if you see me doing this out of spite. Her bug is still planted and active, Marco said from his place. She'll keep helping us with this quest. Isn't that right, Amelia? Yes. She half smiled, without taking her eyes off Kathleen's. I'll keep monitoring the cockroach and tell Karen when the best opportunity to approach him arrives. I'll count on you then. Kathleen smiled at her. Amelia, Marco called. Can I have a word with you? Of course. Excuse me. Mm. Amelia did a curtsy in front of Kathleen and caught Karen snickering at her. Outside, Marco led the way through the corridor, and just as they took a corner, he grabbed her by the arm. What the hell is your problem? We're just starting and you're already questioning her? I used to question Astrid all the time. And just before you say she's not, why are you doing this then? He asked with closed teeth, making Amelia drop her shoulders. Marco, what are we doing here? I thought your dream was to start your own guild. What changed? A lot, actually, he replied softly, stepping back and readjusting his tie. If half a year ago I said that I intended to lead a new guild, it was before I knew better. Just look at what happened to shooting stars. We just quitted, and they quickly dropped from the top 100. It didn't matter if a street is in the top individual ranking. This proved my theory. This late in the endgame, merging guilds, it's the only viable option, but at the cost of doing whatever we want. Amelia looked around and whispered, even though I can't stand her, Astrid would never do something like this. Are you really okay with this plan? The way I see it, it's all strategic. These are no longer quarrels between rival groups, but fierce competitions between private companies. So if you aspire to be a professional, I suggest you. No. I ask you to chill. Chill, she chuckled. Seriously? What, too soon? All right then, she sighed. Go. I'll apologize to Kathleen tomorrow. In the meantime, I have a date with the bar. She half smiled. Don't lose sight of our mission, he said, turning back. Good night. As he walked away, Amelia's grin turned upside down. First that he stole my golden position, and now this. What a load of murd, she said to herself while two women passed her by, rushing towards the women's restroom. Hum? Something they ate? Wait. That's not possible. 5. 15. In ever follow the will of your D. 
What the hell is this? One of the women accompanying Jason Foreman cried from her bathroom stall, followed by the sound of her bowels loosening. Was the sushi bad? You can't get intoxicated like that in the Novus, stupid. Someone drugged us. There's no other explanation. Oh, God. Whoever did this is dead, then. Just try it, Marissa Laflom, disguised as Brittany, giggled from the sinks while checking her outfit and makeup. All set. Now I just have to convince Jason to get out of here, and she heard a liquid dripping beside her, and for a second, she thought someone was pissing on the sinks. Turning to her left, she found the third woman fighting for Jason's attention, pouring down her drink. Mert. Diarrhea pills? Seriously, the dark-skinned woman asked, squinting. They're fine, aren't they? Brittany shrugged. They left the battlefield with their wallets intact. But I won't be able to say the same about you. Brittany stepped forward until getting into the woman's personal space, but she seemed unfazed. Are you going to get rid of me, too? Um? She half smiled. Why bother with the shit pills, then? Marissa stared into that woman's hazel eyes and clicked her tongue. What's your name? Joanna. You? Brittany. What do you want? The same as you. A piece of that pie called Jason. Joanna exhaled. Unfortunately, I'm not as skillful as you to get rid of the competition, but I can play along if it benefits. Joanna stopped talking at the sight of Amelia Laflom entering. The redhead peered at them for a second, before going to the sinks to wash her hands. Let's go, Joanna whispered, holding Brittany by the hand. If you're planning on stealing from him, may I advise against it, she continued, outside. He might not seem like one, but he's a max leveler, and currently under the protection of Kathleen Mayer. You know, the owner of this place. Are you saying that I wouldn't be able to do it? You don't have to say, gal. Even I know it will be difficult. The guy has a passive skill called deep pockets. He liked to brag about it all the time. I'm saying that it's super risky. Joanna half smiled, stopping in the middle of the corridor. You said that you could play along if it benefited you, Brittany said. So you want to cut? If you had returned to the room on your own, that'd have made him suspicious. But if the two of us work together for the same goal, I wouldn't mind splitting the spoils, but I'm doing this on behalf of the guild, Marissa thought, closing her fist behind her back. All right then, Brittany said, raising her chin, but it won't be a 50 to 50 collaboration. What do you mean? I was thinking of a 70 to 30 partnership. Hearing that, the soft-spoken Joanna showed anger in her eyes for the first time. What are you talking about? I'm doing half of the job here. After doing this I won't be able to show my face in this city again, you know? So I require a handsome compensation for this. Sure, but I was the one that got rid of those bitches, I'm the one with an actual plan to get this moron's money, and I'm the only one perfectly capable of dealing with him in case things go south. Joanna squinted at her. Are you a max leveler? Brittany only smiled at her, while a large, muscular man passed them by. Hi, ladies. Hi, the two said in unison, grinning. Are you guys having fun? If not, maybe I could fix that, he said, checking their bodies and nodding approvingly. What do you say? Oh, William the Stoic, go eat a dick, you fucker. You were always after my sister and never treated me nice. Brittany feigned an apologetic smile while grabbing Joanna's wrist. I'm sorry, handsome, but we already got a date. Maybe some other time. I wouldn't mind waiting. He winked at her. I'll be at the bar if you change your mind. Oh, I'd love to come back for your throat. Sadly, right now I'm after a bigger fish. What a dick, Brittany whispered to Joanna as they returned to their private room. What? I'd swap Jason for him in a heartbeat. Joanna chuckled, making Brittany grimace. But his biceps are as big as his head. If he gets over you, you'll die crushed. I'd die happy between his big, hard muscles, then. Brittany grunted. I prefer dying asphyxiated by a pair of nice, thick thighs. They stopped in front of the door, holding their breath. A sign read, Iris Room. So, 50 to 50. Okay? Joanna reminded. And don't try anything stupid afterwards. I have powerful friends you won't like to meet. I haven't agreed to that deal yet, Brittany replied, grabbing the door's knob, but Joanna pulled her arm. I want to cut this bitch's throat so badly. Damn it, Helen. Why did you make me promise to never kill someone weaker than me? Let go, Brittany whispered, not showing a glimpse of anger in her voice or face. 
For now, let's enter. If we make him wait more, he'll end up looking for other bitches to impress. Do you have Incogni installed? We can keep chatting there. She smirked at Joanna. While maintaining our anonymity intact, Joanna let out a sigh and manipulated her user interface while making a grimace. Add me 153,597G. In a matter of seconds, both were connected to a private incognito chat room. Done, Brittany said, opening the door for her, revealing Jason Foreman beaming at them from his seat. I knew ladies liked going to the restroom in groups, but this is ridiculous. He laughed out loud, before frowning. Where are the other ladies? We got rid of them, Joanna blurted out, taking strides to sit on his lap. There you what? he asked, eyes wide open, at the same time that Brittany tried to hide her bewilderment. What is she thinking? They were being a nuisance, Joanna said, turning to Brittany. Isn't that right? Yes, those bitches got what they deserved. Brittany responded, sitting beside him. Don't feel bad for them. Those morons tried to get rid of us first. How unfortunate, Jason whispered. But it gives us a chance to get to know each other better, then, sure thing. Brittany grinned, but her lips turned upside down as she heard a very popular song playing on their private projection. My he art goes boom boom when you're arooned. So don't leave. Boom boom. Can we do something about the music? We've heard that song, what, a million times already? No way. It's my favorite song, Joanna hissed. You like Miss Cosmica? You? Brittany let her frown show her skepticism, before sneering. Wait, it shouldn't surprise me. What's with that reaction? It's even weirder that you don't. Joanna replied, squinting. Jason, who stood between the staring contest, chuckled nervously before getting out of there quickly. Um, ladies, if you excuse me. I need to. Is it a bad thing to be a fan of pop music? Joanna continued as soon as the door closed, making Brittany shake her head. Forget that. We should talk about our next goal. Do you have any idea where he could spend a large sum of money in one go? Joanna exhaled. So you can steal that instead? Good job. I'd have stopped talking to you if you hadn't come to that conclusion on your own. Bite me, Joanna grunted. Brittany giggled as she greedily grabbed a fistful of nachos, while rolling her eyes at the sight of Joanna watching the screen showing Miss Cosmica's last concert. Iagorn isn't far from here, Joanna muttered, entranced by the dancing and the overflowing energy of the idol. Too bad I couldn't go. Wait. I could use this. Brittany opened their private chat and added a photo. When Joanna heard the new message notification, she reluctantly tapped on it and jolted after inspecting the picture. Where did you get this? She cried. I know a friend that knows her manager, Brittany said, shrugging, while dipping another nacho on cheese sauce. Um. So good. Shaking her head, Joanna stared at the photo of a pink-haired girl absently opening her mouth wide to eat a submarine sandwich, and compared it with the pop star dancing and singing in the projection in front of her. This can't be her. She must be a lookalike, she muttered, as if the image of her beloved idol had been tarnished. Photos and videos can't be manipulated inside the Novus, Brittany quoted like it was textbook information, loudly munching on chips. An artifact that let you change your appearance have their limits and can't replicate an existing face. So, this is my last offer. Accept your 30% and I may arrange a way to have a little peek of Miss Cosmica off stage. She grinned. We may be able to see her doing something embarrassing again, just like this. Wouldn't you like that? Do you really think I would fall for something like this? Although Joanna was wrinkling her nose, she continued checking the photo. 30%? How much would a guy like that have in his account, anyway? Maybe close to 10 million. What? Hey, dolls, I'm back. Jason grinned, kicking the door open. Have you worked out your differences yet? Don't kick the doors, Joanna said sternly. Eh, sorry. Leave him alone. What are you, his mom? Brittany said, hugging him as soon as he took a seat. Don't take the fun out of this room, Joe. Hey, don't take him all for yourself. Joanna cried, hugging his other arm. And don't make me look like a party pooper. I agreed to the threesome, didn't I, T threesome? Jason gasped, gazing at both of them and their curved bodies. What is it, Jay? Joanna asked softly in his ear. Don't tell me you've never been in one. Don't worry, sweetie, 
I can guide both of you. Her hand ran through his chest, all the way to his stomach. Sure, whatever, Marissa said, pouting. But, Daddy, keep in mind that I won't move a finger until you buy me a pair of new shoes. Brit. Joanna cried. We talked about this. What, what is it? Jason asked. Sorry Jay, Joanna said apologetically. I told her we shouldn't bother asking you to buy us stuff. But she won't listen. Hey, my motto's always been wear your heart on your sleeve. Brittany shouted, squeezing Jason's arm against her breasts. And if I am going to have my first threesome ever, I want to get something good first to sweeten the deal. Jason's astonishment turned into laughter. I certainly like the sound of that. Do you want something too? He asked Joanna. Shoes? Clothes? Joanna smirked. There's this mount I always wanted. A.M. mount? Jason stuttered, working out how much gold that would cost. Not fair. Brittany cried, leaning forward to confront her while positioning her hand on Jason's thigh. If you're getting a new mount, I want one too. A feline one. Jason snickered, changing the expression of his eyes. Why would you want a cat? I had one for over a year and it sucked ass. I sold it for cheap as soon as I could. Brittany stared at the deep of his eyes. Oh. I'm starting to understand why you stole the gold. What do you suggest, then? I won't know until I see it, Jason groaned while adjusting his glasses. But it will be a thousand times better than a stupid cat, I'm sure of it. Joanna got close to him, caressing his chin. Jay, if you need a mount too, why don't we all go to the best place in the city to buy one? Yeah, a mount that shouts, look at me, or, don't mess with me, Brittany added, whispering into his ear. Jason stood up slowly and adjusted his jacket. You know what? That sounds like a good idea. Look at all these magnificent creatures. Brittany said in awe, as she twirled, gazing at the creatures displayed. The beasts were programmed to be docile while waiting to be bought, and some of them displayed unique quirks in the hopes of attracting customers. The feline mounts licked their paws gently while purring. The canine ones wagged their tails, feral-looking wolves being the most popular. The group ignored that aisle, looking for something more exotic. I can't wait to see what this jerk chooses at the end. Marissa thought while pretending to be captivated by an adorable giant mouse sniffing its surroundings. Is that what you really want? Jason approached, sneering. It doesn't even fly. There's something alluring about ground mounts too, daddy, she said, leaning against the displaying glass. If you forget to plant your feet back into the ground every once in a while, you could risk losing your way back home. Is that such a bad thing? Jason scoffed before leaving her behind. The girl sprinted and caught his arm playfully. What do you do for a living that you have so much gold to spare? Are you a death bringer? I thought you approached me because you knew that. Not all the people drinking in that bar are gilders, you know. There was a high-end potion merchant too. Very wealthy. And why did you choose me? I already had company. What made you think you had a chance? You're more handsome than the merchant, and I like challenges. Jason chuckled while adjusting his glasses. Hearing that from a pretty lady like you is flattering, even though you're just a gold digger. Is that such a bad thing, she asked softly. Would you rather pay an NPC to satiate your needs? It would come out cheaper. Nope, NPC prostitutes can't hold a long conversation. They end up blurting out things like, service time is over, if you would like to keep talking, it will cost extra. Blah, blah, of course you know, you pig. I could sneak away without saying a word by tomorrow morning, you know, but you would miss out on my excellent strawberry pancakes, she giggled. Buy me a good mount and I'll consider staying a little longer. There you are, Jason said aloud to Joanna, who did not keep her eyes off a purple hippogriff. Its head resembled a crow, and its feathers looked glossy and smooth. Excellent choice. It really fits you. You'll look magnificent riding it. Can I have it? She asked in a soft tone of voice. Jason gestured to the NPC vendor to approach him. Sold. Right away, sir, the male NPC said, making a system screen appear in front of Jason, which he tapped absently without looking at the asking price. The display cage opened with a buzzing sound, and the beast got out, letting Joanna caress its beak. It truly is beautiful, she said as the mount disappeared into a spectacle of glimmering pixels and turned into a jewel, which hovered for a couple of seconds before she snatched it. She then turned around and rushed to kiss Jason. Brittany stared at them while they smooched for what seemed like an eternity. 
Even if I have to pretend that I want one of these, I don't find any of them appealing. I really love my Lynx. She could remember the day Estrid bought them in bulk. We need to choose something that says, here they come, they are shooting stars. So, who likes cats? Brittany exhaled. I and Amelia were static after getting our own. She looked around until something glowing on the far end of the storage room caught her attention. She strolled while looking at it captivated. Of luminescent red feathers, eternally fluttering its wings to show its enormous size. It pridefully looked at a distance, making any onlooker fantasize about riding it into the horizon. Truly splendid, Marco whispered over Brittany's shoulder. What, is he implying he's going to buy me this one? This must be the most expensive out of the bunch. Well, that's what I've come for. Yeah, truly unique and gorgeous. Is it a phoenix, she asked the NPC. That is correct. He is the emperor's messenger, dot. Even if he's thinking of getting it for himself, I should convince him. You should definitely buy it, Brittany said, hugging his arm. Anyone mounting this would become a head turner. A leader, an emperor. How much? Jason asked in a dry tone. Oh, so you asked for the price this time. That would be eight million gold, sir. Jason exhaled and took a couple of steps forward while being watched by his two companions. Brittany nodded at Joanna, who half smiled and hugged him by the neck. What is it, Jay? Can't afford it. That's not the issue, he said with a conscious expression on his face. I'm thinking if it really would be a suitable gift. What better gift than this? Brittany said, whispering into his ear. The person who receives this will be very pleased with you. Jason held his breath before glancing at the NPC. The ladies have spoken. Very good, sir. You are now the proud owner of a legendary grade mount, the NPC said while handing him the display to pay. I could never dare to use something like this in public, Jason said, pointing at a corner. I'll take the eagle hippogriff too, the blue one. I'm lost. Is he going to give the phoenix to me, then? Brittany waited for Jason to grab the red gem containing the legendary bird while she licked her lips. He gazed at her and smirked. Here. He tossed it in Joanna's direction. The perfect present for Kathleen Mayer. Tell her that this is a gift from every ex-shooting star now under her command. Understood, Jay, Joanna said, staring deep into Brittany's eyes. Oh. Can I choose my mount already? Brittany asked, half smiling, still pretending, as a cracking glass sound was heard from above. She looked up to a skylight, which shattered into a thousand sharp pieces. She dodged most of them, only getting a slight cut on her left arm as she watched a tall man landing in front of her. William, the stoic. Announcement. Click here to buy it. 13. 16. He never listened to a gold digger. She watched in horror at the man wearing full plate armor, a shield almost as big as him, and a hammer, which rested on his right shoulder. I told you we would see each other again, beautiful, he said, smirking. If he's here, that means that my cover-up got blown some time ago. Brittany looked at Joanna, standing beside a mocking Jason. She's not a gold digger, she is a deathbringer. That is why she was keeping her distance from the other bitches cuddling with Jason back at the bar. Joanna was not waiting her turn to seduce him, she was keeping an eye on him. Have you figured out what's happening, shooting star? Joanna asked, sneering, before turning to Jason. Can I keep my grimery, Jay? Did you already name it? Jason chuckled. Of course, sweetheart. Consider it a gift of gratitude for warning me about this little bitch. And considering only 15 members remained in that joke of a guild, it's pretty obvious who this is. There are only two shooting stars crazy enough to try out something like this, so get rid of that disguise already, it's not helping you. Fine, Marissa said, removing her mask. Her breasts and curves diminished, and her dress shrank to fit her original slim figure. Jason gasped. Marissa? Was that you? William the Stoic snickered. I told you that Helen would never use a disguise. She has a way of doing things. Whatever. Jason shouted while tapping his menu window. There, you won. Thank you, William said after verifying that he had received 200,000 gold. This is bad, Marissa thought as she unsheathed her twin daggers. I could kill Jason in the blink of an eye, but I don't know what Joanna has under her sleeve. I bet she's hiding the fact that she's a high leveler. And then there's this guy. She stared at him. Although his posture looked relaxed, there was not a weak spot visible on his armor. 
even though he's not blessed by an active guild boost, even Astrid would need to punch him at least thrice to kill him. The NPC had started a lockdown, forcing all the mounts on the shop to turn into jewels and get teleported to the owner's inventory. This is private property, any damage done to this facility will be. Shut up! William crushed him with his hammer, turning him into pixels. I don't see how you'll escape from this, little bitch, he said, before nodding to Jason. Major wind charm, swift and furious. Jason cast at the knight, who could fill an increase in his speed. There you have it, big guy. Hey, Marissa, remember what Astrid used to say? Not even the sharpest of blades can do anything against the sturdiest of shields. So have fun fighting him. Meanwhile, Marissa was casting a boost of her own. Minor wind boost, haste. Does this mean you have renounced that deal we had? She asked Joanna. Did you expect me to believe such a lie? She sneered. What is she talking about? Jason asked. Forget it, it's something unimportant. I've been waiting for this for so long. William shouted, charging at her. Show me what you got, you little whore. William's hammer cracked the establishment's floor and part of the wall in the distance in front of him. Marissa jumped aside and threw a dagger in Jason's direction, who freaked out. No, no. Joanna reached out her hand and quick cast, ice wall. The instantaneous shield shattered after receiving an explosive impact. What was that? Does she use bombs? She grunted while shaking her hand. Quick casting had taken a toll on her mana pool and her hand. Ah, sorry, Joanna, Jason, who was covering his face with both arms, said in an apologetic tone of voice. Since I thought that this was Helen, I didn't tell you about Marissa's unique skill. She can throw weapons and make them explode. So? Joanna shrugged while watching the aforementioned assassin dodging William's attacks. That alone shouldn't be capable of destroying my ice wall. It has to do something with how the explosive damage is calculated, Jason said, adjusting his glasses and sighing. I don't know the exact details, but the more valuable the weapon is, the more damage it does. That may sound obvious, but she can throw jewelry and get the same results, so it's more complicated than that. What a waste. Cast a defensive charm on your friend, Joanna said while casting. I'm going to make some rain. Major ice crafting. A group of dark clouds started manifesting inside the building. Right away. Jason nodded. Earth charm. That won't be necessary. William shouted after shielding himself from another exploding dagger. Time to buff, now. All right. Jason switched the element of his already cast magic circle. Time conjuring, before I am late. Jason cast, making everything inside a 300 feet radius move at a fourth of its speed. How Illinois sewing. Joanna spoke slowly, finishing her casting, making rain ice shards not affected by the time manipulation. The shattered pieces of ice created a chilly fog that obscured everything inside the shop. We have the her. Joanna chanted victory, raising a hand in slow motion, but her smile disappeared at the sight of something glimmering in midair, traveling to her chest. The dagger exploded on contact, reducing 70% of her HP and 20% of Jason's. Low OKOUT, he cried out to William, unaffected by the constant hits of sharp ice against his armor. It is okay why. William announced, showing he had captured Marissa. I have her. The time conjure and ice spell ran out as Marissa struggled to get away from the knight's grab, who was holding her by the neck. Hey, I saw your sister walking out of the drinking banshee two hours ago, he said. Would you mind sharing where she is? I id don't t hing y o u l s c h r a again, a asshole. Too bad. She really was my type. Before William could try to break her neck, he felt his gauntlets getting warmer. In a couple of seconds, the heat burned his hand, making him lose his grip. You little. Marissa got free as the gauntlet exploded. Only 4% damage, damn it. I have fantasized about kicking his ass so many times, but reality is harsher. Now that Lord Marco is with Kathleen, I may have a chance with Amelia, don't you think? William shouted, trying to crush her under his foot. You could be my sister-in-law. It pains me to say it, but you're right. She has always had shit taste in men. Shadow crafting, three shades of me. Marissa split into three in front of William's eyes. Damn it, when did she have the time to channel this, he muttered as he grabbed his hammer from the ground. 
One clone dashed to attack Jason but got impaled by a stalagmite of ice that sprouted from the ground. Ice crafting, a blooded Joanna cast, glaring at the clone. Don't underestimate us, brat. Never, the clone said, smirking, before her entire body glowed, exploding and engulfing Joanna and Jason on fire. After the dust dissipated, Jason crouched to grab his partner by the shoulder. Are you okay? Yeah, you were right about casting an earth charm on us. This bitch is a pain to deal with, Joanna said, noticing that only 10% of her remaining HP had been taken this time. You know, Jason started saying while watching William fight the two remaining clones. We should go. She already knows she can't win. She'll only get more desperate. If you're fine with leaving your partner, let's go then. We can't let her have the Phoenix Mount. That's the sign that this has come to an end. The real Marissa thought, watching them rush to the exit. Hey, William, let's end this, the two remaining Marissa said in unison, dashing towards him. Agreed. Let me put you down for good. He smashed the first with his hammer and bashed the other with his shield. So much for the self-proclaimed best PvP killer. I didn't have to use any of my special techniques. Rogues are not meant to have direct confrontations, the Marissa under William's hammer said, glowing. He backtracked while tossing the weapon, expecting it to explode, but only the clone below it did. Was that not the real one, he muttered, looking for her in his surroundings until he glanced at a glow coming from his shield. Marissa had been holding onto the shield since the moment she was struck with it. Are you just brawn and no brains? You couldn't even notice the extra weight, or am I just that petite? Go to hell. William shouted, tossing the shield upwards. Unique skill, rush durability, she muttered before kicking the shield towards the fleeing couple. Jason glanced at the glowing shield making its way towards him and groaned. You fucking. The entire building exploded, taking the lives of Jason and Marissa. William, who was still standing with 20% of his HP remaining, spat to his side. How I hate that bitch. Outside, Joanna, who had been sent flying into one of Florella's many canals, resurfaced from the water, coughing. Ice covering her entire body had started to melt away. I could barely cast Frozen Heart in time, she thought begrudgingly while swimming shoreward. I couldn't let a brat like that take away the gold I have saved for so much time. I hate people that waste their virtual lives just like that. Next time I see her. Are you okay, miss? The voice of a man said, reaching a hand to her. Let me help you. Thanks, Joanna said, letting the stranger pull her out of the water. No, thank you, the voice turned from masculine to feminine in a second. Shadow style, what's yours is mine. Wait. Joanna cried, but a piercing pain stopped her before she could defend herself. She looked back at the blade piercing her belly. So this is what little Marissa convinced Jason of buying. The thief said, holding aloft the legendary jewel. Thanks, sweetheart. The feminine-sounding man said before removing his mask, revealing the face of a smirking, dark-haired girl. She kissed Joanna's forehead and threw her body back to the canal. That must be the shooting star, Helen, Joanna thought, before losing consciousness. Never thought that Brittany, I mean, Marissa, could ask for help. She closed her eyes. I wonder if she really knows Miss Cosmica. Twenty hours later, when Joanna finally respawned, she noticed a new message notification from her Incogmi app. She opened it and received a new photo, of whom seemed to be Marissa disguised as a very convincing Miss Cosmica, flipping her off. A message followed. It would have been funny if you had really fallen for it. Huh? Joanna muttered to herself, sitting beside the Deathbringers checkpoint monument. Now that I see her closer, this disguise has some minor mistakes. Announcement. Click here to buy it. 13. 17. A carefully planned encounter. He saw himself working in the Santa Maria's hangar. Moving weapon crates and repairing the compromised locks was fine, but his favorite task was giving maintenance to the Custos. Alan had to climb up a ladder and walk through a service ramp to reach their heads and check their systems. One of his favorites was red with green eyes, which he nicknamed Captain Ketchup. How are you doing today, Captain? Alan would say every morning, waving at it. The stationary 60 feet tall metal statue always remained silent. Your day to save the universe will come someday, I know it. In the meantime, let me see if everything is in order, okay. That was his routine for a week until the eighth day when Alan noticed that Captain Ketchup's eyes were glowing. 
Get back, Alan, one of the Isabella controlled drones said, as the red Custos removed its bindings and stepped forward. Captain? Alan muttered as the shadow of a giant foot grew over him. The last thing he saw before a service robot pulled him back was another blue Custos, shielding him. A remnant survived, Alan. The hangar is no longer safe until I take care of it. Return to your room now. Even after the automatic reinforced doors closed, he could still hear a constant banging metallic noise. 17.1. He opened his eyes, finding a known ceiling. I'm here, safe and sound in the Shooting Stars headquarters. He jumped out of the bed, eager to start the day, ignoring the fact that a sunless morning awaited him outside. This is it. Today is the day, Ashley, he thought, while frowning at the grey clouds above. He dressed as quickly as he could, putting on his new favorite red jacket, and exhaled in front of the mirror. Astrid, do you have a minute? We need to talk. Hum, no. Not like that. He turned serious. Babe, there's something you should know. Wait, babe, are you serious? So cringe. He cleared his throat. Astrid, listen to me, I need to tell you something really important. The SS safety of. Damn it. He pursed his lips. Ashley, I know we should maintain this a secret, but she's the only one I can trust. Finding new resolution on his own gaze, he nodded to his reflection and walked towards the door. Before getting out, Amelia's black artificial beetle flew from last night's clothes and silently landed on his baggy pants. Astrid will understand. I know it, he thought, while making his way to the cafeteria. Once she agrees to help me, I wonder if she'd let Ashley train in that private dungeon too. After picking her up first, of course. He glanced outside, to the swimming pool and the training grounds, imagining his new life. We could get used to this place. Anne. Is it my imagination, or is this place really, really quiet? The cafeteria was empty, except for the NPCs that greeted him. No one in the trophy room and the library. I don't even want to peek at the PvP arena. He shivered, remembering only a fraction of what transcurred there, as the sound of people reached him from afar, especially Astrid's powerful voice. Keep in mind that now that we're at the bottom of the ranking charts, we may never reclaim our place back. Her voice was heard through speakers, as Alan peered inside a large room. Astrid was standing atop a podium, wearing navy blue formal military attire, her hair tied in an updo. So if any of you still have doubts in your heart, don't hesitate. If you're not satisfied with how things have turned out, you have my blessing to leave. I won't chase you, I won't punish you, just go and never come back. She maintained a firm posture while a large group left. Let's go, Alan heard one of them say, this guild is done for. Astrid quickly saluted at them. Thank you for your hard work. Without you, shooting stars would have never climbed to the top. Alan hid behind a lion's monument and started counting. Close to 30 people are leaving. When the building's doors shut, Astrid continued, to all of you that stayed, are you sure about this decision, she asked in a deeper voice. Whoever stays with me will have to work twice, no, three times harder than before now that we have been reduced to less than half of our people. Would you follow me to the depths of hell if I asked you? Yes. Are you still shooting stars? Proudly. Do you still thirst for the glory of reaching the top, until we reach the end of the universe? Then I have something to tell all of you. She met eyes with every one of them, showing her tenacity until tears started running down her cheeks. Thanks for staying with me, you idiots. Is she crying? Alan returned to his spying spot, looking at Tamara and some women from the crowd, forming a wall around Astrid that kept her out of sight. Alan then watched a male gilder stomping his way towards Oscar, the big guy that had brought him to Lundorus alongside Marissa Laflamme. If you hadn't listened to Marco's orders and brought Ghost here, we could have avoided all this, the gilder shouted, grabbing Oscar from the collar of his shirt. You're a fool if you really believe that, the taller Oscar replied, without a hint of anger in his voice. This has been a long time coming. Alan stepped back, returning to the safety provided by the monument's shadow, but he could not stand there. He went outside of the building, found the main entrance, and ran towards Lundorus streets. He exited HQ, Amelia Laflamme said through party chat while sipping Pina Colada. It's all yours. This was faster than I thought. Karen Svensson replied, giggling. A lucky star is finally looking my way. I can feel it. Yeah, yeah. 
Go before you lose it. His in, Amelia expanded the system window that displayed her spy beetle's video feed, and the most remarkable landmark she recognized was a giant soft drink ad. Lance Smith Bridge, understood. Wish me luck. Nah, I don't think I will, Amelia said to herself while cutting off the communications. Excuse me, miss, the NPC behind the bar asked, smiling. She stared at him, recognizing he had green eyes. Seeing that made her look away. Wasn't talking to you. Give me another one of these. She raised her cup aloft, but the NPC stepped back. I'm sorry, miss, but the bar is currently closed. Oh, so it's time. Okay, everyone, it's time to go. Kathleen Mayer announced, as Deathbringers and ex-shooting stars alike followed her outside the building. Our guildmaster is going to move the bar, the NPC said to Amelia. We must leave. Come this way, please. There's a back door through the kitchen, right? Amelia said, giving the last sip. I'll use that. Understood, the NPC said, walking away. After helping myself to another drink, Amelia jumped over the bar, found two bottles of wine, and saved them in her inventory. Thanks, cat. She then strolled towards the exit, ignoring the constant system messages that urged her to leave. Outside, while she waited for her black-winged tiger to spawn, she admired the grey sky. I remember seeing the same weather when Marissa and I left Carcella. You weren't here when that happened, she said to her summoned tiger, which purred as she caressed it under its chin. Between you and me, Marissa cried a lot. Don't tell her that or she'll get mad at me. She mounted it and immediately took flight, stopping only to watch the building gradually getting smaller. In a minute, the drinking banshee was the size of a dollhouse, which her ex-guild partner took from his new boss hands. This is the last thing I've done for you, Amelia thought, exhaling. Have fun in your new guild. 17.3. Forget your troubles drinking something cosmic. Tee hee. The pink-haired idol from the ad made a V-sign with her left hand while holding a soda can in her right one. Her purple dress matched the brand's logo, and her smile was bright and almost too sincere, as if she truly believed what she was advertising. Oh, man, Alan muttered, I never thought of listening to the advice of an ad, but I really need a sip of that. Would you like to try the new Moontain Dew, miss? A jolly voice got his attention. A few feet away from him, a female NPC wearing the same purple dress as the idol was addressing every passerby. A vending machine, with elongated robotic arms and tiny feet, danced behind her. Sir, would you like to try the new Moontain Dew, the NPC said to Alan while approaching him. Here's a free sample. One per account. Tee hee. The energetic, seemingly happy robot stepped forward, and pulled out a can from its metallic belly. Here you go, sir. Enjoy, and have a nice day. Well, then, Alan said once he was alone again, taking a sip. When the sweet taste invaded his mouth, he gulped it all. This is false advertising, Miss Idol, he chuckled bitterly. You said I could forget my problems drinking this. He crushed the empty can by closing his fist and repressed the urge to scream. Everything he had done during the last two days have been for the worse. I lost my partner and got myself tortured. I misjudged an obvious, irredeemable asshole, and because of it, a street got laughed at. And now because of my existence, I ruined everything she has built for. Alan bit his lower lip until it bled and hit the railway with his fist. I can't do anything R.I. There you are, little mouse, a cheerful girl said behind him. I've been looking for you for ages. Too tired to respond or even react, Alan limited himself to slowly turn around and squint at the person. Huh? Where the hell is he? Karen Svensson hissed quietly after getting to the opposite side of Lance Smith Bridge. Am I in the wrong place? Did I miss him on my way here? She asked herself, glancing at the giant soft drink advertisement suspended above the river behind her. She opened her user interface to call Amelia, but after long, exasperating seconds without getting an answer, she grunted. Seriously, Red. If I have to spend more time than necessary wearing this stupid face in public, I'll... Grimacing, she opened another virtual window that served as a personal mirror to corroborate that the illusion had not worn off yet. In the reflection, Astrid Bradford was glaring back at her. Oh, how much I hate this face. Karen had decided not to wear makeup while pretending to be her ex-guild master, and yet, deep inside the farthest corner of her mind, she reluctantly admitted that the blonde chick was somewhat pretty. Freaking whatever. 
I have work to do. He can't be that far away. Karen sighed and walked towards the street next to the bridge while keeping an eye on every passerby. This was supposed to be a straightforward task. Everything to please her new master, Kathleen Mayer. Karen could not wait to find Alan, get into character, and parrot the script that Amelia had written for her the night before. And I'd never miss the chance to be as hurtful as possible towards a meek moron like him. Some of these lines are delicious, especially the part where I'll say, I was a fool to believe that your ghostly memory had given me the strength to do the impossible when it was always him who carried me all along. Emphasis on him. Who who who? Oh, Amelia, you fiend. Ghostly memory? Only you could have written something as devilish as this. Golden Comet, a gruff voice called aloud, behind her. Do you have a minute? Karen loudly sighed. She knew there was a small possibility that someone would recognize that blonde bitch face and would speak to her. Seriously, Asford, don't you have shame? If regular people knew how you really are, your fame would be as low as your temperament. Whatever. Whoever this is, if they ask for an autograph or something similar, I'm going to puke on their face. What do you want? The fakestrid asked, annoyed. I'm quite busy right now, and I rarely spoke with the likes of you, anyway. So, there. You have one less fan today, bitch. Ha. Huh. Never thought the Golden Comet would run away from a fight, that person said, making Karen stop in her tracks. Although she was not the real deal, the simple fact that someone had called her a coward made her grit her teeth. Turning around, Karen found a warrior wearing full plate crimson armor. What's this all about? Is this someone that wants to make a name of themselves by picking a fight with Asford? It wouldn't be the first time. Great. I finally have your attention, the person said. I'm a huge fan of yours. Karen did not recognize her armor's design, and it did not seem to have any visible emblem or any sign of identity. The warrior's helmet not only hid her face and gender, but also any info the novice would usually show, like their name and level. I knew it. Karen snickered. A complete loser that thinks that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a ranker after spending too many hours watching battle streams. Well, I don't have time for this. Karen accumulated mana in a second in the form of a magic circle above her head, and rapid cast, stretching out her hand. Multi-elemental beam. A rainbow-colored column of light hit the stranger, hiding them out of sight inside a cloud of dust and smoke. The ground shook, sounding like a loud heartbeat, and the windows from the buildings nearby vibrated collectively. Quick casting took a toll on Karen. Her mana pool dropped significantly, and the tip of her fingertips fumed for a couple of seconds, as she endured a burning pain traveling all the way through her limbs. But she did not care. Glorified slugs my ass, she muttered to herself, remembering what a street had told her the day before, outside of the drinking banshee. Although we're inside a safe zone, this should be more than enough to get rid of some insignificant. Man, that was new, the unknown warrior said aloud, stepping out of the resulting five-feet crater. Knowing you, I thought you'd come for a quick punch to the gut or the face, but you got me. They tilted her head left and right, cracking his neck. You really got me. Far from there, inside the shooting star's headquarters, Astrid Bradford looked at the rain falling over Lundorus from her office's window. Do you know the reason Marissa is offline? She died in battle last night, Tamara informed behind her. Fighting William the Stoic. That's according to Helen. Why was she? Forget it. Astrid exhaled, absently opening her user interface to change her formal military clothes for a white crop top and blue jeans. Okay, she mumbled, walking towards the door. Are you going somewhere? Tamara asked after glancing at Astrid's lost gaze. We'll talk later, okay? Yes, Guildmaster. Although Astrid assured herself to be calmed, she rushed her steps towards his room, where she knocked on the door. Alan? Can we talk? She sighed. Please? Getting no response, she slowly entered the empty room, finding only his last night dinner outfit, perfectly folded over the bed. Where are you? Looking for answers, she looked for his location on her friend list, as Tamara stormed inside the room, looking pale. Guild master. There's a, we have to go. To Astrid, finding the place empty and Tamara's alarmed voice combined, seemed like an ominous foreshadowing. Like the piece before the storm, she thought, swallowing hard. 17.5. 30 minutes ago. There goes all my money, Alan thought, watching the girl sitting by her side, 
gulping a moontain ducan. Ah, that hit the spot, the girl beamed with purple painted lips. Thanks for the treat, Alan Warden. Just call me Alan, he said, peeping at her once more to study her clothes. Who seemed to be a girl his age, was wearing a black oversized windbreaker jacket that allowed her to hide her face and hands. From time to time, Alan could have a glimpse of her pale chin and white ass ceramic fingertips, and purple nail polish. Although I don't mind treating a stranger to a drink, 50 gold per can is a steal. I think. It seems that inflation hit the Novus hard during my three-year absence. He shivered and took a modest sip from his second can of the day, as the girl was seemingly staring at him. Although I can't see her gaze, having a girl this close is still super awkward. Can she even see with that thing over her head? Um, sorry, but you haven't introduced yourself yet, so if you don't mind, he said, making her giggle. Does it really matter what I call myself, Alan? I'd probably come out with a fake name, anyway. What we're going to discuss it's supposed to be top secret, you know. She got closer to him and whispered, raising her index finger, I'm not supposed to be here, so, S-H-H-H-H, got it. I'm glad to finally talk with someone about this, regardless. The girl stood silent for a moment before swinging her legs up and down, showing her black leather leggings and heeled ankle boots. Sure, glad to be of help, at least I think she's trying to help me. When she approached me on that bridge minutes ago, telling me she knew about me logging out three years ago, my heart raced like crazy. Did an administrator send her? Or maybe she's one of them. So many questions. And yet, I mustn't truly trust her. There's also the possibility that she's nothing more than a curious, regular user that, after looking at my level, put one and two together and just wants to get info out of me. Because, she's just bored or something. I really love trying this new flavor, she said, crushing the can and throwing it all the way towards a garbage bin, 30 feet away from their bench. I'm always trying new things every day. What about you, Alan? Yes, sure. Everything is new to me since I logged back in, after all, but there is also something comforting about routines and the mundane. How about pain and adversity, Alan? Do you also enjoy them as much? Enjoy it? Why would I? Pleasure doesn't differ that much from pain. She shrugged. They're quite similar, although most of the people may say otherwise. What's your honest opinion? Do you also think that they're the complete opposite of each other? Why is she suddenly asking this? Alan wanted nothing more than to study that person's eyes and try to read her intentions, but only her smiling purple lips were visible. I suppose she's just trying to cut the ice between us, since we may talk about a serious topic in a minute. If buying her a soft drink wasn't enough. Well, they're both stimuli, yes, Alan replied, but you can't compare them at all. One is sought on a daily basis, and the other is mostly avoided. Yeah. What's up with that, she intoned, and Alan pictured her doing a funny look behind the hood. You'd think that people would seek pain as much as pleasure since they're part of the same balance, but no, now I'm really wondering what's this all about. Is this a test? Alan left his drink aside, took a deep breath, and placed both hands on his knees. This is my serious mode then. You asked for it. Alan glanced at the two triangles adorning her hood, before replying. That's true, cat ears, but you're omitting the most important fact, pain is reserved to signal when something is wrong with one's body, while pleasure can be received indefinitely. She tilted her head. Isn't having too much of a good thing considered bad? It is, but having too much pain is obviously more destructive. The mind would corrupt over time and the body would break beyond repair. There's no comparison, but it's the same with pleasure. It creates greedy, lustful, gluttonous, and lazy people. Aren't there old teachings that say that those traits are deplorable? Well, when you put it that way, I guess so. You've just confirmed my theory. Despite being equally similar, people avoid pain as much as possible. Bias much, she said annoyed, deviating her gaze frontward. She then whispered, I thought you'd be different since you're practically an outsider, but you're as hardwired as the rest. So disappointing. The shimmering, crystalline waters of the Thermosis River in front of them made the buildings at the distance look like a mirage, and Alan wondered for a moment if he was really there. I could be still sleeping outside, resting from another day of work at the Santa Maria. Or maybe my body was incompatible with the Nova system, and I died a long time ago inside my cryo chamber. 
This illusion may be the result of my deteriorating brain, as a way to pass time until it ultimately shuts down. That may explain why so many bad things have happened to me consecutively. Could all this be the guilt inside me? He grabbed his drink and gulped it. Or this encounter could be another misfortune in disguise, slowly opening its jaws around me. Forget all about that, okay, she continued. Tell me, Alan, how are things going outside? I'm sorry, but I don't know what you're talking about. I don't remember saying something about being outside. Huh? What is that supposed to mean? You were offline for three years. Where else would you? I was in a coma. It's as simple as that. I thought you'd be honest with me, she said, bitterly. He turned his gaze to her. Are you an administrator? No. Bummer. An awkward silence followed through, which was only filled by the squawking of white birds, peacefully floating on the river. What are those? Some kind of aquatic chickens? Is that the game we're going to play, she blurted out, standing up. Fine. Change of plans then. I want to show you something. Alan observed her stroll towards the railing in front of them. Her attitude has completely changed. He followed her, maintaining his distance. I'd rather you tell me who you really are. I've already told you. I don't have a name. I'm just the embodiment of progress. Yeah, right, he replied, turning around and ready to go, but something grabbed his ankle. Confused, he looked down, finding a shadow that seemed to pull him down. Not the strangest thing I've seen since I got back here, but it was not his shadow, for his own was in the opposite direction. Something almost tangible was grabbing him, stretching out all the way to that girl's feet. Do you consider the Novus a paradise, Alan, she asked from her place, looking at the distance. Not this again. Compared to what we left behind, yes. A utopia. Although a fake one, he reluctantly replied, this time in an annoyed tone of voice. Well said, Alan, she said, giggling. A fake one. And yet, people don't seem to care. As long as the Novus keeps providing them with food, sex, and entertainment, people are eager to consume them in large quantities. You can't get fat here unless you want to. There are no diseases, and there are plenty of activities to keep everyone busy. There's war here too, but it's inconsequential since death has become a joke. Your ancestors fought for liberty and independence, but those have been traded now by the seek of fame and luxury. A perfect utopia indeed. My ancestors? What's with all this philosophical bullshit? What does it have to do with me? And what did you expect? This is a controlled, safe environment. Humanity has suffered enough. We've earned this peace. Wrong, she replied, raising her voice. The previous generation and the one before it made it possible, and how did that turn out too, huh? Those two did everything in their power to correct their parents' mistakes, and in their arrogance, doomed earth. She paused, to smirk at him. Or better said, they finally advanced human civilization, after a long century of stagnation. This spaceship is proof of it. I. I don't like where this is going. Miss. Could you please let me go? Not yet, she giggled, stretching out her hand. I need you to stand where you are. It's your exclusive seat for what I'm going to show you, and the lazy, gluttonous, lustful, greedy people of this joke of a city. Superior summoning. The surrounding air became heavier and the thermosis waters rippled, as in preparation of something coming. She said summoning, didn't she? Alan could only remember the Gilda from the day before at the shooting star practice grounds, bringing a dinosaur out of thin air. Is she going to do something similar? With what purpose? As he tried in vain to free his feet, he saw it, a large magic circle in the sky. He was sure that anyone in a one-mile radius could see it. What are you going to do? he asked, shaking, as the young woman snickered. Your generation, the tandem, have become complacent, Alan Warden. As I've already told you, I'm the embodiment of progress. So let me give you all a taste of what hardship really is. She grinned, as the purple aura around her got transferred towards the magic circle. Alan's mind flashed with images from the security footage Isabella had shown him. Cat ears. Didonty do it. Draquinox, she intoned, overjoyed. The two-headed reeve dragon. Something gigantic fell over the river, splashing them both and the few passers-by that had gathered there. It took Alan's brain several seconds to register what stood in front of him. Because I never thought the developers would create something like this. He first saw a huge white scaly wall, and besides it, something that seemed to absorb the surrounding light, obscuring the horizon. When he looked up, 
he found two giant snakes trying to bite each other. One was white as a pearl, and the other as black as the night sky. It's like seeing a star fighting a black hole. Get along, you two, the girl said aloud, making a magic circle appear around her wrist as if it were a bracelet. At her command, the two serpent-like creatures shook their heads and stood still, growling. The rain poured down, as Alan watched the young woman turn to him and smile. There's nothing to worry about, little mouse. After all, they're all immortal, don't they? She giggled, at the same time one monster concentrated mana inside its maw and released it as a powerful beam of light. 2. 18 E Equinox Festival From her place atop the tallest building in all the city, Amelia Laflamme observed the rain falling beyond the horizon. Lundorus seemed to be covered in a grey, cold and indifferent mantle. A super wet mantle. Sitting at the edge of the rooftop, she then looked down at the street, having a view of her hair and the fabric of her dress forcibly stuck to her chest, but she did not mind. She needed all that coldness to feel something. Anything. She swallowed saliva, tasting it bitter. In less than a minute, she had ignored three social notifications from her ex-guild partners. Three. More than I expected. The first was a call from Karen Svensson, who was quickly ignored as soon as it popped up. She surely wants to brag about the great job she did. Yes. Your new master will surely be proud. Go to her side while wagging your tail, come on. The other two messages were from William the Stoic and Marco Souza, making the same question, where are you? The difference between the two was that William's message started by calling her beautiful, and Marco's text was more demanding. I should do this sooner than later. She opened her user interface, and selected William and Karen's names from her friend list and tapped unfriend. Only Marco Souza's name remained. She could picture his squinting look, daring her to continue. She wanted to ask him if stealing from the shooting star's vault was his idea, but last night's remarks had already given her the answer. This is all strategic, these stopped being quarrels between rival groups, these are private companies now. Well, my former lord, my sister is still in that guild you fucked. After glancing at Marissa's name and her current offline status, she tapped Marcos and removed him from the list. She sighed as if a load had been freed from her shoulders and pointed her face upwards to receive the chilly rain directly. Her winged tiger whined, beside her. Oh, sorry. Your wings must be completely soaked. Rest a little, I'll get down on my own. The beast became incorporeal and turned into a jewel that gently fell on her palm. As she looked at the distance, she felt a set of eyes piercing the back of her neck, coming from something that was always present. Always vigilant. Amelia sighed. What is it, Belfie? she asked aloud, addressing someone standing behind her. Is there something you want to say? Because this is the time to do it. The slim feminine silhouette did not reply, limiting herself to only keep her distance, prompting Amelia to click her teeth and stand up. Are you also going to judge me? Amelia cried, striding towards her. Do you think I enjoy this? Do you think I wanted this to happen? Sure, why not? I wake up every morning, eager to fuck someone else's life. That's Emmy, every single day. This whole situation is so absurd that I can't stop laughing. Ha, ha, H.A. The tall entity tilted her head when Amelia fell to her knees, sobbing. Just a couple of days ago, I was chilling with my sister in the trophy room, mocking the insignificant feats of the weakest members. We were planning on raiding the Etzebel Castle later this week and celebrate our victory at her favorite place where they served those salty nachos. But then the cockroach showed up and fucked everything. If it weren't for him, maybe Marco would have quitted the guild in another less, destructive way. Or am I being delusional? Amelia looked up, looking for answers, but the ghostly apparition in front of her did not move an inch. The specter only remained still while every single drop of rain falling over her round hat passed through. A black thrusy veil covered her entire body, and in her hands, she held something resembling a bouquet, composed of knives, pistol cannons, and wrenches. What am I doing? Amelia lowered her head and bit her lower lip, drawing blood. Talking to this, thing, an explosion was heard in the distance. Although she was used to hearing them all the time, something about hearing it inside Lundora's safe zone made her uneasy. Was it my imagination? Frowning, she looked for the source, until another blazing light, followed by a burst of flames could be seen, two miles away. Lance Smith Bridge is in that direction, but, Nan, it can't be. It must be just a coincidence. 
unless. Amelia imagined a quite colorful scene involving the real Astrid, kicking Karen's ass after finding out what was going on. But not even that monstrous woman could cause such destruction. Not here, I mean. Amelia exhaled, reprimanding herself. Whatever. It has nothing to do with me. She then turned around and jumped down the building, ready to leave the city and everything behind. She fell 100, 200, 300 feet, until a memory flashed in her mind. This is a serious issue, Marco. The integrity of this ship and its population is at risk. Amelia shut her eyes and groaned. Ark. See Amy fake Kaya. Before crashing into certain death, she sprouted black wings at the last second, landing safely. If this ends up being bullshit, I'll show him hell, she muttered, glancing in the explosion's direction. The humongous dragon crawled towards the city. Its height rivaled the city's skyscrapers when it stretched out its long necks. While making its way out of the river, it crushed a yacht with one foot and leveled a mansion with its fat, round body. The white head fired an incandescent beam that melted anything in a straight trajectory, and the black one emitted a chilling cry that created seemingly controlled black holes that consumed everything in a 100 feet radius, before imploding and blinking out of existence. If left unattended, Lundorus would cease to exist in a matter of minutes. Realizing it prompted Alan to draw his bronze tear sword. Stop that thing, now, he yelled, threatening the girl in black. She turned to him, calmly. Put that thing away before you poke someone's eyes. Only yours. Why would you bring that thing here? This is not a dungeon nor a battlefield. Is it full of civilians? Is that what you're trying to say? She asked in a monotone voice. Why yes. Most of the people living here aren't members of a guild. You're practically attacking innocent people. Although it was impossible to see her expression, Alan was sure that the young woman was glaring at him. You're not making any sense, Alan Warden, she said, turning her voice deeper. So is it okay to kill people as long as they have a weapon in hand? Do you think chivalry has its place in war? She snickered, deviating her gaze toward her monster in the distance, giving Alan the opportunity to check his feet. The shadow bounding me has disappeared. He then tightened his grip on his sword's hilt. Even if I know it'll be impossible, I'd later feel 100 times worse if I never tried. He charged against the unsuspected girl and swung his sword, going for her neck. You asked for it. The blade passed through, but it felt null as if he had cut the air. The weight of his weapon after drawing a long curve almost threw him off balance. What happened just now? He glanced back, finding the girl's head still attached. Did I miss? N no, I don't think so. Or maybe she moved so fast that I didn't notice, like in those animes. Can people do that here? See cool? What were you trying to do, little mouse? She asked, smirking. Doesn't matter. I promised you a front row seat, right? What are we waiting for, then? She stretched out her hand again, ready to bring another abomination into the city, but when the summoned creature materialized, it was smaller. Her mount had the head and the glossy wings of a crow and the body of a black slim mare. Seats ready. Hop up, little, she beamed, but when she turned around, looking for him, he had gone. Of course he'll escape, she said to herself, sighing until she saw him crossing Lansmith Bridge at full speed. Is he going after my adorable Draquinox? She chuckled. Seriously? Well, I don't want to miss the show. Oscar Mills was not in a good mood. Maybe Dylan was right, and this is all my fault. If I haven't brought Alan Warden here. No, no, no. I was the one that said that this was a long time coming. But do I really believe that, or am I just lying to myself? He gritted his teeth and tightened his grip on his flying cat's reins. I even had to swear to Astrid herself that I didn't know what Marco was planning. I never felt so embarrassed in my whole life. I swear, if I ever see Marco Souza's face again, I'll fucking what the... Is that what I'm looking for? As his chubby cat soared in the sky, Oscar could see the two-headed dragon wreaking havoc from a mile away. Call Tamara, he made a voice command and his user interface automatically opened an audio chat window. Did you find it? She asked right away. Yes, and judging by its size and destructive power, it must be a superior summon. Oscar, that'd be impossible. Well, let's review the facts, shall we? I estimate that it's 200 feet tall and its potential. Um. By looking at the ease with which it destroyed the entirety of Newsingtown in less than a minute, I'd say it's gold B rank. A city destroyer. What do we call those again? Oscar. 
Londoru safe zone limits our mana capacity to the point that we wouldn't be able to summon anything bigger than a car. Well, say that to this big fella. Tamara let out an exasperated grunt. FF fuck. Okay, okay, where is it going now? Did she curse just now? Oscar thought, chuckling. She must be super frustrated. He gave another glance to the beast. I correct myself. Who wouldn't? This is really unprecedented. He's about to reach Westminster, Oscar informed. Hey, maybe it's going after the Big Beth. Monsters of this size love to destroy monuments, right? Like in those movies Helen likes. Don't even joke about it. I am on my way. Distract it whatever means necessary. She really likes that clock tower, huh? Oscar whispered after Tamara hung up. Distract it. How? That thing may be ignoring the rules, but I don't. My stats are currently cut in half. As he glared at the thing, the system automatically detected a guild member in the vicinity. He squinted, and an icon popped up inside his field of vision, showing the person's exact location and name. You have to be kidding me, he muttered and ordered his cat to nose dive. After landing at a modest distance, Oscar watched Alan Warden rushing towards a crumbled building. It was until Oscar got closer that he noticed someone trapped under debris. P please, wake up. I'll help you get you out of this, okay? Alan was crying out to the unconscious man. His HP was barely holding up. W who, the man muttered, slowly opening his eyes. He then uttered a cry of shock. My legs. I can't feel them. D don't worry. A healer will fix you up as long as you have some HP left, Alan assured, as the man suddenly pulled him by his sleeves. It may be too late by then, so please, young man. I have three million gold saved. Let me transfer it to you and let's meet here in ten hours so you can give it back, yes. From his place, Oscar observed the scene in silence. Was this your true intention, Alan? Since you're level five, that much gold must be like a fortune to you. He snickered. Although Astrid may have you in high esteem, I'm glad to see your true colors. He then closed his fists. After all, you're the true reason our guild. Alan suddenly turned to Oscar, showing a pale face. You, big guy. Can't you see this person needs help? Give me a hand, please. Oscar frowned before stepping forward. Ah, sure. W wait a second. Are you level five? The agonizing man said in a quiet voice. I can't transfer that much gold to you, he then frowned, looking annoyed. Why didn't you step aside so that other man, G got, F first? The man looked sleepy as his HP finally dropped to zero, and when his body vanished, the debris fell over the empty spot left behind. Oscar observed Alan staring at that spot for long seconds. W-Y. Alan asked aloud with a broken voice. I heard you landing like half a minute ago, so why didn't you help me save him earlier? Any other day, Oscar would find it annoying that someone had questioned him. He would have grabbed Alan by the collar of his jacket and yelled back at him, but this time, he only shut his eyes. I'm going to confront that thing, Oscar said, gruffly. What about you, ghost? Alan wiped something off his face and evaded Oscar's gaze as he passed him by. You know I can't fight, so I'll try to help as many people as posse. Something crossing the sky at great speed interrupted him and a current of air pushed them when it passed by. They looked up and saw a group of ten winged mounts flying low, towards the menace. Oscar squinted at them, waiting for the system to give him some info. They're from the Titan Hunters Guild. They'll take care of it. Well, I'll wish them good luck, then, a third voice said from atop the collapsed building. There you are little mouse. Don't run again like that. I promise to show you something exciting, remember? Alan glanced at the girl dressed in black for a second before walking in the next street direction. Alan, wait. Who's this? Oscar asked. Who are you? The girl asked back in a lower voice. Doesn't matter, don't even present yourself, for I'm only interested in that little blood nut over there. So go die somewhere else and leave us alone, pretty please? Alan clenched his jaw, turning his back at both. She's that dragon summoner. That's all I know. Is that so? Oscar grinned, stretching out his hand to his side, materializing a lance. Fine. Do whatever thing you think it's best for you, ghost. Meanwhile, I'll do the only thing I'm best at. Alan, wait. We haven't finished talking yet, the girl yelled, before letting out an exasperated grunt. Great. Now I'm stuck with this freaking. Oscar powered up first, exerting a fire aura, 
and swung his lance in a long upward curve, cutting what remained of the building in half. The cut was so clean that not even a single brick fell down. The name's Oscar Mills, sweetie. Now, show me how you bleed, he said, chuckling, but grimaced after noticing that the girl not only was unharmed, but was also yawning. What the hell just happened? You're not a tiny, cute little mouse like him. You're a big, fat rat, the girl said, surrounding herself with a purple aura. And I detest rats. They're not fun to play with. Three and a half miles away, another fight took place on Castle North Street. There, surrounded by burning buildings, Karen Svensson kneeled and puked blood. As she tried her best to remain conscious, she squinted at the warrior strolling toward her. I had to take a beating to realize that their helmet looks like some sort of carnivorous beast. Hey, are you deaf? Karen cried. I told you I'm not her. I'm not the real Astrid Bradford. Oh, I heard you all right, the warrior said hoarsely, grabbing Karen by the neck. That's why I can't let you go unscathed. Your pathetically slow moves and your laughable weak-ass spells are staining her reputation. W who the hell cares? Karen replied as she was lifted off the ground. The unknown warrior chuckled. I do. I care so much that seeing your pitiful impersonation disgusts me. So, good night, whoever you are. See can I say yes something first? Sure, why not? The warrior shrugged. Tea trigger off, Karen whispered, grinning. The warrior looked at their sides, finding several magic circles surrounding them. Before the spells could reach them, the warrior closed their fist to crush Karen's neck, but the witch's body had turned into solid ice. Oh, you bit. A plethora of elemental spells hit both indiscriminately. Lightning zaps, ice lances, currents of frozen air, fireballs, flamethrowers. Even the ground they were standing on had turned into quicksand, trapping the warrior's feet. Karen escaped the bombarding area and started casting, calling familiar, bare mental family. Nice try, the enemy roared, dashing towards Karen. Baby bear. Karen yelled, and a bear cub made of ice got launched out of a summoning circle. It curled up into a ball and hit the warrior in the chest, pushing them. Mama bear. Karen called, and a fully adult bear came into existence, engulfing its whole body in flames. The creature threw a swipe that melted part of the warrior's chest plate and released a fire breathing. The enemy could do nothing but shield themselves with their arms. And last, Papa Bear. When it landed, the ground shook. It doubled the warrior in size, and when it roared, it extinguished the nearby flames. You had it in you all this time, huh, impersonator, the warrior said, laughing out loud. It's a shame that the safe zone is limiting you, but whatever. Tell your pet to give me a big hug. Papa Bear, crush their spine. The summoned beast made of solid rock extended its enormous arms and the warrior reciprocated by embracing it. Come here, pal. The golem bear was so huge that it blocked the warrior out of vision. Mama Bear, light him up. The fire-breathing beast followed the order and began scorching its partner. In a matter of seconds, Papa Bear's rocky body began emitting light, as if it was made of magma. How are your bones, Dips hit? Karen asked, loudly sneering. I measured Papa Bear's strength once, and its embrace is equivalent to 120,000 newtons of force, so enjoy it, you asshole. Oh, geez. That could do some serious damage, if the safe zone affected me. Karen's grin disappeared. Affected, huh? Fire style, meteor punch. Meteor what? The street darkened for a second, a series of blue sparkles manifested around them, and with a blinding light and a deafening bang, the enormous bear got sent flying in a straight trajectory, hitting its family. The three bears ended up smashing against a building before turning into fading pixels. Karen's lips trembled in disbelief. And no way. That kind of reminded me of Astrid's Meteora Ferrum. And now, I'm officially out of mana. Karen fell to her knees as the warrior chuckled. Time's up, princess. It was fun, so I'm not angry with you anymore. Thanks to this little warm-up, we ended up calling the real comet's attention. Before Karen could say a word, something heavy landed between them. Something that made the ground shake several times more than Papa Bear did. Karen looked up, staring at something resembling a golden cape in front of her. When she blinked twice, she noticed it was hair, and the owner was glaring at her. Her eyes gleamed silvery blue. Who the fuck are you? A street Bradford asked Karen. The still-disguised Karen only muttered, I, let me guess, 
this is one of Kathleen's lame attempts to get back at me, isn't that right? Astrid snarled. There's only a pair of bitches crazy enough to try this. You must be Amelia Laflom or Karen Svensson, most likely. Karen pursed her lips and clenched her buttocks, ready to receive her deadly wrath. This is going to hurt way more than that stranger's attacks. Get out of my sight, Astrid said with closed teeth. You're too pathetic to kill. Karen shut her eyes, repressed any urge to curse, and ran out of there as fast as she could. One last glance at the warrior confirmed they were only after the real golden comet. Karen could have shared what she had learned about the enemy with Astrid. She could at least have warned her about what they had said. That the safe zone was not affecting them. But no. Karen decided not to say a word and ran away instead. And who the hell was that? That person was super annoyed after finding out I was a fake. Ha, huh, this is so funny. I'd laugh, but my everything hurts. Whoever that person is, it strikes me as a very obsessive, psychopathic fan. Who who who? Ouch. So have fun with that, you bitch. 3. 19 in non-compliant monsters. At last. I've been waiting for this for so long, the unknown warrior wearing full plate armor said, short of breath, as if they were salivating inside the helmet. Astrid changed her glacial glare for a puzzled look. Do I know you? Never met. But I know all about you, the warrior replied, making Astrid snicker. Yes, yes. I bet you've heard that line a million times by now, but I mean it, the stranger continued. I've been a big fan of yours long before you got notoriety. So what if I'm just here to challenge you as everyone else? Or what? Now that you're at the top, you no longer fight puny non-rankers, like the other Astrid said. We're not in the top rankings anymore, Astrid said, looking at her surroundings. Ah, sorry. I haven't caught up on the news yet, the warrior said, panting with anticipation. I came here from a faraway land as quickly as possible and couldn't think of anything more than to meet you. The collapsed buildings, the rain pouring over burning houses, the craters and ruined pavement looked like straight out of a war zone. A street had seen her fair share of ruined environments before, but never inside a city. At least not in the Novus. She sighed. If you came to Lundorus only to challenge me, congratulations, your little skirmish caught my attention. But why do it here, in the middle of the city? Your rank won't raise a single position if you beat me, and you're only making new enemies out of this. As the warrior strolled towards her, they let out a quiet laugh. You wouldn't have taken me seriously if I didn't create some ruckus first, and you're assuming I'm out in public regularly. Foo foo foo. But most importantly, I'm not here to become famous by beating you. I'm just here to learn from you. Pardon me? Once the warrior stood in front of Astrid, the height difference became enormous. Astrid's gaze pointed directly to their breastplate, whose convex shape could easily protect a pair of breasts. Yes, I'm here to learn from you. The warrior stretched out their hand. I can only learn up to a certain point by just watching your battle streams. So I really need this. Astrid observed that big hand covered by a red gauntlet and chuckled. You're kidding me. I'm dead serious. I want nothing more in this world than to spar with you. I'll improve ten times, no. A hundred times faster this way. The warrior paused while maintaining her stretched out hand toward Astrid. Could you at least give me a friendly handshake? Come on. What are you so afraid of? Astrid half smiled and complied. It's nice to make your acquaintance, then. Couldn't say it better. Both users shook hands as the gravity around them increased. Then, a fire aura encircled them, evaporating every single raindrop falling over them. Astrid's calm expression got replaced by a shocked frown, which made the warrior sneer. Did you think I was just a pushover? The warrior laughed out loud as their grip tightened. Astrid's right knee kissed the ground as she finally succumbed to the heavy aura. The very own earth shook in a 300 feet radius, crumbling every remaining wall or still standing structure inside the zone. It was only a matter of time until they heard the sound of bones getting crushed. Come on, Comet. Show me what you got. The ride to get here was really windy, and I hate flying, so make it worth it. W what's this? Why you re not, B being, repressed, Astrid said as the mana pressure forcibly pushed her head down. That's right. The safe zone's restrictions are not affecting me. But you're not going to cry foul, are you? That'd only stain the precious image I have of you. I don't care, and I won't, Astrid said, before looking up, showing that her eyes had an electric silver glow. And as a matter of fact, 
This is perfect. Consider this my handicap. The warrior felt it right away. As if a sudden gust of wind had pushed the flames she had just ignited, burning her face. Astrid's grip suddenly tripled in strength and kept increasing. The warrior groaned as they applied all of their force to counteract it. Fire boost, Vela, the warrior cried, enhancing their strength. An overwhelming red aura emanated around their body. But it did not matter. Astrid slowly rose as her hair floated above her nape. A wicked grin adorned her face. If you wanted to see whose dick is bigger, you got it. She then giggled like a child. I'm metaphorically speaking by the way. Tee hee. Astrid finally closed her fist, breaking the enemy's hand. A second of silence followed as their battle auras disappeared, letting the rain pour over them again. The warrior backtracked, watching what seemed to be a folded glove replacing her right hand. Astrid had seen that scene before. Either they retreat, or attack with everything they got in a last attempt to. But her train of thought got interrupted by the warrior's maniacal laughter. Ha ha ha. I knew it. I knew you wouldn't let me down. That's new, Astrid muttered, as she saw the warrior get into a known stance. Wait a minute. After the enemy separated her legs and bent her knees, they formed a fist with her left hand, as if they were charging a punch. But no. That couldn't be it, right? Fire style, the warrior proclaimed, exerting a dense, red aura. It definitely is. Following her instincts, Astrid performed the same stance in a heartbeat a battle stance that she had developed during her time in the Novus. You know what? I won't even get upset that you're copying my moves, since people do it all the time. That's right. There's nothing more beautiful in all the Novus than your fighting style. So, come on, love, help me reach perfection. Astrid clenched her teeth and began charging mana too. Gah! Bloody asshole! Fire style! The ground cracked, and the surroundings got filled with tiny blue ascending sparkles. As their power increased, everything got obscured for a second, before a blinding light bathed the battleground. Eat this. Meteor punch. Meteor ferrum. Any user level 30 and below would have evaporated if they had stopped to see the show. Users close to level 50 would get fatal burns, no matter what kind of armor they were equipping. Only users 80 and up could live to tell the tale with a few scratches after being knocked down by the shock wave. In the aftermath of this interchange, the area got leveled, except for the very ground they were standing on, which turned into a concave-shaped, 20 inches deep hole. Every fallen brick disintegrated. The resulting light could be seen from anywhere in the city, catching the attention of Tamara, Astrid's right hand who was atop her flying mount, and some members of the Titan Hunters Guild, currently fighting the two-headed dragon. Astrid's ears still buzzed moments after she recovered her sight a true sign that Lundora's safe zone works as intended. But why is this stranger? She let her frown show her concern one last time before correcting her posture and stride toward the enemy. The warrior was found kneeling, 100 feet away. Their left arm dripped blood, looking useless. Splendid. Truly splendid, the warrior said, panting. I did everything right. It was a true replica of your signature move, executed perfectly. But I clearly lacked strength. They chuckled, as Astrid maintained a blank expression. The warrior then stood up and tilted their head left and right, cracking her neck. Oh, well. I won't hold back next time. Astrid observed their both hands, suddenly forming fists. Healed already, she muttered, as a grin slowly formed on her lips. Sure, why not? What's your name, stranger? Ah. I finally picked your interest, eh? Well, unfortunately, I can't tell you. I'm nameless, but you can call me the embodiment of progress itself, dot. Astrid pursed her lips while imagining the smugness inside the warrior's helmet. My hunch was right, Tamara. Despite the threat that Dragon poses, I knew there was something disgustingly strong around this area. Astrid used her Eye of the Sage active skill to read the enemy's status and checked an increase in their strength. That rampaging dragon it's a menace, yes, but something tells me that if I don't take down this wanker, we'll all bloody regret it. By 1.15pm, all of Lundora's population knew about the dragon terrorizing the city. Some could see it from their still unaffected homes, or hear its rumbling roar echoing through the streets. Video recordings of it flooded the Navinet, and users from all over the Novus promptly named the disaster by many ways. The Unsuspected Raid. 
the surprise moth of asterisk 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 boss raid, and the nuke dragon event. The few Lundorus residents that ventured their way to get a better shot of the monster ended up vaporized by its death beam, no matter if they were trying to film it from four blocks away. Although members of the Titan Hunters Guild were better equipped, they did not have a better chance of surviving either. The rampaging dragon held its position as soon as it received the first wave of attacks. Mags capable of firing long-distance spells while riding nimble mounts served as a distraction so that the first hunter squad got close unnoticed. These experienced hunters with maxed agility status jumped over rooftops and reached the humongous monster rapidly so they could target its weak spots. Although not every Novus monster was biologically the same, the Titan Hunters Guild had learned to go for the limbs to immobilize it, for the glands and its tail to get rid of its main weapons, and to inflict it with poison or dark-type paralyzing spells to slow it down. Unfortunately, it did not matter if they were wielding epic-grade, anti-oversized monster weapons, they could not pierce its scales. I'm getting tired of you. Wind style, Levenal cut, one hunter cast, targeting the dragon's long neck. A fountain of blood covered her from helmet to boots. As expected from our resident tryhard, one of her guild partners cheered. Way to go, Rita. This is freaking bullshit, the aforementioned hunter cried, watching the deep wound close up at an alarming pace. She then switched communication channels and reported to her guild master, Ben, this freaking thing has an enhanced healing factor. Enhanced, a male voice replied through party chat. Is that the word you'd use, Rita? Oh, I'm sorry. Would you like to swap places and see it yourself? Okay. Noted. Anything else? Before she could speak, Rita watched one of its fellow guilders fall from atop the dragon's head. What's he doing? She muttered, expecting her partner to make a flip and land safely at the last second, but the body continued in a free fall, all the way to the destroyed street below. Then, a purple mist covered the entire dragon's body rapidly. Poison! Rita yelled through party chat, alerting the rest of her squad. She then coughed violently as she retreated. This freaking blows. What the hell is our poison resistance doing, huh? Once she jumped over the nearest building, a sudden itch invaded her entire body. Wait, she muttered, falling to her knees. This is not poison. She eagerly got rid of her helmet, pauldrons, and breastplate as she started laughing. He, 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 he. Ha. Um. Guildmaster? What? If it isn't poison, what is it? I'm afraid that, Rita grabbed her blade and pointed it against her belly. T this tickles. He he. Ha ha ha. Long live the Queen of Shadows, asshole. A mile away from there, sitting in a back alley, Benjamin Woods, leader of the Titan Hunters Guild saw Rita's status change to offline. He scribbled on an electronic tablet right away. I'll add the ability to cast mental corruption to the list, he muttered as he closely listened to the mage squad's transmission. Ben, this is not my imagination. The spells bounce back. I repeat, everything we're throwing at the damn thing bounces back. Magic immunity, eh? Ah, this brings me memories, Benjamin said, while adding it to the list. When was the last time we encountered an enemy that could one-shot us like this? Here comes a big one, the mage cried, and a deafening sound, accompanied by a quake could be heard and felt at the distance. What happened? Benjamin asked aloud. Another fire breath. Although it looks more like a white beam of death, a girl standing by his side replied, wearing a headset that covered her gaze and ears. Another? The man whistled. High mana capacity, then. It seems so, the girl whispered. Let me see if I can measure the distance this time. She moved her thumb over a remote control on her right hand and a black drone observing the battlefield from atop the sky started scanning. The deathly ray of doom leaves a 870 yards path of destruction. Whoa, really? The man shook his head. Fantastic. Fan-fucking-tastic. He then gritted his teeth while watching a large system screen in front of him, showing the status and position of all of his guilders. How can a monster of this size know what camping is? A male gilder made its way towards him and saluted. Ben, I mean, sir. I brought Ms. Tamara Moore in, from the Shooting Stars Guild. Who? Benjamin narrowed his eyes at him. The young gilder frowned back. Um. She alleges to be their second in command, sir. 
He then pointed towards the petite girl reluctantly approaching them. A taller, more confident and a leader-looking, black-haired girl pushed Tamara forward. Oh, my goodness, there he is, Tamara said to Helen through private voice chat, in a distressed tone of telepathic voice. H he looks pissed. Relax. You'll do it fine. B but what if he doesn't listen? I'm going to hyperventilate at any moment, I swear. Oh, for the love of, are you listening to yourself? Would you rather take that stupid dragon head on than to fulfill your new gilding duties? If that means not talking to this man, then yes. You should have seen the last time he and Astrid argued. The poor bar had to be remodeled from the ground up. They paid the damages in full, of course, and later got wasted together among the rubble. Ha! Huh. It was so foo. When did that happen? You passed out and missed all the fun. Anyway, you should be glad that I'm here, covering your ass. Helen spanked her guild partner, forcing her to step forward. Literally. He he. Come on, go. He's waiting. Tamara bit her lower lip before smiling. Gee good afternoon, Mr. Benjamin. I'm Tamara Morin. I'm here in representation of Astrid Brad. Dot. About time any of you showed up. Benjamin shouted, making Tamara squeal. Where is she? Where is the golden comet? S sorry. But she's currently battling an equally dangerous enemy. Benjamin quietly glanced at her female Gilda beside him, who started manipulating her flying drone. I see multiple explosions in the distance, near Lancemith Bridge, she informed. Fine. Benjamin sighed, running a large hand through his brunette hair. He was the tallest person in that alley. He looked in his late twenties, with a strong yet slim physique. Although his circle beard made his mouth look severe, he gave Tamara a sympathetic look. I heard the news. A portion of your guild quitted, right? It's a relief to see that although you are not in the best of conditions, you're willing to help. Tell Astrid Bradford later that I appreciate it, okay? How many men did you bring? Thank you, sir, Tamara replied, calming herself. Lundorus is also our home, so shooting stars will always be here to protect it. She then pursed her lips. I've brought 25 guilders with me. The man stood silent for a bit, giving her an apologetic stare. Tamara knew what he was thinking, shooting stars has really fallen from grace. All right, let me give you a summary of what we're dealing with, Benjamin said, enlarging a system window so they could see a map of the area. What once was a rampaging monster, it's now keeping its distance from us. Like a bloody camper, sniping everything in sight. Excuse me, what do you mean by sniping? Helen asked, as an explosion and a tremor occurred. Another death beam, the girl on lookout informed. Benjamin stared at Helen, annoyed. No matter from where we attack it, that thing fires a quick, devastating, long-ranged beam at us. And, if we get too close, it creates some sort of black hole that kills you instantly. As a matter of fact, everything the dragon does it's a one-hit KO. It's long-ranged breath, it's tail swing, it's magic. Well, Helen exhaled. It's a superior summon. I expect no less from it. Benjamin's face turned red immediately. Listen, sweetheart, we eat monsters like this for breakfast every week. It's only a matter of. Why are your guilders dying like flies, then? Helen asked defiantly with a nasty smirk on her face. Benjamin directed his glare towards Tamara. Who the hell is this woman? Does she speak for you? No. Absolutely not. Tamara cried, raising her palms. She'll remain quiet for the rest of our meeting. She then turned towards Helen. Isn't that right? You got it, boss. Helen sneered, hid her hands inside her jacket and leaned over the wall behind her. Benjamin loudly exhaled before continuing. Listen, Tamara Morin, there's no time. Help my guild prepare an all-out attack, all right? So tell your guilders to be ready in. S she's not wrong, though, Tamara whispered, making the man raise his eyebrows. I mean, your major mistake may be that you're treating it as any other raid boss. Way to go, Tammy. Helen cheered through their private chat. Benjamin looked upset and was about to express it with great ire, but Tamara quickly added with a broken voice. A as I was saying, you're trying to overpower something that is not following the rules. Unlike us, that thing is not being debuffed by the safe zone. So, no matter how many legendary weapons you may have, no matter how many men we throw at the thing, we won't be able to outclass it. 
We should approach it in the same way we used to, back then, when bosses were way out of our league. She then paused, acting feeble again. But by the look on your face, you already knew that. Let me guess, first day as a subcommander? Why yes. Benjamin chuckled. To be fair, Tamara Morin, I realized that we were greatly outmatched just before you showed up. Well, any idea on how we should deal with this menace? I have some ideas, yes, she cleared her throat first. How many priests do you have? Benjamin gave her a funny look before replying. Still active? Three. Warlocks and witches? Five. Flying mounts? Wait, let me correct that. Your fastest flying mounts? Four. Epic tier, Benjamin quickly replied, as his mind started working. It's easier to dodge in the sky, eh? Is that what you're thinking? As a starting point, yes. All right, Tamara. Tell me more. Two. Twenty it down in the war zone. After the battle was over, they had cut in half all the buildings within a 500 feet radius. And I only cut like half of them, Oscar thought, half smiling. Despite the loss of blood, gradually causing him to lose his sight, and the torturous pain coming from his multiple wounds, Oscar could still chuckle. T that's an interesting fighting style you G got there. He he. It reminds me of someone I know. The girl in black strolled toward him. The echo caused by her heeled boots was the only discernible sound in the area, for the roar of the two-headed dragon and the noise of the people fighting it seemed like something distant and mundane. What's so funny, sweetheart? The girl tilted her head, showing genuine curiosity. Without saying a word, she ordered the black bindings around Oscar's wrists to hold him aloft so that she could watch his face. Has losing that easily gotten in your head? Did I hurt your precious pride so much that the only thing left for you is to laugh? No. It's not about me. You mentioned something about your colleague fighting the Golden Comet as we speak. Yes. What about it? I presume that this colleague of yours is also exempt from the safe zones debuffs like you, am I correct? Oscar waited for her response, but the girl had opted for silence. I'll take it as a yes, then. He he. I'd like to give you a warning. You're really underestimating her. The girl remained quiet until something resembling a small black dog approached her feet, wagging its tail. Look who came back, she said lovingly. Who's a good girl, hum? Did you find him, Becky? As the girl crouched to hold the pet's feet, Oscar stared at it. The creature looked back, showing that most of its head consisted of one large eye. Wait, what did she say? Find him? Find who? Is Astrid not their primary target? Don't tell me that her colleague's job is just to distract her. I have to tell Tamara about this. Tell me, handsome. What would be the most painful way to die for you right now? Don't get distracted. Just deliver the message. Seeing that his defeated enemy had fallen into silence, she shrugged. Oh, well. I'll choose for you then. The shadow under her feet enlarged, getting below Oscar's body. He knew what was going to happen. Wait. There's something else I need to ask you and I don't need to comply, the girl said, grinning and gesturing goodbye. The shadow below Oscar bubbled as if it had turned into a pitch black swamp, and a second later, dozens of spikes impaled his entire body. Okay, Becky, let's go, the girl said while the little critter disappeared inside her shadow. We're in the middle of a date, don't we? A girl with dirty blonde hair slowly opened her eyes and immediately felt her body numb. With squinting eyes, she barely recognized the streets she traversed every day to go to work since the sidewalks and buildings looked in complete ruin. She was moving, but could not feel her legs working. It was until she clenched her hands against someone else's clothes that she realized she was being piggybacked. W what, happened? Oh, great. You regained consciousness. How do you feel? As if a dragon had stormed my house. The young man carrying her chuckled. Well, technically... That's what really happened. W what? Are you serious? H how did a dragon? The girl stopped mid-sentence as if a sudden pain had shut her up. The young man halted after hearing her wail and gently put her down. Try not to move, okay? You got wounded when the building, um, he pursed his lips and avoided her gaze as if he had been the cause of her misfortune. What? The girl frowned while examining the boy's face. There were dark marks under his eyes, giving him a restless appearance, but it did not make sense. No one in the Novus kept physical imperfections voluntarily unless they were some kind of attention seeker. Whatever. 
Shit happens. Do you have a red potion? The guy with red chestnut hair shook his head. No. Sorry. This is the best I could do. His gaze pointed at the bandages covering her abdomen. So what now? She asked, raising her voice. She only got a puzzled expression as an answer. You were carrying me somewhere. What was your plan? Oh, sorry. I've been trying to get some help for a while now, but nothing? She sneered. Is the situation so dire that you haven't stumbled across someone since you found me? She looked around, maintaining an expression of disbelief. I recognize this place, we're five blocks away from my apartment. He pursed his lips, unable to answer until a light projected his shadow over her. Look out! A nightmarish, deafening sound terrorized them for five excruciating seconds. Her heart skipped a beat as she tightly embraced the young man shielding her. When she dared to peek over his shoulder, she could see a massive wall of light disintegrating the convenience store she had used as a point of reference. When that massive laser beam dissipated, silence reigned over that lonesome street again. In no way, she muttered. What was that? That's the dragon's deathly breath. That's why I'm trying to get you out of this zone as quickly as I can. You're kidding me, she whispered, as her lower lip trembled. Is a thing that powerful roaming the city, like, right now? What are the guilders that swore to protect this city doing? Her shouting got interrupted by the piercing pain coming from her wound. H hang in there just for a little while, okay? I promise we'll find you a healer. He then turned around, ready to carry her again. Come on, let's keep going. She observed his back for a moment before sighing. What's your name? Alan Warden. Yours? Nikki. Thanks for helping me, Alan, but it may take us a while until we find a healer, since they may be busy dealing with the monster. We'll find someone that may give us a red potion then. Come on, we have to get out of here. I have a better idea, she began whispering, as she leaned forward to touch his cheeks. Nikki? What are you? She exhaled before casting, active skill, life steal. Overwhelming dizziness paralyzed him as if all the blood inside his body was being taken away. Seconds later, he lost control of his body, and half of his face hit the ground. As he did his best to remain conscious, a pair of shoes got inside his blurry line of vision. What kind of joke is this? The girl cried, annoyed. Are you really level 5? You barely had the necessary HP to help me close this damn wound. Whatever. Thank God there are still stupid white knight assholes like you in this shitty VR. Nice meeting you, Alan. You should be grateful that I stopped the skill before killing you. With that said, the young woman strode from there, but her rushed footsteps were shut by someone giggling in his ear. What a shitty person that was. Are you okay with this outcome, Alan? Squinting, he turned his gaze toward Nikki running down the street, but saw a shadowy figure instead, getting cut in half like a piece of paper. What the? He gathered his strength to stand up, ignoring a system warning telling him that his HP was at 5%. Something had appeared in front of him that demanded his full attention. Alan Warden, a disembodied voice echoed inside his head. Do you really want to know what happened? The street in ruins had been swapped for a white hallway. The floor reflected him and the pristine walls begged not to be touched by his dirty palms. Is this the Santa Maria? The truth may be ugly, you know, a female voice whispered. I know, he replied, as the immaculate walls now presented burn marks and the floor changed to red. It's a good thing that the novice does not leave corpses behind. It's better this way, right, Alan? He almost tripped after stumbling upon something. Was it a person lying down over a pool of his own blood? He could not tell and he refused to inspect it. But when he looked at the path in front of him, dozens of other human-looking figures awaited. The corridor spread forward like an endless tunnel, and with it, hundreds of unidentifiable sacks of meat. Just imagine how messy the streets of Londoris would look right now if the Novus did not get rid of the bodies. It'd be quite a sight to behold. Don't you think? So answer me this, Alan. Have you seen a bunch of bodies lying around lately? Like candy scattered across the ground after breaking a pinata, H-U-H-U, I, he noticed a light at the end of the tunnel. A blinding light that tried to scare him away and threatened to go out forever, leaving him in the perpetual darkness. But he needed to advance forward whatever the costs. Even though the goal may hurt him and break his soul into a thousand pieces, he owed it to the people that worked before him and to those that made this journey possible. 
At least that's what I believe, he said to himself as he forced himself to go forward. Stop. I wouldn't go in that direction if I was you. Shut up. Don't try to stop me. Seriously. It'll kill you. Jay just shut up. I know I'm hopeless. Okay. I just need to. What a nuisance. I can't have you getting killed just yet, you know? You still have a lot to earn. An explosion shut the woman's voice and brought him back to reality. Alan looked up in the direction the voice was coming from and witnessed the black-clothed girl escaping from an entire building floor engulfed in flames. He then realized that the light coming from the illusionary tunnel was the dragon's breath, coming at him from a distance. Oh, for the love of, I'm so toasted. He shut his eyes, embracing himself, hoping that getting vaporized would be quick and painless. But a couple of seconds later, he realized he could still hear and feel everything around him. He squinted at the feminine silhouette shielding him. Her long hair flew above her nape, hitting his face, and the fragrance emanating from it contrasted with the smell of charred pavement and smoke nearby. A street, he called aloud, making the young girl in front of him sneer loudly. Seriously? Do I look of blowjob height to you? After the dragon's breath dissipated and his sight readjusted to the gloomy ambience, he glanced at the enormous piece of black metal that had served as a shield and at its owner a known, smug redhead girl. Amelia Laflamme? What are you doing here? Don't misinterpret it, ghost. I'm just passing by, she replied, looking at him from head to toe with a disdainful expression on her face. Sighing, she pulled out something from her inventory and tossed it in his direction. Here. It kinda bothers me to see your HP in the red. Look at you. Even my battle aura could kill you if I suddenly power up. Alan examined the glass bottle filled with red liquid. Thanks, but, not now, ghost, for that person is still around, Amelia said, looking at the sidewalk twenty feet away from them, where the black-clothed girl jumped down. What the actual hell, you bitch, she cried. Why are you interrupting our date? Date? Amelia snickered. Weren't you casting Slumbermare on him just a moment ago? Is that your way of showing interest, darling? Slumbermare? Alan turned to Amelia, frowning. Isn't that what that Marco jerk did to me the other day? So was this girl trying to get inside my head too? Alan then noticed Amelia smirking at him. W what? I didn't know you were into Yandra's, ghost. That explains your relationship with Astrid perfectly. Please don't follow her game, he whispered, before narrowing his eyes at the unknown girl. And weren't you calling me little mouse before, as if you were some sort of horny cat? What's with the date crap now? H horny, the girl stuttered. I'm not. Why did you call Astrid a yander, Amelia? Alan asked the girl beside him, completely ignoring their enemy. She's not some sort of psycho, she's a sweetie. You have to be kidding me. She literally killed 30 of her former teammates because of you. That proves nothing. And what were you saying about a blowjob again? I didn't get that. Is that what worries you right now? Amelia cried, blushing. I said she's of blowjob height, got it? Or do I have to spell it out for you? Oh, come on, she's not that short. She's five feet, two inches tall, he said with a straight face. Okay, that was not totally creepy. And use metric, you imperial jerk. That's 157 centimeters, the girl in front of them said, nonchalantly. Thank you. Alan nodded at her. Did you hear that, Amelia? Astrid is not short. She's below the standard, ghost. H.H. How tall are you, anyway? With or without high heels? What? Ah, uh, okay. Without? Why do you ask? I don't think you'll ever see me without them. Fine. How tall are you while wearing heels? What? Is this a fetish of yours? Alan sighed. Why are you so annoying? Why do you care? Because I want us to be friends. Really? After all the things I did to you? Are you a creep and a masochist? I thought we were getting along after you helped me yesterday. Hold on. What are you talking about? At the drinking banshee, remember? When you locked me in the ladies' bathroom. Amelia's face flushed immediately, turning at the girl observing them. IIT's not what it sounds. Damn it, ghost. I didn't help you, oh okay. It just. Amelia pursed her lips, turning her tone of voice softer, benefited me to let you go. Seeing Amelia getting flustered so easily made Alan grin. So was saving me from that dragon's laser beam also beneficial to you? Hum, I'm warning you, ghost. 
I don't like that smirk of yo, Amelia got interrupted mid-sentence by something attempting to pierce her face. She dodged at the last second but got a slight cut on her left cheek. Yo! What the hell? Alan cried. The girl in black seemed to glare at them through her hood. Sorry, did I interrupt your little chat? It was more like bantering. Whatever. We have prolonged this mouse chase for too long, Alan Warden. So tell your meddling friend to get the fuck out of here, or she'll suffer the same fate that the previous rat. What rat? Amelia asked Alan quietly. And who's this bitch, anyway? I think she's referring to that big guy from the GUI, Oscar. Yes, that's his name. Anne. Um. She's that dragon summoner. Okay, got it, Amelia nodded. But why is she targeting you? There's nothing interesting about your whole exes, she narrowed his eyes at him, lost in thought. Oh, she expressed with pouty lips. What? What did you realize? Amelia pulled him from his hand. No time. Run. Not again, the girl in black cried, ready to use the same technique she used to execute Oscar. But a sudden source of heat above her distracted her. What the, is that a more? A huge feline engulfed in flames bit her head off before crashing against the concrete. Then, it roared victoriously, making itself be heard across the adjacent streets. I don't think that'll be enough, Amelia muttered while running. Amelia, wait. Why are you running like that? I thought you'd kick her ass. Is that why you were bantering with me in front of her? So she could get angry and target me? Maybe? She shut her eyes, gathering her patience. Let's not talk about that for now, okay? Just answer me this so both of us can be on the same page. How do you know she summoned that dragon? Because she did it in front of my eyes. Did you accidentally watch her do it? Is that the reason she's targeting you? Because you're the only witness? No. She did it on purpose to prove some sort of philosophical bullshit. Huh? What are you talking about? She was saying nonsense. That our generation has turned lazy and complacent, and that she's the embodiment of progress or some shit. Amelia halted to look Alan in the eye. You were talking with her? Yes. In a park near. What I'm trying to ask is. Amelia paused, shaking her head. Was she looking for you from the start? Alan quickly grimaced. What? No, eh no. Of course not. I met her at this park near this, um, I don't know the name of that bridge. But she approached me in a friendly way and he narrowed his eyes. Why would you think she was looking for me? I, I have nothing of value here. But you were doing something important outside the Novus, weren't you? She asked, looking apologetic. Something that could risk the integrity of this ship and its population. That sounded as if she was quoting me. How do you? I may have heard your conversation with Marco yesterday, she admitted, half smiling. Tee hee. Alan's face turned bright red. You what? A wail echoed through the street. Looking back, Alan saw a giant feline getting lifted by a pair of black tentacles impaling its body. There goes my Kareen, Amelia exhaled, before exerting a fire aura. Listen to me, ghost, I'm not entirely sure what you're up to, but everything points that this girl knows about it too. But that's impossible, he whispered, looking at a huge black mass consuming Amelia's cat summon. Because the menace. Through his mind flashed the many different things the girl was saying. A sentence stood up among them. Your ancestors. She sounded weird when she said that. But no. It can't be. The menace I was talking about with Marco is not human. 2. 21. A satellite. Astrid tried her best to remain conscious and repress the annoying buzz inside her head. The last hit had knocked her to the ground, forcing her to look closely at the droplets of blood on the floor, dripping from her forehead. Bloody bastard, she muttered, spitting. At that very moment, she wished nothing more than to glare at her enemy directly in the eyes, instead of staring at that stupid feline-shaped helmet. Come on, Comet, her enemy shouted before stomping over Astrid's head. Give me a reason to fear you, son of A. The stomp tore down the building floor and the one below them consecutively. When they finally reached the ground floor, a thick dust cloud hid them from each other's sight. Despite Astrid's best efforts to be as less destructive as possible, their battle had reached another dense area and the collateral damage was inevitable. Walls in their path could not slow them down. Houses, building apartments, and retail stores collapsed all around them. After powering up, their steps were as heavy as any mythical creature. 
and the shockwave created from their physical contact broke any crystal and nearby window. We could really give that dragon a run for its money. Hopefully, this area is fully evacuated, because it's bloody difficult to hold back against someone that fights as if they were a natural disaster. Hair. With that in mind, she can endure if I go all out, right? A strid emerged from the dust cloud and punched the enemy in the gut with a fire-engulfed fist. The sound of the armor cracking echoed through the entire building. Es splendid. You really are something, the warrior said, as she tried to push a strid back. Blood ran down from under their helmet. D despite all this damage, you keep fighting as if the safe zone was a joke. A strid snickered. I'm not done yet, gathering her strength, she pushed her fist further into the enemy's stomach, piercing the skin. Soon, her knuckles would reach the enemy's organs. I'll burn you from the inside. I'll pee pass, the warrior breathed before performing a headbutt with all of their strength. Astrid sight blackened for a second as she felt how half of her body made a hole in the ground. Since the height difference was significant, Astrid wondered if she had been driven into the ground like a nail. Which sounds quite humiliating. Memories of people calling her short exploded all at once inside her head. F-class flare. Astrid cast without previously channeling, catching the enemy by surprise. A pillar of fire as intense and powerful as the two-headed dragon's beams of doom fired from Astrid's palms. The spell crossed the street and reached the Thermosis River 650 feet away, evaporating the water in its trajectory instantly. Finishing that, Astrid gasped for air while getting out of the embarrassing human-sized hole. Serves you right, she mumbled as the smog cleared, revealing the building's new entrance, a 50 feet half oval shaped gap. In front of Astrid, a still standing silhouette. Deeded why you quit cast her a major spell that easily, the warrior quietly moaned inside their helmet, sounding ecstatic. A amazing. After saying that, they went silent, curving their body forward, arms hanging low. Did they die on their feet? Astrid examined the enemy's heavily damaged and melted armor, which looked ready to be discarded. But something's not right. I'd broken their fist, made a hole through their stomach, and burned them to a crisp. And yet, with a sudden gasp, the warrior seemed to have come to life. Oh, what a delightful experience. I wonder how much time I'd have lasted if you were at your full capacity. You're kidding me. Astrid threw a quick punch, but the enemy blocked it as if it had come from a mile away. Wait. What? A street did not let her surprise show for a second longer and tried a somersault kick, but the unknown warrior stepped aside calmly. A street's feet cracked the tiled floor and the monument in front of her, depicting a fairy boy now cut in half. A street could picture the warrior smirking inside their helmet during that infinitesimal pause. Are they faster despite their multiple cumulative injuries? That's impossible. It's as if they have healed already. Huh? W whatever. I'm wide open now, so they should hurry and punish me. I would if I were in their place. The enemy's fist radiated a fire aura, just like Astrid's from moments ago. That's it? Idiot. Powering that up will give me the time to step back. Astrid knew how to deal with such an attack since she had perfected it in the last two years. What she did not expect after dodging the first punch was that a second and third fist threatened to hit her face. Oh, you little shit. Meteor fall punch, the warrior announced as they maniacally laughed. Come on, Comet. Don't tell me you didn't see this coming. Four, six, ten, fifteen hits, all seemingly thrown at the same time for the naked eye. Although I can see each one of them coming my way, I won't be able to dodge and block them all. One punch hit Astrid in the belly, another in her right bicep, left breast, right side of her ribs, and nose. That last one sent her flying through walls and caused the inevitable collapse of the four-story building. Although more than a hundred tons of debris fell over Astrid, that was nothing compared to the pain caused by that special move. She could feel the affected skin and injured muscles swallowing, and her pain endurance passive skill seemed to do nothing. It's a nice kind of pain, regardless. The kind that causes a pleasant, itching sensation. Astrid checked her HP bar. She could theoretically survive a punishment two times stronger than that. But my gut is telling me that this wanker is still holding back. After vomiting blood, she thanked in silence that her enemy had not seen that. Let's see, what do I know about them? They heal fast. So fast in fact that their regeneration is comparable to that of a mythical beast, something I've never seen before. Could that be their unique talent? And there's something more that is constantly increasing their strength and speed. 
Ham. I wonder if. A street kicked aside large blocks of concrete as if they were made of cardboard and fixed her broken nose. Above her, the still gray Landorus sky greeted her. This sucks. A street cried, pouting and stomping the ground without a care in the world if she looked childish in front of the enemy. This debuffed state blows. It's difficult to grasp what my current limits really are. If it wasn't for my Libra, this battle would have ended right when it started. Frustrated, she wrinkled her nose and narrowed her eyes at the enemy. You knew, it's boring that you don't have a name. So I'll call you Crimson from now on due to your red armor. I call you Red for short, but it reminds me of a certain bitch that I'd rather not think about for the moment. Fine, I'll let you have that, the warrior said hoarsely, making a strid pout again. What is it, Crimson? You sound disappointed. Is mopping the floor with me not as satisfactory as you thought it'd be? The warrior sighed loudly as if something Astrid said had stroked a nerve. Screw it, they muttered and placed both large hands against their helmet to remove it. I'd rather you call me Scarlet, the young woman under the armor said. And I can't say I'm happy with this match since you're still holding back. Astrid promptly used her Eye of the Sage active skill, hoping to get any info out of her enemy, but the system gave her no results. A complete stranger. I know the face and name of every single registered gilder in the top ranking lists, and she's not there. What the hell is going on? I refuse to believe that a user this strong has remained unknown this whole time. People have egos. They want to be on the top and be admired by everyone. A street bit her lower lip for half a second before beaming. Look at you. There was a cute face under that thing all along. What about your mission? Is it okay for you to show your face just like that? We're supposed to be anonymous, but screw that, Scarlet said, glowering. That was my partner's idea anyway. As I've already stated, my primary objective is to learn from you. What about that embodiment of progress crap? That's right. My own fucking progress. Although Scarlet's freckles and the orange bush she had for hair gave her a feminine appearance, her height, bulky frame, deep tone of voice, and the black eye patch covering her left eye allowed her to keep her tough guy persona. That last thing is just too much in my opinion. Unless it's not an accessory. I can picture her hanging around with jarks like Oscar or William the Stoic rather than having a girly talk with Tamara and Marissa. Astrid formed fists, knowing that the next round would be the last. In the end, knowing what she looks like under that helmet doesn't really matter. For someone that bloats about being part of something big and avoids any kind of spotlight, this face could be another one of her masks. Her name is surely fake, too. Astrid looked in the distance. The gigantic two-headed dragon could be seen firing up breath after laser breath at something flying over its heads. You want me to take you seriously, huh? Astrid said in a low voice as she ran a hand through her hair. You know, if you and your partner haven't destroyed a fourth of the city, I could admit that your tenacity is admirable. You've really learned my moves and techniques to such perfection that it sends chills down my spine. Astrid's friendly smile twisted into a malicious grin. I mean it. You really creep me out. This is not an obsessive behavior I'm seeing. Trust me, I know all about it. No. You're more akin to a scanning machine. Yes. Something that tracks someone's motions but has no moves of its own. Gross. Scarlet frowned notoriously, before laughing out loud. Did you really say all that with a straight face, Comet? She sneered, stretching out her arms to her sides. Who is the real inhuman here, eh? Little, insignificant copycat, me, or you, the woman that practically broke this game's balance and caused a snowballing, power-creeping worldwide effect that the administrators have been trying to address for the last year. I, like many others, only broke our limits after learning what could be done from you. You're the original power creeper here, monster girl, not me. Astrid's mocking face got stiff in an instant. What did you call me? You heard me right, you freakazoid. Scarlet scoffed. The only one that fights inhumanly here is you. Always cold looking, as if fighting bored you. Always using a handicap, or finding different excuses to not go all out. I haven't even seen you using your super mode once. So stop restraining yourself and show me that monstrous side of you, the one that you never show in public. Come on. Just let it out. As Scarlet got into a fighting stance, Astrid shook her head vigorously. I inhuman? Monster? Astrid sobbed while covering her eyes with both hands. Why did you call me all those horrible things, you, you, big jerk? 
a bursting red aura surrounded Astrid, showing that she had used a fire boost. That's more like it. Scarlet crowed, exerting the same fierce aura. Fire boost, Vela. Ha ha ha. Scarlet, can I ask you something? Astrid said in a low voice after wiping out what seemed to be genuine tears from her cheeks. Doesn't it hurt? What are you mumbling about? Your berserk mode, Astrid whispered as she raised her head, showing her cold, glowing blue eyes. The after effects are quite painful, so I can't imagine what it'd feel using it at all times. Scarlet cracked a smile. So you finally noticed, eh? That means I don't need to hide it anymore. Scarlet chuckled as she calmly removed her eye patch. An explosive purple aura took over her body immediately, overwhelming the red one. Scarlet's green eyes changed to golden and her irises resembled those of a predator. Even her youthful appearance changed into a feral expression. That's right, Scarlet continued, being in this constant state hurts like hell. Ignoring the feeling of my blood constantly boiling, and disregarding the fear of getting a heart attack at any moment, this constant agony it's exhilarating. This is the secret of my power, Comet. It doesn't matter how many times you impale me, burn me or break my bones. I'll heal immediately and get a quick power boost as a bonus. Simply said, the longer the battle, the stronger I'll get. While Scarlet laughed maniacally, Astrid sniffed and rubbed her eyes. Exhilarating. Ha! Huh. Astrid disliked the idea of casting boosts on a regular basis. The fire-type Vela boost, for instance, a basic but useful spell that even all brawn warriors could cast without worrying about their low mana reserves. It enhances their strength beyond their limits like a short-time steroid. Astrid described it to Tamara once as a cheap adrenaline rush. If the heat of battle had not awoken someone's fighting spirit, the boost would do it for them instantly. Through her time in the Novus, Astrid had seen warriors getting addicted to it. Some would fire up Vela before even unsheathing their weapons. The Berserk mode is ten times worse. It produces bloodlust, raises the rank of pain endurance, and enhances the user's strength every time they get a fatal wound. Astrid sighed. I hate it. It's bloody difficult to reason with someone that thinks that has become unstoppable. As if the Novus fighting community needed more people like that. Do you really intend to surpass me, Scarlet? Astrid asked softly. I know I will. Scarlet shouted, hitting her chest. Which class did you choose? Battle mage. The same as you, of course. Wrong, Astrid pronounced in a deep voice before reverting to a girly tone. I'm sorry, sweetie, but I'm not specialized in that class. Tee hee. Astrid saw a glimpse of distress in the enemy's face. And it's glorious. W what are you talking about? Scarlet stuttered. Battle mage. A class that excels in both strength and magic. That's your class. A street giggled, covering her mouth with her right hand. Ah, my sweet, noob child. Who'd want to master such a useless class? Being a battle mage is the equivalent of being a jack of all trades. You'd never excel as a martial artist nor as an elemental mage, becoming just glorified cannon fodder. Scarlet tilted her head to her side, looking perplexed. B but it's obvious what you w why are you doing this? You can't lie to me. It even says so in your gilder profile. You're a battle. Well, they have to put something there, don't they? Astrid interrupted. For the fans, of course. But the truth of the matter is that I've never revealed my true class publicly. If you've been following my career, you should know I'm telling the truth. Scarlet's lower lip trembled as the purple aura around her increased. And no way. No way, no way, no way. And even if I was a battle mage, you failed miserably, regardless. Want to know why? I haven't failed. I'm kicking your ass in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. And in all this time you've never copied my long-range attacks. Astrid replied, laughing out loud. Why didn't you cast a copy of my F-class flare, too, huh? You could have shown me you could do it better. Or is it too difficult for you? Hum? Or maybe, Astrid grinned maliciously, maintaining that Berserk state drains all of your mana? Tee hee. That means that as long as you fervently use this Berserk strategy, you'll be nothing more than a cheap knockoff. Earth boost. Scarlet shouted, emanating a third battle aura. Living rock. Getting pretty desperate, huh? Astrid snickered. The longer the battle, the stronger you get, right? What if I told you your strategy has a clear weakness, Scarlet? 
something easy to exploit if it weren't for these safe zone restrictions. Oh, I'd love to see you laying a scratch on me now. Scarlet roared, making the ground shake by just stepping forward. My body is now harder than anything on this shitty island. Astrid closed her eyes while emanating a blue aura. It's easy. One just has to beat you to the point of no recovery really fast. Water boost, overflow. Notice, your spirit has increased by two ranks. What are you going to do with that? Scarlet scoffed. You've already seen I can tank your magic. Astrid ignored Scarlet's taunts and continued channeling mana. Earth boost, living rock. The ground beneath Astrid's feet cracked as if she had gained mass and weight. Notice, your vitality has increased by two ranks. Alan, the day you disappeared we promised to be on top of the world, right? Well, to this day I'm still striving to be just that. I don't know if you've already checked the ranking charts yet, but I owe you an explanation of why I'm in seventh place in the individual power category. Wind boost, speed demon, Astrid continued, as a green gust of wind flew through her loose hair. Notice, your agility has increased by two ranks. What the hell are you planning? Scarlet asked in a low voice, fully conscious that the last two elemental boosts were incompatible. Wait. Why are you stacking up boosts as if there was no tomorrow? You just said that jack of all trades are cannon fodder. Well, I'm clearly lying about one of those things, right? But which one? The part about me not being a battle mage, or what I really think about versatile people. Alan. The reason why I'm not the most powerful user in all the Novus right now it's because time has taught me that being number one is a pain in the ass. If I climbed to the top of the ranking charts, other guilders would hate me more than they already do. You just met Kathleen Mayer, right? Well, imagine 98 more bitches and wankers like that. I can deal with the haters just fine, but I'd prefer not to have that kind of attention. The pressure on my shoulders would kill me young. That's why I prefer to be in the spotlight doing something different. Something that gives joy to the people. But regardless of my personal feelings, the reason I stubbornly remain in the seventh spot, it's because I want the Novus population to know my face, and that they shouldn't mess with me or my city. It had worked pretty well until this day. So let me remind this person that comets are unreachable. Feeling the increasing flow in Astrid's power, Scarlet stepped back for the first time since their duel started. W what's wrong with me, she cried with clenched teeth and hit herself in the nose, drawing her own blood. To hell with you. Stacking different boosts won't matter if you can't take a hit. Scarlet's fist irradiated fire and prepared her attack. Meteor. Berserk mode, Astrid calmly cast. I haven't climbed to the peak of the mountain because I don't want people to see me as a monster, Alan. Although, that's what I really am. Poonch. Scarlet roared as her fist connected with Astrid's face. The resulting sound echoed through Lundora streets. People from all over the city turned their heads in the same direction, and mistakenly attributed the twin-headed dragon as responsible for such thunderous noise. There were no cameras around to witness such a spectacle, but if there was a brave soul that could have recorded the incident, people would have debated for weeks if that single punch was one of the most devastating in Nova's history. Of course, after the following one, I heard it, the sound of your skull breaking. Scarlet celebrated, raising her fist victoriously, before noticing that her hand looked weird. And no, not again, more like the sound of your knuckles, wrist, and arm getting crushed at the same time, Astrid said while a purple aura similar to Scarlet's took over her body. I have to give you some credit, Scar, that hurt, a lot, so you know what that means, right? This doesn't make sense, Scarlet muttered, stepping back. What about all those boosts then? Why cast a water and wind boost if you're not going to use them, huh? Answer me. Oh, you'd love to know that, Astrid said softly. A mischievous, almost evil-looking smirk adorned her face. Her blue eyes had been changed for those of a beast, golden, and dangerous. I became powerful so I could protect those I love. So you don't have to worry about anything, Alan, as long as I'm here. Then, with a single whisper, Astrid concentrated all of her power in her right fist. Libra. For a fraction of a second, Scarlet saw a tall figure behind Astrid. It resembled a blindfolded woman wearing a pristine dress. She was holding something aloft in her right hand, but Scarlet could not distinguish what. Something that seemed important. Scarlet wished she could know what that object was. Beautiful, Scarlet muttered. 
Astrid's punch did not produce a deafening sound, it only impaled Scarlet as if she was made of butter, followed by a burst of fire coming out of her back. Truly beautiful. I'll discover the trick you used to get into this city unrestrained. So never come back. Did you hear me? Next time I'll go all out from the start. Scarlet rested her chin over Astrid's left shoulder as if they were embracing each other and coughed blood. Whatever. Our work here is done. Something glowing in the distance caught Astrid's eye. It's coming from where the dragon is. Is it firing its breath in this direction? No. This is different. Astrid's instincts told her to get out of that zone immediately, but her agonizing rival restrained her with the last of their strength. I also lied, Scarlet breathed as an increasing dome of white light engulfed them both. 1. 22, Enuke Dragon. 10 minutes ago. To begin Operation Death from above, the Titan Hunters Guild and Shooting Stars gathered their last remaining priests and priestess, warlocks and witches, and epic tier mounts. The group of ten people whispered to each other as soon as they arrived at the appointed location, the rooftop of a five-story building one mile away from the stationary dragon. That thing has high magic resistance, right? One warlock whispered to the others. We're practically useless in this battle. All right, people, thanks for coming. Tamara Morin pronounced as soon as the last which descended from her flying mount. Shooting stars and titan hungers, listen to Benjamin, please. We'll all work together to exterminate that monster. Benjamin Woods, leader of Titan Hunters, looked like a giant beside the petite Tamara. He filled his lungs first before yelling, Gilders, that dragon has already done enough damage to the city and the rest of our brothers in arms are in the red. So the following instructions will be brief. I need you to split into two groups. On my right, Dark Mags will form Group A, and on my left, Priests will compose Group B. Do it now. Benjamin exhaled as he observed the group reluctantly do as they were told. The uncertainty in their eyes was hurtful to watch. It'll work, Tamara said in a low voice, after glancing at his tired eyes. Trust me. Oh, I'm certain of it, Ms. Morin, Benjamin replied, massaging the bridge of his nose. I just hope I can do my part. You look determined just a few minutes ago. Tamara half smiled, patting his arm. Keep that feeling a little longer and everything will be fine. Yeah, Benjamin whispered looking in the distance, not in the dragon's direction, but at a battle taking place 1.5 miles away, where buildings could be seen collapsing, followed by thick clouds of smog and fiery explosions. That must be Astrid Bradford, he thought, wishing he had that eagle-eye passive skill like the marksman class have, so he could observe that fight. But I don't need it to see that her enemy must be as formidable as the dragon. A bitter chuckle escaped his lips. Why am I doubting myself? Taking down gigantic monsters is what I do best. He remembered himself checking the ranking charts that morning after someone had pointed it out. Seeing shooting stars way bottom on the list was surreal. While some of his partners celebrated that they were now the best guild in the city, Benjamin took a deep breath and locked himself in his office. Can't you see that this will only mean more work for us? More pressure? He could handle it since his old Earth's job was way more stressful, but he also did not mind being second place. Shooting star spotlight was so bright that it practically obscured everything else on the stage called Lundorus. The only guilds that could compete with them like Deathbringers, preferred moving to another city, and those who stayed, lived under Astrid Bradford's enormous shadow. Benjamin checked the other ranked list, the one that the average population was so obsessed with, the individual power, ranking chart where Astrid's name remained on the seventh spot like an unmovable iceberg. Benjamin scrolled down the list until finding his own name in 67th place. As long as my guild is the best at something, at taking down giant bosses, everything will be fine. He sighed, returning to the present. The newly formed group stood in front of him, ready to fly. And now, here we are, getting help from our rivals. Guilders, the next order will be simple. Group A will throw curses and debuffs at the dragon's white head, and Group B will try to cleanse and purify the black head. A warning, don't get too close to it, for the dragon releases a suicide-inducing gas that'll take you down easily. Just concentrate on doing this last job, and Tamara, and I will take care of the rest. Benjamin spoke so fast, that he wondered if the instructions had been clear. But after observing the relief in their faces, he smiled. That's all, one of them said aloud, chuckling. Count with us, boss. 
that the simplicity of this plan doesn't take away its obvious effectiveness. Well done, Tamara. But what if the dragon fires at us? One of them asked aloud with childish innocence. Dodge. Benjamin smirked. Now go and open a path for us so I can bring you the dragon's heart. The flying mount took off immediately while Benjamin laughed out loud, watching his brothers and sisters in arms go to certain death. It's good to see you in good spirits, Tamara said, clapping. But of course, in a matter of minutes, I'll carve my name in history as Lundora's savior. Ha ha, true, true. Tamara cleared her throat. So, shouldn't we part too? Like, right now? Benjamin snorted loudly before replying. I don't have an epic tier mount. You? She blinked repeatedly, mouth ajar. Bieber you're a guild master. That's right, Benjamin said, folding his arms. But I usually stay in the back lines, coordinating the raids. So whenever we get one, I give it to my best guilders to make sure they're always motivated. T that's, admirable, Tamara whispered, lowering her eyes. S sorry if I offend you, he only chuckled. No offense taken, Ms. Morin. Tamara quickly nodded, beaming. Let me call my mount then. She stretched out her arm, bringing forth a feline winged beast out of a summoning circle. Would you like to take the reins, sir? Nah. I'm afraid of heights. We would never take off. Tamara's grin faded in an instant. Eh? I don't feel intimidated by him anymore, nor impressed. Tamara thought as she ordered her purple flying puma to ascend with Benjamin tightly holding her from the waist. And here I was, thinking that he was kinda hot while we were planning out the attack. We need to go above the clouds. Benjamin said through party chat. Oh, I can't believe I said that. You're doing it great, sir. Just, don't open your eyes and everything will be fine. Tamara glanced at their target below. The dragon had shifted its focus towards the ones flying over its two heads. The laser beams constantly coming out of its maw stretched out towards the sky, illuminating it. The epic mounts are fast enough to dodge those attacks, but it will also depend on the rider. We have to do this fast. The sound of lightning made Benjamin jolt in his seat. The black, electrified clouds above looked like a thick ceiling, and Tamara wondered if they could pass through without issue. Well, at least this guy won't notice my frizzy hair. Seconds later, the puma emerged on the other side, finding a blue, endless sky. The Nova sun was still present, unable to bring life to the city below. I'd forgotten that it was still daytime. We've reached the top of the sky, sir, Tamara informed, while Benjamin buried his face on her back. Good. Let's hold our position for a little longer, Ms. Morin. We don't want that dragon to spot us. Understood, she said changing communication channels. The rest of the Gilda's voices suddenly screamed inside her head. Don't tell me you've already run out of mana. I, I can't see this working. Its magic resistance is too damn high. No, no, no. We're supposed to target the black one, you stupid. I think I'm going to puke. Benny, look out. My god, the dragon killed Benny, that bastard. Why do I feel the sudden urge of stripping out? And, cursing myself? My whole body itches. Veronica, did you breathe the gas? Hold on, let me cleanse you. Ha ha ha. The Eclipse Festival is upon us. G. Grua, did you see that? Veronica, with her staff. This is not working, people. W. Why did I accept this crazy suicide mission? I'm holding close to 800,000 G right now. I'm sorry guys, but I'll. Don't you dare quit, Jonah. Stop listening to that guy. The white head is acting strange. It's really working. I'm seeing it too. What are you doing, Group A? Stop bitching about and do your damn job. Guys I mean, Group A. Stop casting debuffs, it's useless. Stick to curses. They took down one of the shooting stars. I don't know their name. Don't stop. We're finally affecting it. Keep going. The black head looks dizzy. It worked, sir. Tamara cried at the man holding her fervently. Descend. We have a dragon to kill. Tamara wasted no time and ordered her puma to dive, crossing the clouds at great speed. Soon after, Tamara could see the dragon below. A reticle inside her sight of vision helped her correct the trajectory. We'll reach the target in 15 seconds. Roger that, Benjamin said, stretching out his right hand to his side, opening a summoning circle. Bringing forth, Grootheild, the sapping sword. 
Tamara glanced at the Claymore-style sword coming out of whatever pocket dimension it was being saved. Could this be one of the Titan Hunters Guild's most valuable treasures? Now. Benjamin cried, startling Tamara. The puma stretched out its wings, breaking their fall, and Benjamin jumped out of it immediately, making Tamara gasp. Sir, will he be okay? That's a 700 feet free fall. Death from a boov. Benjamin shouted from the top of his lungs to make sure that everyone could hear him. Using gravity and mana to empower his weapon, he pierced the dragon's thick scales and flesh successfully. The resulting shockwave threw one unfortunate rider off his mount. Okay. I'll admit it, that was pretty badass, Tamara thought, smiling, before noticing the gas emanating from the dragon's body. Focus, Tam. She slapped her cheeks and ordered her mount to land over the dragon's back. I'm coming, Benjamin, she cried, deactivating her puma with one swing of her hand, and dashed towards Benjamin while channeling mana. Major light crafting, over shield. A golden, translucid, dome-shaped shield covered them just before the dragon's evil gas reached them. Nice timing, Ms. Morin. How is it going, sir? Tamara asked as she saw the purple gas surrounding the shield. In a matter of seconds, the interior of the shield was pitch black. Minor firecrafting, flare light, she cast quietly, creating a small, floating orb of light. The first thing she saw was Benjamin's wide shoulders. Not good, he mumbled. This'll take more time than I expected. I haven't been able to pierce the muscle layers yet. Here. I'll show you, after tapping his user interface, a video screen popped up in front of them, showing what seemed to be tree roots gradually expanding through something pink, as if they were looking for something. Is that, it's my Groot Hild in action. Tamara peeked at the sword over Benjamin's shoulder. The blade was made of wood, with vines slowly wrapping the wielder's arms. I can hear two heartbeats, Benjamin muttered. Makes sense. Will it be a problem? Not at all. Watch. Benjamin pointed at the video feed, which showed the sentient root split and part into two different paths. A second after, the video window split too, following each root independently. You know, Ms. Morin, this sword is pretty much useless 99% of the time. It requires its wielder to be still and defenseless. But I stubbornly kept it for two years, knowing its time to shine would come someday. I'll probably store it at the bottom of my inventory again after we're done. Is his voice getting weaker? Tamara asked herself as she heard him attentively, before noticing his HP bar getting constantly depleted. Sir. Your. Is that thing draining your life? Oh, right, I forgot to mention it. It's the price for using it. 